esteemed dignitaries delegates scholars ladies and gentlemen a warm good morning to one and all welcome to the second day of international conference on advances in naval and ocean engineering iconoi 2023 organized by the department of ship technology qz we are very happy to see you together here we hope the program will be grand and successful and we hope the conference is bringing invaluable insights and expertise in the field of naval and ocean engineering, naval architecture and ocean engineering. Have a good time. Thank you once again. And uh, uh, let's start our uh, keynote address uh, today. And I'm inviting Professor Dr. Shiva Prasad K on the dais to introduce our keynote speaker. Good morning to all. We are going to start the second day session, first session of the second version of ICANOI, ICANOI 23. Respected head of the department, respected teachers, colleagues, students, scholars and participants and sponsors. We are starting with a keynote address. Our main theme is ship and offshore technology, sustainable ship and offshore technology in the coming years. So we have with us a very distinguished, I should say maritime technologist and scientist Sri S. Ananta Narayanan, who was former director of Naval Physical Oceanographic Laboratories, NPOL Cochin, he I, I mentioned that he is a scientist as well as a technologist or engineer, because he took his BTEC from Indian Institute of Te Technology and his post-graduation from Indian Institute of Science. So he, in him, we can see the merging of technology and science, which is essential for making developments in the sector, especially in maritime sector. He joined after completing his B.Tech from IIT Madras in electronics, probably uh, one of the first batches to come out with an electronics degree. So he joined another D DRD organization called DRDL in Hyderabad and then came to NP Oil in 1978 as scientist. Sri S. Arantanarayanan was instrumental in making things happen in a defense organization. Always you should think about defense as a government sector, not as an industry. So it's very difficult to get things done in a government establishment, but he was very capable of doing things, making things happen in a better way. He initiated many collaborative efforts, especially when you do some defense research, it should not be restricted to a paper, technical paper. It should come as a product, but there are restrictions for a defense product. So he initiated collaboration between institution or the research organization and industry started collaborating with Bharat Electronics Limited, which is under Defense Ministry. Our own Keltron, probably you may, may not be knowing now, our own Keltron, like Kerala Electronics Corporation. 
these two were basically electronics industries, manufacturing industries, and also he collaborated defense research with Hindusan Machine Tools, which is a mechanical manufacturing company. So he was instrumental in uh, associating both electrical and mechanical industries into a defense production scenario. So he was successful in that, and we can see some of the products, some of the research outputs from uh, defense was even exported to Southeast Asian countries that time. Now, st still we are uh, uh, exploring that possibilities and we are expanding. In 2014, he was awarded with the best Diardo scientist of the year. And the same year, I think Department of Ship Technology felicitated, I cannot say felicitated, he guided us coming over here and he addressed parents, teachers, students and scholars on, in 2014. I still remember, he also remembers. After his retirement, you should uh, you know, uh, he had some uh, health issues. Just Leaving that, no, keeping that away, that health, severe health issues did not bother him much. He started his own activity. He volunteered himself into authorship of popular scientific articles. Shastra Jalagam he has been publishing various science in society articles. And one incident, his spirit of ocean spirit was exhibited in that, which was connected to me. One, one day I got a call from Kerala Kaunudi daily. They wanted to uh, have an article published in their uh, daily newspaper on Samudrayan. While we were going up in uh, Chandrayan, they wanted to go down to the sea bottom. So they approached me, sir, can you write? I said, I'm not an expert. Then I contacted one DRDO scientist, retired scientist. And they, I think they had some contact. Finally, one fine morning, Dr. Nantakumar called me and said, Anantanara and sir's article has come in Kerala Kamudi. So he did not waste that opportunity to write about Samudraya. So his ocean spirit is exhibited. Even now he is very much active underwater. <clears throat> now, today he is going to give a keynote address on the shipbuilding advancements and shipbuilding for the sustainable society. He is coming to our sector also, that is naval architecture and shipbuilding. He is an expert in that also. So with uh, these words, on behalf of uh, those who are assembled here, I invite Sri S. Anantanarayan for his keynote address. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Dr. Shiva Prasad, thank you very much for that fine introduction. I am sure most of you would be still in the hangover of the wonderful trip in the water metro yesterday. And as uh, Dr. Shiva Prasad said, I am neither a naval architect nor a mechanical engineer, but an electronics engineer by grooming. I shall start with one an anecdote, and I will end up also with an anecdote. This anecdote is for the undergraduate students, basically. You see, 
when I graduated from IIT Madras, I was interviewed by Bharat Electronics. I was interviewed by Hindustan Machine Tools. I was interviewed by Caltron. All of them rejected me, justifiably. Then I joined Caltron, but thereafter I, I didn't stick on there. I went to DRDO Hyderabad. I worked in DRDO. From there I came to NPOL and stayed there for 40 years. And in those 40 years, I, I, I learned computer hardware, then computer software, software engineering, then acoustics, then project management, oceanography, administration, organizational management, quality assurance, quality control, and various other other subjects on various capacities also. So I was in that process, I was lucky enough to, to get a certain exposure to maritime activities involving ships and submersibles. I am proud to say that in that process, I could guide my group, group of engineers, 300 engineers to develop a 5,000 5, crore sonar industry. So it divided to warships and submarines. This in turn helped all the above three companies who rejected me to go from loss to profit for several years, which definitely I would not have been able to help them if I, were, if I had joined in any of those companies. What I am trying to convey to you is that you may not necessarily get placed in a job for which you are trained here or educated here, but broadening your outlook at every stage, we create chasing the new technology developments will definitely fetch you very good results. So don't get deflated if you don't get placed necessarily in a ship technology job in the beginning. But there are many more things which you will be able to do if you learn the peripheral subjects also. That is the point which I would like to convey to my undergraduate friends here. So in this career spanning 40 years in land and sea, I have uh, experienced the nauseating mixture, smell of a mixture of oil, grease, and and uh, diesel, and the smell from the kitchen of the ships and submarines, and also the nauseating smell from the washrooms there in the traveling in the mid sea, not necessarily calm all the times, pitching and rolling. And that was not either as a ship's crew or as a, as a uh, in, uh, participating in any military actions, but as a scientist to prove the indigenously developed sonar systems for the Indian Navy as such. So the, a fairly successful program of sensor industry has been going on in the adjacent campus here in NPOL, which has not been sufficiently publicized for obvious reasons. But as the saying goes, the necessity is the mother of invention. The execution of several projects under this program in Bombay, Mumbai, Vaisak, and Goa and Cochin in the last four decades of the Navy under the aegis of DRDO is what gave me some opportunity to understand where we stand on matters related to shipbuilding industry, both civilian as well as naval. By the way, there is sufficient confusion in the minds of students as well as parents, including my, myself was, a, as Dr. Shiva Prasad knows, I was also confused at one point of time, what is the difference between OE and NA offered by 
IIT Kharagpur and NAOE offered by IIT Madras, which I came to know subsequently that there is not much of a difference. My son got admission in NAOE in Chennai, and that was the time when I got this confusion. Subsequently, I got it clarified that, okay, even though there are no differences between the two, NA means, next one, NA means it is on the ships and submarines which are floating over the, oh, oh, in the ocean. And OE means it is essentially the management of the ocean management of ocean structures and recently what has come as deep sea mining and associated subjects. Anyway, be that as it may, why I want to, next one, why you want to talk about this subject today was first one, the past holds a mirror on how changes evolve in a field over a period of time. We can learn from the past mistakes and as well as we can on the wrong judgments which we have made in the past. Secondly, it has been my understanding and my experience that there are many extraneous factors other than the technology that we work on that field that seriously influence the deployment of new technologies and systems effectively. For example, the indigenous sonar industry to grow, we had to wait for the warship construction to pick up and pick up steam and the funding also had to be increased by the government for the for the construction of the warships. The 26 by 11 attack in Bombay and the emergence of the Chinese Navy with its sinister moves in our neighborhood opened the eyes of the government and Navy got the due attention and position in our security matrix, leading to a spurt in the warship building since 2008. Automatically, funds flowed into this capital intensive industry and naturally, that led to the development of uh, the phenomenal exponential growth of the sonar industry in the country. Third one, we need to be aware of the weaknesses and opportunities to drive the right relevant technology into the domain's ecosystem as a whole. I shall cite an example if time permits. Hence, I believe that a little retrospective peek into the history of shipbuilding in a global level as well as a national level would certainly give us a wider perspective. And lastly, this will also will help you to see the relevance and impact of the research work that you are presenting here. I will have a quick run of the past global and national trends. Next one. We can see here that as far as the utility is concerned, the utility of the shipbuilding had initially started only for trade, commerce, as well as cultural exchanges. You know that Buddhism spread out in the Southeast Asian countries from India in that, in that sense. And the trade and commerce was the main activity which was driven. I would say that the change in the scenario of the global shipbuilding industry has been driven by the industry revolutions one to four. And subsequently it uh, became mainly that of commerce, maritime exploration, and as well as the defense items. Next one. This transformation, you would find that it uh, it's starting from fishing to coastal trade. It went into larger boats, then came to the exploration uh, phase in the 16th and 15th, 16th centuries when Columbus, Magellan, and Vasco da Gama went round the, went round the world. Then came from the fishing boats, it came to sailing boats, then wood ships for trade and transportation and slowly warfare also became an activity in the sea. And after the industrial revolution, the steel gave way to the wooden ships and subsequent long distance travel became possible. And the 19th century when the communication facilities by Marconi and other radio aspects that raised the safe sailing into far distances from the shore. 
the modern shipbuilding of the 20th century starts with the IC engines, containerization, submarines, usage, communications, etc. It is the Titanic accident which has been responsible for the growth of the sonar itself. And in the present day shipbuilding in the 21st century, we are talking about Industry 4.0 and uh, advanced engineering, automation, etc. Aircraft carriers and nuclear powered submarines are all related to the latest uh, strat strategic mar maritime power. Using cutting edge technologies and materials, now we are talking about large luxury cruise ships and offshore oil platforms, and of course also on the deep sea ocean mining and other technologies. Next one. If you look at the geographical dispersion, if it was in the colonial era, it was a Europe, UK, who were, they were the epicenters of uh, ships building industry. In the first half of 20th century, USA took over, and in the second half of 20th century, it shifted to Japan, Korea, and then now China is the biggest uh, shipbuilding nation as such in the last two decades. So the question is whether in the next three decades, whether India can recapture its preeminence as far as shipbuilding industry is concerned. To, do, to talk about that, we have to see what we were doing in the over the years. Next one. These are the days of inflated nationalism when people make ridiculous claims about the technological advances that India has made in the ancient times. But luckily, at least in shipbuilding, it is an exception with a rich maritime heritage that the country can claim, uh, which is spanning over several centuries. We, we find, we read in literature that in Harappan civilization, we had flat-bottomed vessels, we had tidal shipyards, and we had inherited workforce and the units of measurement were your, your, your limbs like uh, Chan, Ali, Gajam and all those, uh, Muram and all that, which is related to the body parts. They were the sort of measurements they were using. Then there was a decline in the Vedic period and in the Maurya period we had the new trade routes and also the usage of Malabar teak, etc. Then came the medieval period when the flourishing trade using sailboats and the Marathas built the shipyards, sea combat worthy ships, etc. Then came the colonial era when the Britishers, Portuguese and other countries came over to the Indian Ocean for trade but converted the, the Arabian Sea as a, uh, an area where piracy was the water of the day. But then the refusal to transfer the technology like as it is now, it was in the olden times also, we could not get some of the technologies of steel hulls, electric motors, etc. And in the independent India, by the time we got independence, at least the Britishers had come to India with their ships and we had, they had by force, they had to set up certain repair yards in the western side. And that was the what was available there. That of course gave some help to us. But however, the government of India's initiative in setting up shipyards like Masogan Dockyard, GRC, Goa Shipyard, and later Cochin Shipyard, all are public sector units. And that has been the state by 21st century. We have now, we have threat from our neighbors, especially from China, and the strengthened position in this. We are now in a very good position as far as the shipbuilding industry in the uh, warship domain in submarine production, nuclear powered submarines, aircraft carriers, augmented fleet strength, etc. And also we have been taking baby steps as far as the deep sea ocean mining is concerned. And we are aware of certain green, green shipping in initiatives also. Now, this next one. Next, you know, yeah, that's okay. So leave, leave it the previous one. We are, these are, uh, these are facts which I don't know, maybe I am carrying coal to Newcastle, 
that the fact that India has got a 7,500 plus long coastline and 12 major ports managed by central government and 200 and plus ports managed by state governments and most of the cargo ships sailing between Asia, America, East Asia, America, Europe and Africa have to sail through the Indian territorial waters. These are all the positive side as far as the Indian shipbuilding industry is concerned. And, and India ranks, in spite of all these facts, now India ranks only 18th in the world's shipping tonnage. And India has a merchant fleet of 1491 seagoing ships with a total capacity of 13 million. Now the thing is, the ship, the fa if there is enough shipping, doesn't is a necessary condition for the growth of the shipbuilding industry, but it is not a sufficient condition for the growth of the shipbuilding industry. The advancement, next one, the advancement of the trio of Japan, Korea, and Singapore as a shipbuilding nations, it has been because of four decades of uh, policy initiatives by the governments in the respective countries for boosting the shipbuilding industry. And they are, it includes the competitive participation in the private sector, foreign direct investment in the highly capital intensive sector, investment in R&D in ship design and associated technologies, support to ancillary industries by way of incentives and R&D efforts, facilitating the inputs like raw materials, finance, manpower, and technology, improved labor productivity, and the impact of scales. You need large number of ships to be under order if you have to have the impact of scales. All these enabling policies by the respective governments there will have a positive impact in the shipbuilding industry in the areas of shipbuilding, ship repair, ship recycling, development of inland waterways and inland water transport, port and harbor construction projects and port and harbor maintenance projects. Unfortunately, our powers that be have been relatively complacent as far as these aspects are concerned in the first 75 years. There has not been a, unlike the defense shipping in the country, there has not been any pros, any perspective plan from the government for the holistic development of this initiative, which has been there in the case of the Southeast Asian countries, which I mentioned earlier. It is not something new. It is this difficulty I understand has been faced even by the United States of America, where once peace had dawned in 1990 onwards, there has been shutting down of a large number of shipbuilding industries in the United States. And that is how the industry got shifted from USA, UK, and European countries to the Asian, Southeast Asian countries of Japan, Korea, Singapore, and now China. They are also had also the same problems where the, pri the private participation shrunk in America and there were even demands from the industry that only uh, ships which are having their flags of American origin only should be allowed to enter, others should be given a higher tariff of 50%. It was in order to boost the, the, the shipbuilding industry in the local in America. So the problem is same unless the government, the state intervenes for the development of the shipbuilding industry, there will be a decline. And once it declines, it is very difficult to revive overnight because it involves expertise of manpower and it exploits the utilization of the facilities which has been a set up in the in the respective dockyards. Now, if we have if if somebody can learn a lesson from this, yes, now the government of India apparently has woken up to the need for reviving this uh, shipbuilding as a uh, as an, a serious activity. Next one. Towards this, now the country has 
taken a few initiatives which I would list here. The tech has accorded infrastructure status to the shipbuilding industry in 2015, thereby making them eligible for long-term funding. It has allowed foreign direct investment up to 100% for port and harbor construction and maintenance projects. It has also facilitated a 10-year tax holiday to enterprises that develop, maintain, and operate ports, inland waterways, and inland ports. As mentioned yesterday, there has been a national perspective plan for Sagar Mala. The, under this, six new mega ports are to be developed in the country, of which one of them is our William International Trans Container Transshipment Project. Then you have the Inland Vessels Bill 2021, which uh, envisages attempts to include a single legislation for the country and the, the certificate of registration issued in one state will be valid throughout the country and state approvals are not necessary. Then we have also got a Maritime Vision Document 2030, which uh, includes about 150 initiatives over 10 themes covering all the facets of the Indian maritime sector and a comprehensive effort to define and meet the national maritime objectives. Then the government has also aimed to operationalize about 23 inland waterways by 2030, which are cost effective and environmentally sustainable mode so that you get last mile connectivity for transportation of goods. And our water metro, which you have seen yesterday, is definitely one of the finest examples by which the, the waterways are better utilized for the benefit of the, the populace. Now, coming to next one, warship industry specifically, I told you that uh, the Indian warship industry is relatively, compared to commercial ship industry, warship industry has been fairly well placed. The Indian Peninsula offers a very unique advantage geographical position wise among the community of nations. That is why the even right from the Vedic periods and even later till the arrival of the Europeans in the Indian shores, the seafaring activities were limited to only trade and spread of religion. But with the arrival of the Portuguese voyagers, we, the, uh, to, in order to adjust the Arabs from the trade, through the Indian Ocean, naval warfare got into our lexicon of seafaring. That is a, probably the first time when the naval warfare came into existence. That is, we have the stories of Kunyali Marikyar, the Marathas holding forts in the West, etc. So, the British also tried to use the local expertise in shipbuilding with the help of Parsis like the Wadias. So, building for building ports for shipbuilding and repair. Thus, with the attainment of independence, we had the Royal Indian Royal Navy, which was rechristened as the Indian Navy with 27 ships as assets. The two ways, wars with Pakistan in 65 and 71, highlighted the need for a very strong Navy. This resulted in the setting up the several naval dockyards I mentioned, named LHSL, GRC, the Goa shipyard and the Cochin shipyard in the public sector. In addition, there are about two dozen shipyards which are in the private sector, making very smaller commercial boats. But accepting the LNT shipyard in Katupalli in Chennai, I mean, others all have virtually closed their shops due to financial crisis. Now the situation is that there are not many developing countries like India having the capability to produce such a wide variety of warships ranging from fast attack craft to aircraft carriers. The point to be highlighted in this is the sterling capability of the Directorate of Naval Design to design warships with advanced features, including stealth characteristics. Presently, there are about 57 vessels in under construction by the defense industry, and around 60 are in the blueprint stage for construction in future, according to a report. That augurs well for the shipbuilding expertise as well as uh, the personnel who are pursuing their career in the shipbuilding. And now coming to submarines, Navy, next one. I have shown some of the photographs there. Now coming to submarines, the <coughs> Navy acquired a submarine arm in the 70s 
at that time we had leased the submarines from the from russia and uh, a few more about 11 more numbers sindhu class submarines in in in, in the 90s this was argumented by the four SSKs from Germany and a few more EKMs from Russia. Now, nuclear submarines were also leased from Russia, but the indigenous manufacture of the submarines got boost from the nuclear submarine in Vaisak, the Arihand, which you would have heard about it in 2012. And the six Scorpion submarines have currently completed their built in. MDL in the last few years with the collaboration of DCNS France. The building of the aircraft carrier in CSL in 2022 has been a shot in the arm for the shipbuilding industry with one more to follow in CSL itself. The admission of the naval authorities that the indigenization of warships out of the three categories of build, move, and fight categories 90% indigenization has been achieved so far as a build category is itself as an acknowledgement of the achievement of self-reliance in shipbuilding and ship repair in the country. Credit goes to Navy for this, for institutionalizing a 15-year maritime capability perspective plan in defense shipbuilding and also the execution of the plan meticulously by the CWPA with its in-house design and production directorates and warship overseeing teams positioned in the specific DPSUs, ably supported by a host of quality assurance and trial teams. This was mentioned by uh, Admiral Bimal Kumar yesterday. So much for the warship technology. Now, next one. Now, when it comes to overall, if you look at the overall status, you find that in defense ship building capacity and infrastructure exists for building aircraft carriers, submarines, destroyers, and frigates. By the way, we should be proud that the present chairman of the Cochin Shipyard Limited, Dr. Madhu Nair, Madhu S. Nair is a product from, from here. And uh, we are proud that Kochi is a place where now large amount of activities are taking place with respect to shipbuilding. The, 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 the trust that the Navy has placed in, in Cochin shipyard, which was basically a ship repair yard, which has grown into a shipbuilding yard, to a defense shipbuilding yard, is something which has to be written in golden letters. Now, the supply side issues in the gaps in the shipbuilding industry are the skewed distribution of capability, meaning warship, there is a grouse that warship uh, building has been completely, has been cornered by the defense PSUs, and there has been hardly any private sector participation. But even after opening it out to the, the respective uh, private sector for both the reliance as well as other industries, they have closed their shop due to, uh, for whatever reason, financial and other reasons, the RNEL has been closed down, PIPAWA has been closed down. But the fact that it is like, we cannot expect that accepting the LNT Scatupoli project, which has been giving certain ships for the uh, Coast Guard, as well as they have been uh, under the license, they have been doing it for GRSC. I don't see much light as far as private shipyards becoming defense shipyards. Then there is the problem, unlike the Navy, the commercial shipbuilding, there is no, there doesn't appear to be a perspective plan for a 15 year perspective plan or anything like that. So there is a low demand and lack of orders in the commercial local shipbuilding. And there is a production inefficiency and financial weaknesses because there are no global markets. So what is the way ahead? The way ahead is shipping and shipping in the shipping and shipbuilding industry. They are actually interrelated. Unless the Indian companies are, are prepared to, to put in requisition Indian ships for their shipping requirements, there is hardly any scope for more ships to be in demand. Second one probably is the coastal and inland shipping 
that needs to be enhanced, which also will increase the demand for domestic ship, which will boost the shipbuilding industry. So establish, I feel that establishment of an empowered body to ensure consolidation of efforts and prudent distribution of load besides regulating the industry's growth in a systematic manner. Now, some of them are under the Department of Ports and Shipping. Some of them are under the Department of Defense. Some of them are under the control of Ministry of Earth Sciences and so on and so forth. So I don't see a unified umbrella, single umbrella under which there is a perspective plan for commercial building, commercial ship building that is, that is apparently is aware, is the need of the day. The systematically, we have to target the foreign market in Eastern East Asian countries in both commerce and defense needs, thereby increasing the global market share for India's shipping and shipyard industry. Actually, till 2013, even in DRDO, there was a general, even in the, among the Navy, there was a feeling that we are we don't have the capability to export anything in the defense market. It was at that time we had argued heavily that there are enough countries in the Southeast Asian countries where there are markets for our shipbuilding, our sonar systems and ships. And that is how our first deal in DRDO for an export, it happened from NPOL to the Myanmar. Three ships were transferred to them and our sonars were fitted to them. And in that process, HMT also gained some benefits out of it. So export doesn't mean that you have to export to USA. There are enough countries who require, who has got much less expertise than we have in, in terms of shipbuilding as well as oceanography. That needs to be tapped. That needs to be tapped both not. If it can be done for defense, definitely it can be done for commercial ships also. That is what I feel. Now, last before I close, I let me scan the horizon for the emerging prospects in ocean engineering also. Next one, last one of the last slides. Though as a nation, we missed the boat as far as the shipbuilding industry is concerned in the last three, four decades. But we should not miss it as far as the we have become a pioneer in the deep ocean mining industry. Till recently, ocean engineering referred to only the jetty building, coastal erosion, and oil rigs, and other various use of various buoys. But now, deep sea ocean mission, which has been proposed by the Ministry of Earth Sciences with the 4,567 crores in the five years, is an effort to catch up with the widening gaps with other countries in the new area of ocean mining, and it will be a game changer as far as India is concerned. Because now NIOT Chennai is already having a deep ocean technology team supporting the development of remotely operated vehicles, remotely operated uh, uh, soil testers, portable soil testers, crawlers, et cetera, for deep ocean usage. The deployment of Samudraya next year will be a major step in this direction. So is, uh, this department is also advised to have serious partnership with NIOT to gain immense knowledge in this promising area. The International Seabed Authority has allotted around 75,000 square kilometers in the Indian Ocean close to the Andaman Islands with a contract expiry period of 2031. So that seabed is reported to be rich in minerals containing cobalt, nickel, and uh, other lithium and copper and other polymetallic nodules. These precious metals, that would be a prerequisite for the electronic industry in the coming years. It is captive with the foreign sources and we, it has got implications as far as the reduction of carbon footprint in uh, and also pushing the climatic change. Now, next one, last one. Yeah, this is, this is as far as the ocean engineering is concerned. A serious effort is being made to revive the, or to, or to revive, to pioneer the ocean engineering. That is where our Savantrayan, you will find, will make ripples in the Indian Ocean in the next year. As far as the next one, when I go, went through the your themes, which has been there for the Econoi, I, I could broadly classify them into four groups, which is related to warship design and 
for ship design and also the shipbuilding industry and that related to green shipping and that related to ocean engineering. So I would like to conclude by flagging the following six points as next one. Despite being a seafaring nation and endowed with the favorable factors, we lost out in shipbuilding industry in the 20th century to Europe and then to the Southeast Asian nations due to lack of vision. Number one. Number two, circumstances and perspective planning under Navy helped to strengthen the defense shipping in courtesy a directorate of naval design and a directorate of quality assurance in Navy. Three, the country's share in commercial and cruise shipping is woefully low. So it is the commercial shipbuilding the, it is therefore it is the case in the commercial shipbuilding also. Fourth, the several blue economy initiatives of the present dispensation needs to be realized, needs to be exploited to revitalize this sector. Fifth, fifthly, deep ocean mission program of the MOES provides a new frontier for advances in ocean engineering. And lastly, I would re-assert re that new technology induction thrives not only on the merits of the technologies that we pursue, but it also requires opportunities also. The, so therefore, you have to keep your eyes open and ears open to look, find out where the opportunities are. And before I conclude, last, last one. I have just two suggestions. I don't know whether it would make any great sense to the audience and the department. Like in uh, somewhere in 2011, inspired by one of my chief controllers, we had in NBOL uh, organized a meeting of the industries who are collaborating with us or may need collaboration with us in NPOL in 20, 2011, if I remember right. There were about 19 industries who came over there. So that was a meeting of technology seekers and technology providers. The big 19 industries was a not big number then, but that was the first time I had taken the my colleagues helped me to organize that. Then in 2013, we had the, what we call as the NIM 2013, the NBOL industry meet. There was about 43 participants who were there, both from Kerala as well as from South India. And that was much bigger. And we also held an exhibition in connection with that so that the industries get an opportunity to showcase their products, which probably others are looking forward to, who will be providing that. Then we had in 2015, the NIM3, NIM3, which about 71 participants were there, including big players like the dockyards of the various, not only the those who are dealing with the sonar, but also those who were building ships were also present there. So this uh, meeting of the industries under NPOL's umbrella helped the, the big players and the small players to interact with each other with the NPOL probably playing a broker's role. That uh, pro also provided people to know where the talents are available. And so my suggestion here is probably the department can hold, you now you are thinking of having the international conferences every alter, alternate year. And the other alternate years, if you hold this sort of a, a gathering of industries who are supporting shipbuilding in Kerala as well as uh, in other, other areas, it will definitely act as a place for interaction between the student community, the research community, and for them to tell what technologies they are looking for 
and what technologies that you can provide and it will provide it will help you to make links for getting placed and placements in the respective industry and those this that meeting will definitely enrich your conferences in the next year because they will be in a position or they will be interested in sponsoring events for the conferences also so it will be a mutually uh, beneficial enterprise alternate years in coe and alternate years probably the ship technology industry meet that is one second suggestion is now we know that lot of initiatives are underway or or people will be cornering the the funds which are earmarked for the blue economy initiatives and of course something is definitely happening as far as kerala is concerned one example is a water metro which i find here and definitely the fact that they have used solar power or electric power for powering the boat is a step in the green shipping and there are other initiatives taking place where green economy green shipping is being done so in as far as ship building in industry is concerned what all developments are taking place in the state in and around cochin there has to be someone who has to be monitoring and probably auditing and taking account of st taking status status count of that probably the, the this department can be an oral agency to drive and take stock of the blue economy initiatives in the state of ship building sector this is just a suggestion which i am making based on <coughs> probably hmt got their international order for the directing year which is purely a mechanical engineering gadget their first product the company was going on a loss and by transferring that technology to it was very interesting that uh, they we got the order to supply sonar for uh, myanmar but the european countries refused to give the directing gear with which they were supplying for india because myanmar was having the military agenda but then we had to meet the deadlines and we may lose the order immediately npl stepped in and told that if only hmt is given the chance to bid for it we will provide the technology and they made it within third three months they made it and we could supply the item to myanmar and indian navy thereafter started procuring it from hmt and now they are every year they are making profit of 2.5 to 3 crores by virtue of the fact that directing here is on demand by the indian navy so that is where i said the extraneous factors sometimes drive the induction of the technology for that you have to keep your eyes and ears open somebody has to be around to see whether such opportunities can be capitalized definitely we also got the help from kochin shipyard when materials were in short supply so that brings in fact i had told them that they should transform from hindustan machine tools to hindustan marine tools so that their future is secured for future so this is these are just sharing some examples by which the ship building industry and the, that is where the ecosystem matters it is not only on a particular product you have to see in and around whether there are other products which can be delivered as a part of the main system that is what we call when we say talk about ship building industry also when we say ecosystem it doesn't mean only the ship itself there are a large number of activities associated with the ship building which needs to be given a push and that and lastly i find by my experience in the vaisak dockyard and so well as mdl i find that there is a huge gap in knowledge base as far as the working class is concerned we try to introduce new technology while the workers are familiar with the old technology yesterday we were talking about industry 4.0 and all that that uh, internet of things iot vr ar and all that but the workers are far away from all these realities so who is going to put the guide when we were doing the uh, many uh, installations on board ship we could see the the crude way in which they were handling the sophisticated instruments we are trying to put on board so who will take charge of educating the 
educating the working class and bringing them up to the new technology. I think we have also a role to play so that waste and damages to the equipment can be minimized and the, you can get the support and the trust of the working class also. Not only introducing a new technology is not just putting the technology across board, we have to carry the working class also along with us. These are some of the random thoughts which came to my mind. I thought I will share with you. I think I will stop at this point. I express my heartfelt thanks to Rajesh P. Nair, Dr. Shiva Prasad, and Sadish Babu for inviting me for this conference. And I am very happy that I could convey some of my thought processes here, just as I did about 10 years back. Thank you. Uh, wonderful presentation, sir. Uh, myself, Arvind Kerr, I'm the assistant professor with uh, the Department of Ship Technology. Uh, I've uh, seen the sessions, what you have put forward after the slide. Uh, just one question. Uh, you were uh, referring to the shipbuilding share of uh, India with uh, China. If I'm correct, the Chinese shipbuilding share has raised to almost 48 to 49 percent uh, currently, which is combined uh, shares of Japan and uh, South Korea. But then, uh, if you the the combined uh, uh, you know uh, shipbuilding global shipbuilding share of Japan and South Korea, if I'm correct, and uh, if you see the recent scenario, recent trend, LNG market is in the uh, high side, the LNG shipbuilding market, and uh, uh, even if the Korea's shares uh, has decreased to 19 to 20 percent uh, when compared with China, which is holding a 49 percent in the global scenario. The LNG shipbuilding share of South Korea is around 78 to 79 percent globally. And uh, to that point, if you see uh, the kind of R&D coming in uh, to the South Korean shipyards, we can see that the R&D is coming from the uh, universities, especially University of Ulsan, for that matter, which is a direct, uh, you know, collaborator of the Hyundai shipyard. Uh, so my question is, uh, the suggestions what we put forward is really wonderful. So what is the government's, uh, uh, you know, uh, take or uh, government stand or policy uh, in funding the universities, especially the universities who are running maritime based courses? Uh, what is what is, what could be your suggestion uh, so that the government can, you know, either, you know, increase the funding to promote the research so that we will be able to uh, develop our own technologies for building the future LNG as well as hydrogen uh, fuel vessels. So what is what is your call in that particular uh, question? Uh, thank you very much for the question. I am not uh, necessarily an expert in the aspects of uh, uh, the, the new the new developments in the shipbuilding area. But nevertheless, I could tell you that the initiate government can only provide you the 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 funding as well as the as the framework under which it can be operated. But it is for I feel it is for the institutions to take the initiative to interact with them with the authorities and get the grants or aid sanctioned to them. I find Delhi is a very peculiar place where things don't happen as what we think in in the in 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 the working places where the not necessarily the knowledge would not, would would doesn't percolate upwards it downwards. It is for you to go and convince them that the need for 
uh, allow i mean i don't think anybody has disallowed the universities to interact with the the with the yeah, agency is concerned but we we have to take the initiative take the funding i know that a good amount of funds are lying unutilized in the various departments for want of takers of uh, utilizing the funds in an effective manner even naval research board has got sufficient funds to uh, to to support these activities and uh, we pay a lip service to the word academy industry interaction but that has to be made into a reality by the parties concerned i, I think the private parties per se they look for quick returns for their investment with that is probably one reason why our country has not seen much of a they neither put money in their r&d nor they put money in the r&d in the institutions but if that gap is to be made up then that now in my opinion the initiative has to come from the the academicians themselves and go and canvas and get it done when you, when you go to delhi and try to convince them and they get something i there there is hardly any difficulty in fact i have always in my popular science article i have mentioned that it is a combination of the, the science doesn't develop by on its own whether amma swaminathan or vargis kurian they have developed agriculture as well as uh, uh, the dairy industry not surely by the merit of the the technology but because of the ability with which they were able to convince the powers that be that if i do this what will happen to the whole organization whole area they were virtually on the doorsteps of every cabinet secretary and try to get the fund sanction or the uh any any interaction with the foreign countries like new zealand and others they have tried to carry them along with us even sam vitroda has not done by his own he has had such an immense tremendous amount of clout with rajiv gandhi at that time and that is how the it industry could be promoted like that someone has to has to come forward and influence the powers that be that still definitely can happen if you get a burgess korean in ship building industry definitely what you said would become a reality in our country also i hope that comes from the department of ship technology in kochi to <laughs> said hello uh, it seems a question uh, is there from the online um, uh, audience so uh, are there any questions from the audience online uh, kindly unmute your mic hello i am audible yeah yeah audible audible yeah yes sir sir uh, it was a wonderful presentation sir i i just want to actually my concern is with this uh, ship building uh, uh, only uh, sir in 2016 uh, uh, the dg shipping has started uh, <clears throat> a policy that is that is called like uh, ship building financial assistance policy sir uh, and we have around like you know as you know uh, i i believe we have around 700 companies into ship building uh, in india but in this uh, policy only 32 have only applied while others didn't even you know took a chance to even apply sir so what is the what, what do you think like you know what will be the reason why why these uh, you know uh, not even 10 percent of the companies are ready to go for such policy sir what would be the reason behind it sir i i mentioned about the, the demand side as well as the supply side I don't think our supply side is that bad, but apparently, since the demand side is less, who would like to put his put his hand in the in the industry where there is hardly the enough demand is not there? How to raise the demand is another question. But they themselves would have felt that if if they if they go in for the shipbuilding industry, it will end up in a 
no no win situation that may be the reason i am not an expert but i, I genuinely feel that there is a lack of demand as far as the, especially in the cruise shipping as well as commercial shipping is concerned so how to improve that is something which we all have to think about how to improve the commercial shipping how to increase the percentage of the indian vessels in the international trade and that is something which has the initiate that is where i said it has to be a umbrella organization which has to sit and decide what they are going to do to increase the share of the country in the commercial shipping is concerned it is not proportionate to the amount of trade that is taking place from the country all over the world it is all on foreign ships that it is taking place i hope that will may give a clue to the question which you asked yes sir uh, but the thing is sir where so sir as you said that people are not coming in the field sir there are ship building companies around 700 uh, we have around 700 ship building companies in india itself but uh, when there is a policy available from the government why they are not ready to take that you know financial assistance also that's my concern sir no you the financial financial help is required only when my order book is full isn't it otherwise right. I, i do it. i am not taking the funds for developing my ship building ship building uh, yard i need i need business without business how do i i, I where will i get my repayment done from my side that is probably the reason why of course there are a Uh, how many research vessels how many uh, commercial vessels will be are getting ordered that is a question even probably we need many more water metros across the country so that there are people are able to take advantage of it for improving the amount of shipping using the inland shipping that is what i feel but how many takers are there for such initiatives so funding funding alone may not be the answer for the uh, lack of uh, ship building in the country probably we need to create a system ecosystem where the demand side is also increasing there should be more demands for the smart ships as well as uh, larger ships also even how many large scale cruise ships are being manufactured in the country and who will who will demand it that is a question okay sir thank you okay uh, thank you sir for the very insightful talk yeah, we are blessed to have a session from you sir uh, now i invite uh, dr sriji nandumar sir to present a memento uh, to dr anandar and sir as a token of our gratitude i i received the mail regarding this conference three days back i saw the schedule and saw that the honorable professor narendra sir is presenting it on today morning i immediately called fawaz and asked him will you permit me for the program i would like to come and see him and about that to hear him he told yes So I may, let me start, let me speak from my heart. If you are a Niyoga, I will be able to do this. I will be able to do this. If you are not a Karnan, I will be able to do this. Dr. Sadeesh Babu, I will be able to do this. 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 The two things I will be able to do is the department of this country. I think you follow Malayalam. Malayalam is a very important part of the country. So when I was a student, maybe 40 years back, there was something called III, that is Institute Industry Interaction. That is the way an education institution, engineering institution can upgrade itself. Now there are 100,000 words in that regard, modern vocabulary. 
but the matter remained the same it is triple i and it was at that time prolsahana janagam enna parayan pattilla nirulsaha janagam enna paranju kaniyal adu nannu kedagum adu kondu avaku upayogikkanilla അങ്ങനെ ഒരു അന്തീക്ഷണമായിരുന്നു ഈ ഡിപ്പാർട്ട്മെന്റിലോ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റി അഡ്മിനിസ്ട്രേഷനിലോ ഉണ്ടായിരുന്നത് ഈ ക്യാമ്പസിൽ നിന്ന് പുറത്തു പോയി ഒരു ഫണ്ടഡ് പ്രൊജക്ട് മേടിക്കുന്ന കാര്യത്തിൽ ആ സമയത്ത് വളരെ മഹാനുഭാവനായിട്ട് ഇവിടുത്തെ എന്താ പറയുന്നത് ശാസ്ത്രത്തിനോട് അല്ലെങ്കിൽ ഗവേഷണത്തിനോട് താല്പര്യമുള്ള അധ്യാപകന്റെ പൾസ് അറിഞ്ഞ് അതിനോട് അദ്ദേഹം പ്രതികരിച്ചു ഒരു വലിയ നമസ്കാരമാണ് അദ്ദേഹത്തിനോടുള്ളത് അത് ഒരു കാര്യം രണ്ട് ആ സ്ഥലത്ത് ഇരിക്കുമ്പോൾ ഞാൻ എപ്പോഴും ഓർക്കാറുള്ള ഒരു കാര്യമുണ്ട് ഐ വാസ് വെരി ക്രിട്ടിക്കൽ അബൌട്ട് ദ സ്ലൈഡ്സ് ദാറ്റ് ആർ പ്രൊജക്റ്റഡ് ഇത്രയും പരാധീനതകളുടെ നടുവിലും സാറിൻ്റെ സ്ലൈഡ്സ് ആൾമോസ്റ്റ് പെർഫെക്റ്റ് ആയിരുന്നു എക്സെപ്റ്റ് ദാറ്റ് ദർ വാസ് എ ടീം മിസ്സിംഗ് ഇൻ എ ട്രേഡ് ആ മനുഷ്യൻ്റെ അടിസ്ഥാന ഗുണം മാറുകയില്ല അതുകൊണ്ടിട്ടാണ് പിന്നെ ഒരു സംതിങ് ഇൻ ദ ലൈറ്റ് സൈഡ് ഈ ഷിപ്പ് ബിൽഡിംഗ് ഇൻഡസ്ട്രിക്ക് ആരും ഒരു അക്രോണിം എസ് ബി ഐ ഒരു അക്രോണിം തന്നെ കണ്ടിട്ടില്ല സാർ ഇപ്പോ എസ് ബി ഐ ആയിട്ടുള്ള ആ ഒരു ആ ഒരു മമതാ ബന്ധം കൊണ്ടിട്ടായിരിക്കും സാർ ഒരു പക്ഷെ അത് ഉപയോഗിച്ചത് ഈ അവസര അവസരത്തിന് വളരെ നന്ദി ഗുരുവോ ഗുരുവിനേക്കാളും മേളിലുള്ള അദ്ദേഹത്തിനെ ഞാൻ ആദരിക്കുകയാണ് നിങ്ങളെ അനുവാദത്തോടുകൂടി Uh, now we'll go for a tea break
Hello. Now we are going to start the third technical session. So I kindly request the audience uh, to get into the seminar hall for resuming the uh, conference. Good morning. Welcome to the third technical session of ICANO 23. Uh, the technical session three deals with a water transportation system. This session is chaired by uh, Mr. Sergeant P. John, General Manager KMRL, and co-chaired by uh, Dr. Hasina K. Assistant Professor, Department of Ship Technology, QSET. Now I welcome uh, Dr. Hasina K. to introduce the session chair, Sergeant Sir. Good morning. It's my great privilege to introduce Mr. Sajan P. John, Chief Operating Officer, Kochi Water Metro and General Manager, Water Metro Operations. And sir pursued his B.Tech in Mechanical Engineering from TKM College of Engineering and has Marine Engineering Training from DMET, Calcutta. And he pursued his LLB from School of Legal Studies, QZ. He started his long career with Shipping Corporation of India with more than 15 years of sailing experience in various ships. Sailed as chief engineer and later joined the SCA office as marine superintendent. Seven years in the ship shipbuilding department, completing a series of projects in various shipyards in Korea, China, and India, a site manager and project manager for the company fleet, as well as for the company clients. And is left as GM shipbuilding. He joined Kochi Water Metro Rail by the end of 2016. Took charge as the Chief Operating Officer for the newly formed SPV Kochi Water Metro Limited for the operation and maintenance in the Kochi Water Metro system. Now I welcome Sir onto the dais for the invited talk. Please, Sir. Uh, good morning, everybody. First of all, uh, thank you for inviting me to this session. And uh, uh, 
uh, we have gone through the complete history of uh, Indian shipping. An excellent presentation, uh, Anandar and sir. And uh, uh, actually, uh, I could identify a lot of things uh, with uh, uh, my past uh, experience because I uh, served as uh, uh, project manager for uh, some of the shipbuilding uh, projects in Korea and China as well. So I lived there and uh, know the ecosystem and uh, have a very good uh, comparison and understanding uh, with the uh, Indian shipbuilding. So I'm not uh, going detail because my subject is different. So let me introduce uh, water metro system. So my subject is uh, about reinventing uh, water urban water transport, urban water transport system. That is uh, the subject. Okay, uh, I think everybody is familiar with uh, this kind of memories, though we have not seen, uh, maybe many of us not, not seen in our lifetime, but uh, this was a Navala market a uh, few decades back. I can say a few decades back. If you go into the history in the, uh, as the civilizations uh, developed, uh, the requirement of transport was met through water only. In uh, 1900, uh, uh, they say more than 90% of transport requirement was met through water transport systems. Then uh, as the civilization advanced, uh, technology advanced, uh, we built uh, roads, rail, and uh, they were, of course, in a faster mode. Uh, naturally, uh, humankind moved towards uh, those, those kind of transportation system in urban transport systems. But even now, uh, uh, when we say uh, uh, on an, uh, when we see the economy, so more than uh, uh, ninety percent by volume of goods transported in international uh, uh, international arena is by water transport only. By by value, more than seventy percent. So maybe uh, have we identified the importance as a country? Have we identified the importance? That is a question, definitely. Uh, except uh, except those uh, related in the field. So recently, last last month, uh, October seventeen to nineteen, there was a uh, global maritime India summit. Uh, it seems a very welcome step from the government because. Uh, in the submit, more than 10 lakh crore MOUs were signed. It's a very good sign. It's a, it's a huge number. India is looking for a uh, not, not 5 trillion economy, but we are looking for a 10 trillion economy. Now. So the government uh, side also understood importance of uh, maritime industry, maybe. So this is where we stand now. There was a vision document. Sir was telling about the vision document uh, 30. But in that uh, summit, uh, uh, Honorable Prime Minister has uh, given a vision 47, maritime vision 47. So definitely uh, some importance, more importance uh, is coming to maritime industry. So we should be ready for the industry. That is what I feel. So an efficient transport system is the key to economic progress. This everybody know, water transport as an alternative, where we stand. Kerala, uh, uh, I, I, I will take Kerala. Uh, we have a large network of water bodies. Uh, the longest uh, lake in India is our Vampanad Kail. It's uh, more than uh, 2,000 square kilometers of area. And we have uh, 1680 kilometers of navigable waters. We have a West Coast Canal of 560 kilometer. National Waterways 3. This was one of the uh, first, uh, uh, when, when we introduced National Waterways, that concept, this was one of the first uh, to be declared. That is about uh, 205 kilometers. We have a coastal line of more than 580 kilometers. We have definitely have a very good advantage. 
So I am uh, uh, coming to urban water transport, uh, urban transport systems. See, now, now we have a metro, uh, the city of Kochi, we have a metro, we have city buses, uh, other transport systems. We had boat services. Of course, uh, in the past, maybe if you look at uh, 60s and 70s, uh, the islands around Kochi, uh, only means of transport was uh, water transport. And the boats were uh, overcrowded all the time. Then uh, slowly that has come down as uh, uh, maybe after the Goshri bridges came, uh, th that is definitely uh, most of the private owners, uh, they uh, shut down their boat services. Only skeleton services exist now. That was the situation now. Then, uh, uh, but the problems of city, you know, transport problems of city was ever increasing. Day by day it's increasing. Our roads are getting chalked. Uh, then we thought uh, metro is a solution. Metro is also not a solution. Or, or, but now what is identified is a seamless transportation. That is the integration of different transport mode. That may be the only solution where we have to move on. So that is how uh, there was a thinking of uh, rejuvenating these water transport systems uh, for the city and integrating with other transport modes. So this, uh, uh, that... Uh, uh, you could see the Kochi One card, which is introduced by the Kochi Metro. This is a, a, a one of the solutions for integration. Uh, there is a single network. It can be used in any mode of transportation. That is the plan. Uh, but definitely, uh, it does not come to the full uh, uh, benefit to everybody uh, because people are not adapting it to very easily. It was introduced to many of the buses also. But use is, use is picking up, but not up to what we expect. So we're talking about integrated uh, transport system, we have developed an integrated transport map for Kochi. So there you can see uh, this, this is a, a metro line. These dotted lines are the water metro system. And other lines are the roads and other things, railway and all this. Now, coming to uh, the vision, actually, we want to align with the global objectives in this uh, case, the vision of uh, sustainable mobility. So this is built on four pillars. One is uh, universal access, equitable access for everybody. This is very important because because uh, when you say disabled friendly, uh, our national uh, uh, statistics say only 3% are uh, disabled. 3% of the population is disabled. But actually, whether it is correct, because as we, every one of us keep aging, then we will have definitely some issues. So if you take... Uh, the, the issues of the old age, then uh, the percentage of people who require uh, friendly systems in transport, that is more than 13 percentage. It's a, it's a huge uh, 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 patch of uh, the population. Uh, second pillar, efficiency, bringing in efficiency in transport system, then uh, safety has to be taken to forefront then uh, a green initiative this is also very critical for uh, especially the front of global warming and that issues now we'll come to water metro systems so what is what is about the project so in a, a snapshot of this is uh, what we are aiming is around uh, uh, 34000 uh, daily ridership we will have a uh, we have divided uh, the total system into seven, uh, 76 road kilometers are there. It is divided into 15 roads. 78 boats are planned, 38 uh, terminals in uh, uh, this is in 10 islands. Then we are connecting around 10 islands to the mainland. 8 to 15 minutes headway, uh, that is what we planned. 8 to 10 knot speed. Uh, speed is again. Uh, this is the biggest challenge uh, for any water transport system. But when you are comparing with uh, other transport modes, uh, 
definitely water transport is water transport can achieve higher speeds but the problem is as you uh, everybody knows that uh, power requirement exponentially increases so we have to settle down somewhere uh, in, a, in a balanced way that is how we reached here 8 to 10 years sorry so go back to uh, the thing in the google map you can see uh, that 15 routes in different colors from uh, right from Barapura to uh, Edakochi and uh, Fort Kochi to Info Park. Uh, there are 15 routes we are divided. Out of this, uh, presently, uh, we are operating three routes. One is uh, High Court Waipin, uh, Vaitla Kakanad, and uh, uh, a small stretch to Bolgati also. So we are expecting to start uh, Sauchi tour by uh, next month. Uh, then it will be one more route added. So I'll come to the different components of uh, water metro. Of course, the terminals, what we see. Then the berths are made on floating pontoons. This, uh, actually, why we went for floating pontoons? The world over, if you see the uh, transport systems, especially uh, that uh, passenger uh, urban transport systems, they are using, they were using floating pontoons. But in India, this is introduced for the first day. Basically, uh, to enable that uh, disabled-friendly access to boats. We have a passenger control system. Those who are boarding to, uh, going to the floating pontoons, they go through a passenger control system. In this passenger control system, uh, I can say, I can claim uh, this is first time in the world. If you see uh, the ferry accidents all over the world, 90% of the ferry accidents happened uh, because of overcrowding. So this was one of very critical safety aspect that we have taken care. How this is working is actually, uh, uh, see it is a dynamic counting mechanism, uh, the, the normal turnstiles. Uh, it just counts uh, uh, people going in and out of uh, the pond route system. So when a boat, the bars are made uh, route specific. When a boat comes, that is uh, that is for a particular route. Then people alighting and uh, boarding, this is counted dynamically. Then when it reaches the predetermined level, uh, say the capacity of the boat, then automatically it co uh, it locks. Of course, this way, uh, this is it is it is possible to do it uh, manually, but uh, that kind of systems uh, ultimately fails because we we all know when uh, there is a New Year celebration in uh, in Fort Kochi and all this, we have seen the boards. The, we cannot control the people because they they uh, if somebody uh, comes in between and stops them, uh, they don't mind. They will just push him and then uh, board the boat. So only a mechanical system. Uh, which is an automatic uh, control system can only do this. And uh, when when the when a boat leaves uh, a particular station, uh, this capacity that vacancies it is automatically transferred to the next station. So it will start. Suppose uh, uh, the capacity is say hundred, uh, eighty people are boarded. Uh, vacancy is only twenty. Next next uh, station it will start from twenty. So only twenty people will be allowed. This is how it works. Then uh, uh, the boards we will discuss uh, later. Uh, we have an automatic boat location system. Uh, this is uh, we we have an operating control system uh, as part of a central command and control. Uh, we have an operating control center. Uh, from here, actually, the, these boards are communicating with OCC uh, continuously, and automatic boat location system continuously gives the position of the boat, its speed, uh, uh, the position uh, uh, from where. We know if there is a route violation or a speed violation, everything is available here in OCC. And uh, the charging system, uh, um, this we are targeting uh, to have a charging system 100% uh, from renewable energy. Boats are all electric, uh, need, need not to see. And uh, uh, actually, uh, there was a question, uh, why uh, our boats are not uh, solar boards. There are some experiments happened in uh, in uh, Kochi itself uh, with uh, solar boards, solar on the roof. 
actually our analysis uh, was that that kind of system are not very efficient because we want to go at a higher speed of 8 to 10 knots that time your power power requirement is very high in our boards actually uh, we can have say up to uh, say 12 kilowatt of uh, kilowatt peak of solar panels on top but actually that will give only some say uh, by going by industry standard give, give only 36 kilowatt uh, hour of energy with only 36 units of energy this is not sufficient for on our operation so we don't want to we didn't want to uh, unnecessarily increase the uh, draft of the boat by loading it to the top because this is only very very uh, partial because we are operating for uh, planning to operate for 16 hours a day and you you are going to get maximum one hour energy so that is how uh, we thought this will be made a land-based uh, solar plant wherein uh, the solar plant will be much more efficient because if you go for an on-grid uh, kind of uh, operations on-grid on kind of solar installations then uh, per kilowatt you can uh, extract around uh, 4.5 to 5 uh, units of energy a day whereas in a battery operated that is off-grid systems industry average is less than three so it's much more efficient than uh, normal solar systems that's why we opted for a charging system rather than a direct uh, solar system then we'll be having a boat yard because we are going to have around 78 boats we require around uh, this thing and uh, this is important work boats work boats come emergency response boat we have divided the whole uh, area of operation into four zones and uh, we will be having one emergency response boat uh, located in each zone and that is how we will be able to reach any spot within that area within 10 minutes of time so that kind of assistance will be available and these boats are used uh, for multi-purpose it's not only emergency response boat as well as this is a work boat and day-to-day uh, -day maintenance requirement of the system is also carried out using this thing uh, we are not just keeping it standby and uh, wasting that uh, mana uh, manavas or something like that. It is, it is having other functions as well, and it can be an ambulance as. Well. Then, of course, the feeder services and uh, non-motorized transport. Uh, so uh, let me uh, go to some of uh, uh, the history. We uh, this I need not how to explain what we were i'll come to this slide so initially uh, we'll talk about the boat uh, how it was constructed so initially uh, we were analyzing the different uh, uh, alternatives for the uh, powering of the boat so we have options uh, even now uh, marine maritime industry is discussing about uh, of course battery electric hybrids hydrogen uh, uh, engines or fuel cells, then ammonia, methanol, different uh, uh, to to attain that uh, targets of International Maritime Organization, what we have kept for the two, 2050 targets. Uh, there is a good news. Uh, uh, this hydrogen fuel cell, uh, yesterday, uh, Cochin Shipyard has launched uh, 150 packs uh, hybrid vessel. Uh, that is a, with the same uh, uh, platform as water metro uh, with a hydrogen fuel cell uh, maybe this is for the first time in india and uh, uh, a whole industry is looking forward uh, for the use of this alternate fuel as a means to reduce emissions uh, maybe uh, i feel uh, there are some experiments going on in uh, hydrogen internal combustion engines if that comes up, then uh, India would be offering an alternative to the world, actually. And uh, uh, from from our 80% of imports of fuel, fuel uh, uh, fossil fuel, to maybe we could become an exporting country for uh, fuel. So maybe in the, in the government, that thinking is that way, because uh, uh, with, with so much of uh, stress on the imports, we can achieve uh, to some level 
maybe in the future as an exporting country for for fuel but in our analysis actually uh, for the urban water transfer system so we wanted to if, if you see the the life cycle ghg emissions so this is representing this is including everything from uh, from uh, say well to wheel uh, what do you say? what do you say uh, gasoline plus biofuels uh, this is a level this is uh, plug in hybrid evs this is battery ev with a with a grid mix presently we, actually we are here only because we have not established uh, solar fuel but this is the critical area this is battery ev with renewable electricity this is where we want to position ourselves that means uh, from all available options with the lowest life cycle ghg then uh, coming to uh, design challenges what uh, we were having of course the challenges were because we wanted to bring in a system uh, that is suitable for the available uh, resources and available uh, channels so definitely the channel depth the channel uh, width of the channels many of the channels are very narrow uh, then uh, net commuting time was a very uh, critical thing because uh, we if you are aiming at a model shift then uh, people want to reach from uh, uh, say a to b in the lowest time that is their main criteria when when they make a decision on the on on a traveling mode then uh, uh, this wake wash that was a very uh, important criteria in the design then uh, operational sustainability uh, fuel cost when when we talk about uh, hydrogen fuel actually the greatest challenge now we are facing is uh, the cost of hydrogen green hydrogen because uh, uh, kochi metro uh, earlier we were we were asked to operate some 10 uh, hydrogen buses then we went for a tender uh, for the fuel uh, what we got back was per kilogram more than 950 rupees so with that kind of uh, the thing it is it is impossible to operate a system but uh, maybe it was two almost two years back one and a half years back but now uh, it has come down to uh, say some 450 500 level maybe in another uh, another few years four or five years cost of hydrogen might come down uh, less than 200 if it comes uh, to that level definitely it is cheaper than diesel because the efficiency thermal efficiency level is very high so uh, you can say per kg level comes down to less than 200 then it will be cheaper than diesel at uh, present level if uh, if we consider the uh, increase in cost of uh, uh, fossil fuel maybe that time it will uh, it will be achieved much faster maybe so our criteria was uh, going for an optimal uh, trough uh, then length maximum uh, speed we have to fix uh, low wake wash criteria then environmental concern uh, then we of course when we are uh, going for an electric vessel definitely the least power power uh, is very critical and uh, of course uh, least displacement because uh, the draft is very low we uh, arrived on based on the available channel and uh, other uh, width of the channel and as well as the depth uh, we arrived on a figure of uh, 0.9 meter we went for a catamaran design definitely that is to reduce basically to reduce uh, your wake wash and to achieve higher uh, efficiency in propulsion. Uh, you can uh, go through uh, this. Uh, um, actually, eight nodes, uh, uh, and here uh, we can say initial calculations because we are comparing with the available uh, uh, designs. Uh, which were going on or going over here the power taken by normal boats to the speed was around propulsion power was around 80 kilowatt actually then uh, we uh, tuned it down to 64 kilowatt in the in the preliminary calculation and if it is suppose uh, suppose the power requirement is 80 kilowatt then uh, you are going to operate for 
about uh, 12 hours 12 hours a day then what will be this will be the requirement of the battery one megawatt minimum minimum one megawatt uh, this is the power required and battery could be somewhere here so this is an impossible proposition because in a small boat definitely you cannot have uh, this kind of uh, batteries put into uh, because of the weight and the volume it is impossible proposition so what did what we did is actually uh, uh, maybe maybe this was one of the main reasons why there were not many uh, experiments uh, gone all over the world so what we did uh, was gone for a opportunity charging philosophy so oh, this was actually experimented in uh, electric vehicles in europe and all it was experimented earlier so by opportunity charging means whenever uh, a possibility of charging is there you charge it uh, to reach the next station that is that is what that uh, philosophy means uh, ideally we fixed it as one hour one hour in the sense uh, most of our routes can be uh, uh, completed within uh, that kind of uh, that uh, that period one hour time so that was one criteria in deciding the roads as well. So ultimately, uh, we came down to this battery uh, battery requirement was uh, brought down to uh, almost 122 uh, kilowatt. That is how uh, this this ferry system in electric mode was made possible. Then, uh, uh, then the question of uh, which kind of uh, chemistry we want to use of course uh, lithium is the uh, lithium uh, was the only proposition that time because uh, as we know lead acid batteries and all then uh, that cannot be uh, is more heavy much much more heavier as well as a uh, uh, lot of maintenance as well as then you cannot uh, uh, extract uh, much of the energy already available there so that was uh, not a solution so we went for lithium chemistry in lithium chemistry also uh, different chemistries we tried uh, studied and uh, we went for ltu this is lithium titanate oxide here uh, the performance is very good safety it is the safest battery commercially available specific for power is uh, slightly less specific energy is less uh, cost is high, but lifespan is very high. So we went for a, a life cycle analysis, and in life cycle analysis, this is performing very well. And uh, uh, when we went for that opportunity uh, uh, charging system, actually there was another uh, challenge that came up because the life of a battery is actually the charging cycle number of charging cycle is like normally we say it in uh, uh, calendar life say five year life or uh, 10 year life but actually the charging cycle is the criteria so if you are going for an opportunity charging every hour you are charging at least 10 to 12 times you have to charge in a day so normal lead, lead acid batteries it has a charging cycle life of say 500 in the range of 300 to 500 only but if you are using it in your house for an inverter you are using it only once in a day or maybe nowadays uh, power cut is not there so you may be using once in a week or something like that so you don't have a problem but if you are charging it every hour and uh, 10 times a day then in a month you have to charge 300 times so life of uh, uh, say one uh, life of uh, lead acid battery will be just one month maybe two months so that uh, that kind of challenges has come but this lto battery is very good in this aspect it has uh, we we have a uh, charging cycle of uh, uh, 32000 charging cycles warranty and uh, when when you calculate it to calendar life it is a seven year warranty we have 
so we are expecting around 10 year life for the battery with this kind of operation then the second challenge is actually uh, when you are charging every uh, every hour you have to charge is very quickly very fast otherwise uh, after one hour of operation you come and charge for another hour then that kind of system will not work so this lto is uh, very much into uh, good in that aspect as well because uh, in our system it can be charged in just 15 minutes 15 minutes means uh, passenger uh, alighting then uh, we have a uh, cleaning cycle and uh, security checks and all then uh, passengers are boarding by this time your battery is fully charged so that is how uh, this water meter system is taken Th these are the batteries that we were using uh, toshiba cells uh, this battery was made by hndia because that time uh, maybe hndia was only having this lto uh, dnv approval that time. it is a, a longer service life and uh, i i mentioned that uh, 32000 cycles then comes uh, another challenge uh, that is how to charge a system so uh, uh, actually we could to make a, a charger just just for that uh, kind of vessel what we are uh, but again uh, there is another challenge that future suppose we are going for a different kind of uh, operation different kind of uh, uh, battery system or a battery architecture then uh, we have another Uh, challenge coming up because these these charges may not be uh, good for the next one so we had to have a standardization so what we did is we went for electric vehicle standards electric vehicles are using uh, nowadays they are using uh, ccs there are different uh, 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 protocols but uh, now uh, everybody is settled with uh, ccs2 so we went for ccs2 then again uh, this kind of capacity uh, is, was not available Uh, because the largest capacity available was 120 kilowatt, uh, these chargers are 150 kilowatt, and then uh, we were uh, doing it in parallel, charging in parallel. So around 300 kilowatt uh, chargers we are using. These are the highest capacity chargers uh, made in India so far, and the largest network. Uh, this is the specification of the 100 passenger boat. we went for a, a dual classification we because uh, that time uh, uh, electric boats uh, uh, actually very very few designs uh, all over the world we wanted to be uh, 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 very safe so we went for this uh, battery power notation uh, from dnv as well as irs now irs also have uh, uh, battery notations and uh, uh, the dimensions arrived uh, i talked about uh, this uh, draft restrictions and all beam also we went for the uh, uh, because uh, our our channels um, uh, say average width is uh, around 32 meters this is this is actually uh, that iwa standard 32 meters is uh, standard so divided by 5 that is the maximum size uh, safe for uh, navigation in uh, both sides so that is how we settled for uh, 6.4 then uh, uh, around 25 meters is the maximum size maybe if you want to have uh, some kind of maneuvering in the boat so we adapted to the maximum size uh, then uh, uh, of course we went for a hybrid mode uh, kind of uh, things because there is a, there are diesel generators which can back up as well as Uh, operate in a hybrid mode when when you require more power but uh, so far we are operating only in electric mode a uh, normal operation is only in electric mode uh, passenger capacity is uh, uh, this is including crew 96 is uh, passenger capacity but uh, uh, with uh, with the present rules that has come uh, uh, 2022 inland water rules Uh, actually for the same area they have changed uh, that criteria maybe uh, this will be less in future boards with us if if it is the same area for the area we have to increase and we have uh, latest of navigational equipments uh, 
and uh, we introduced uh, cctv system cctv is around 20 cameras are on board every compartment is uh, having a cctv and this is uh, on online connected to the operating control center so a person uh, uh, operating control center can see uh, a whole of the board and control it actually and some uh, uh, facilities like a feeding room, then uh, charging other things we introduce. Coming to carbon footprint. So earlier I talked uh, this, uh, that uh, target what we fixed was sorry. Uh, on preliminary calculation it was around coming around 64 kilowatt. But then uh, we were optimistic. We put a very uh, optimistic target of 38 kilowatt, but finally we achieved the 34 kilowatt. Maybe this is this is one of the uh, most efficient hulls so far made. That is what even uh, Marin is telling, uh, because the model test was done in Marin, and uh, the CO2 emission. With 100% energy from solar, well, that is our target. We are uh, uh, hoping to achieve 20, by 2024, 22,800 metric tons uh, CO2 savings per annum. By 2035, uh, this is the target. So far, uh, pro rata calculation, uh, we are in track. Uh, uh, this was inauguration. Uh, Water metro was dedicated to the nation by Honorable Prime Minister on 25th April. We have completed uh, 190 days now, more than 18,000 trips completed. About 11 lakh passengers traveled, average of 5,700 passengers a day. So what is unique about uh, Water metro? Uh, this is uh, battery electric boards with the supercharges since the first time in India. Passenger control system is actually this is uh, first time in the world. We 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 never heard about any other similar systems. Disable friendly uh, jetties for the first time in India. The centrally controlled water transport system first time in India. Largest capacity EV chargers first time in India. Integrated water transport concept is first time in India. Social environment this is one of the targets we have because we have engaged uh, uh, that is Kudumbasri initiative. Uh, Hundred percent women. They are the face of uh, water metro because all ticketing, facilitation, everything is given to uh, that uh, women. Uh, but of course, there is a problem with uh, the crew because uh, from among the women, there were there were very few or maybe almost nil uh, who who has the competency certificates. This is a field which is not opted by women so far. So we want, we are going for a training scheme uh, where uh, we hope uh, more women will be. We have taken one one batch. Unfortunately, there are also only very few. But uh, in future, I hope uh, more women will join uh, uh, the uh, uh, scheme. And uh, if you see uh, Pan India potential, uh, uh, see we have a, a coastal line of 1078 kilometers uh, sorry uh, 7000 kilo, uh, kilometers and uh, uh, what uh, each each waterway uh, it is mentioned here more than 40 uh, cities in india uh, have navigable waters to to some level may not be uh, similar level as kochi but a different level this is possible in uh, so many Indian cities. Uh, we have received uh, a few awards uh, in uh, Global Maritime India Summit uh, last month. We got two awards, and we were the only uh, one organization we got uh, two awards. And uh, best city with the Green Initiative. This was last week, Urban Mobility India Conference, twenty twenty three. Uh, Water Metro was the best electric board in Gassi's uh, award 2022. Uh, ET Energy Leadership Award, then Ship Tech Award. A team of uh, IMO visited Water Metro. They were in high appreciation of people. 
So thank you. My hearty congratulations to you because I was I had a good ride from Paitla to Kalkan for two weeks back with my family and we enjoyed the trip very well. Thank you. And uh, I should definitely compliment you for that uh, disabled friendly uh, entry into the entry and exit into the boat, which is I have experienced and I have enjoyed it. Okay. Thank you, sir. And Thank you. Uh, that is, I, I, I am pro trying to promote asking people to travel in that uh, at least to support the blue economy initiatives of Walter Metro. I have just uh, one or two doubts. Like when you go from Vaitla to Kakanar, on the sides you can see some old jetties. I don't know, it would have been used by some boat service in earlier days and uh, those every jetty on the side dilapidated but nevertheless i find that from that jetty lot of uh, roads are going from there connecting to the interior of the land but uh, the present uh, boat service starts from Vaitla and ends in kakanad and vice versa but uh, can it be uh, is there any prospect of at any time it uh, making a stop at any of these jetties after renovation so that larger number of people can benefit instead of uh, reaching only Kakanad and nothing in between? It's like a fast, pa uh, super fast express from Kotam to Thiruvandhuram without stopping anywhere in between. Because the jetty already exists means it was of some use to people at some time, definitely. I don't know whether the drought conditions, etc. is what is preventing it from better utilization. I just would like to just, just know. Uh, uh, actually, uh, in our uh, initial plan, there is one jetty in between, Erur. 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 Uh, there was uh, state water transport was operating in that route for uh, uh, some time means uh, almost an year they were operating uh, they were running into losses maybe that's why when covid came they stopped that uh, service uh, but uh, for the present uh, project there is one jetty in between and it is possible that uh, in future expansion it is possible that more jetties can join uh, that route also Sir, actually, how do you meet this much power requirement in uh, Water Metro? Uh, do you have any capture power plant you are on or you are depending on the state grid only? Uh, uh, power requirement in the sense of you, you, you mean to say that uh, power requirement for the boats or? Yeah, boat. Yes. Boat, uh, that, uh, you, and you, you mentioned uh, it's uh, um, a figure was there, 1.5 megawatt uh, that is required for a 12 hour journey. And uh, you are going for this opportunity yeah, charging yeah. only for that, this? That calculation was actually based on our initial calculation. Suppose a, a boat is taking, because that calculation was based on the existing uh, boats. Those boats were having uh, high power consumption. So based on that only that was projected. Uh, in our case, actually, we went for an air-conditioned boat. The hotel loads are also uh, something to be uh, counted. So when when the system is operating continuously for so so long, because sixteen hour uh, whole whole day operation, sixteen hour operation, if we consider, then you have to multiply with uh, that that kind of uh, numbers. If if it is a eighty kilowatt, and for a ten hour operation, it comes straight away comes eight hundred kilowatt. So in our case, actually, it is coming around fifty five kilowatt per day, including uh, that air conditioning and. So naturally, 10 hour means 550. 
and uh, battery you cannot extract uh, the whole power because battery life is uh, uh, extended when when uh, uh, with with your band coming down uh, battery life is extended so you have to have a balance so the best uh, operation even in your mobile and all uh, we have to operate it between say uh, 20 to 80 percent that is the best range where you can so that means only 60 percent of uh, total energy available capacity available will be utilized every time so your battery has to be uh, that uh, that also you have to take it to account when when you arrive on the battery capacity so this much energy are you taking from the state grid only or you have a now, now we are uh, we are going to have uh, uh, solar on top of all our uh, terminals but uh, that is only uh, very uh, very meager part of uh, total requirement we have put up with the government for land uh, somewhere in rp uh, for establishing a solar farm for our so our target is 100 percent from renewables right now you are taking it from state grid Uh, sir, you, uh, I, I understand that there are a lot of naval architects, uh, uh, at least few naval architects in key positions in KMRL. Um, so I want to know about the design of the boat itself. Uh, what uh, was it an in-house design by KMRL or uh, what was the design input from, uh, was it an indigenous design and uh, how did you decide on the, uh, the, the efficient hull form? Uh, see uh, the basic parameters uh, that kind of analysis we we have done our in house so we had an outline specification which was uh, very much uh, elaborative then uh, the basic design was actually uh, done by shipyard then the optimization was done by marine so our inputs was uh, basically into determining the size, type, material, uh, that kind of almost everything we have we have put it on our outline, outline specification. Outline specification was very much elaborating, you can say. Okay, thank you. Uh, the second question is uh, uh, the the battery and, uh, and of course there was a lot of input from uh, question uh, uh, yeah. Chief Technology Sir was a committee member. <laughs> Versus also a committee member. <laughs> uh, the, the second question was uh, regarding the battery. So you already touched upon this uh, point in your presentation that you you foresee uh, improvement in battery technology and you have catered for that in the charging uh, points. Uh, but uh, like the Moore's law for uh, uh, computing technology it's it's according to the Moore's law computing technology doubles every two years so although that wouldn't apply for ev vehicle battery performance but what we actually see is that uh, the batteries uh, uh, like breakthrough technologies are coming for ev batteries so how prepared is your system to accept a, a, a if if you if, if there is an introduction of a reliable technology with uh, much better performance which is very likely considering the amount of people who are now using EV vehicles. How how prepared and ready will be KMRL to adopt that new technology? Uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, our our present, uh, that battery has a life of uh, 10 years. So naturally, in 10 years, we are not going to change it. But definitely, when the time comes for a change, it is adaptable. It is adaptable. We, we keep uh, uh, hearing about a lot of uh, uh, breakthrough, this thing, that thing and all, but actually how much is happening, uh, I'm doubtful. Because you you hear about uh, uh, air batteries, uh, this thing, that thing and all, but nothing is, is from 77, we, uh, the, these kind of news has started coming out. But uh, so far, it has not gone into industrial production. We can use uh, some batteries which is uh, actually under uh, uh, commercial production uh, because that kind of uh, safety, safety is much more critical than any other thing. Because uh, uh, in a EV vehicle, 
even if there is an accident or a fire, there is no issue. But one fire or any incident in a uh, EV boat, uh, we can say electric vessel, EV, same, same uh, the thing we can give, maybe EV. If one accident, because see, road accidents in, in Kerala, around 4,400 people die every year in all the roads. But one person dies in water transport, it is a big news. In in road transport, 4,400 people dies, but no news. So that kind of attention, uh, water transport has got. So we have to be very careful about the safety of the boat, the safety of the batteries. So that is very important aspect. So when uh, when some technology matures, then only we can go for that. Not a yeah, water metro has won a lot of awards nationally and internationally. Congratulate from Lip Tech. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This is world. So I, we have been the you have got personally and collected award from I think Nidin Gadkari. No, from no, where recently you went uh, and, and to Delhi and collected an hour. You are my, yeah. You are my. Okay, congratulations. Thank you, sir. Hi, sir. Sir, you were talking about uh, green initiatives. You were talking about uh, how to reduce uh, carbon footprint, uh, emission of carbon dioxide. So I'd like to ask uh, uh, if, uh, as a young researcher, I'd like to add, is there any input that we can give? Is it accessible? The data are, if the data are accessible for us to uh, give an input uh, to KMRL. So uh, is there any access for young researchers for the data of KMRL? Uh, definitely we can, uh, we can help. There is uh, that we can share, no issue. Thank you, sir. The ship technology, QSAT is, uh, uh, we consider it as a part of water metal <laughs> because so much of interaction has happened. So uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, I'm Himanshu from IRS, Indian Register of Shipping. Uh, I would like to ask you uh, on how you are maintaining the uh, battery life because it's uh, susceptible to temperature variation and all those things. So do you, do you feel that uh, uh, during daytime it discharges more or in the night time, how, how it is maintained? Uh, could you give some light on that? Uh, the battery compartment is air conditioned. We are keeping a temperature of around uh, 22 degrees centigrade. So that is to extend the light. Actually, these LTO batteries, they can operate uh, in uh, uh, around 25 degrees. It's okay. And even it can uh, operate up to, uh, say, 50 degrees centigrade. There is no issue. Uh, it is safe, still safe. Uh, but to extend the life, uh, we are keeping it at around. Uh, that is that is also, a uh, uh, when we are talking about the power, this is also a part of uh, that power consumption. And then uh, there is up to cell level monitoring uh, in the bo boat. If a particular module has uh, some uh, thermal overhead, then uh, that is getting isolated immediately. Yeah, because that is the major reason for right. why fire or right, accidents right. happen. Right. Right, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, these boats were 7.6 crores. Oh, Lifetime. lifetime of the boat. Yeah, lifetime of the boat. Uh, uh, we went for aluminum hull. So we hope uh, 25 years is a normal uh, life period. Uh, I I think uh, uh, if you go by experience, was, there is a Lakshadweep Development Corporation. They had uh, uh, two aluminum hull boats uh, operating in similar uh, waters in uh, Lakshadweep and here. It used to come to uh, Kori Kod. Those boats very recently, it was in 1990, it was constructed. And uh, uh, I think very recently, it was scrapped. 
But uh, of course, of course, battery. I think uh, uh, we are expecting only ten year life for the battery. Then we have to renew the battery. So how do you maintain it? Actually, maintenance part. Is there yeah. any maintenance required for the? Uh, of course, that is a challenge actually because when you are going for a new technology, uh, new kind of things, then uh, 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 that capacity building is a challenge. Even uh, the operation of the boards. Uh, it's not all easy because uh, the the workforce what is available in the market uh, they are used to normal kind of boards where uh, you give a uh, uh, the same from the bridge and then yeah <laughs> the engine driver gives uh, that uh, oh, when 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 they are converting to this kind of uh, system uh, definitely it is uh, slightly challenging for that. But one good thing what we observed in the new generation, maybe uh, maybe the kind of usage of mobiles and other things that has made people so much of uh, technology friendly that uh, people can very well absorb uh, kind of things very fast. Thank you. Okay. So again, it's not technology or in it question, but uh, when you, this may, I don't know whether it is within the purview of uh, Water Metro Authority, when you get out of or get into the Cochin International Airport, you get a feeling that you are on an out of the world place you are reaching. And it is true also. I think in Vaitla, I think the approach roads are absolutely, I mean, beyond description. It, you know, there is, you feel that in Malayalam we say Sorgadilikala Vadili and that roads are absolutely unmotorable. I think we have to pay attention to the front approach part of the water metro, I suppose. I think the state government, as such, is lax on all these things you should be able to influence to so add to it. Right. I agree that. Uh, actually, yesterday there was a uh, delegation from Germany. So when they came, they were talking about one thing. Actually, in uh, the problem with India is that uh, there are uh, many, many agencies involved in a single system. In transport, if you take transport system, say, for example, if you take Vaitila Mobility Hub, White Law Mobility Hub is born by a society. Uh, they don't allow uh, others uh, do anything. Then uh, Metro, Water Metro, then uh, KSRTC also going to build over there. Uh, private buses, each private bus is a separate entity. Then, uh, uh, then uh, jokingly they were telling integrating uh, the different agencies is more difficult than integrating the whole system. <laughs> the challenge is actually... Uh, uh, that kind of uh, see uh, that is uh, maybe uh, uh, something we have to overcome uh, over that time. We have already proposed that uh, uh, there should be a, uh, a connectivity between metro and water metro with uh, uh, definitely a roof, uh, roof and. Uh, Thank you, sir, for the insightful talk. It was truly inspiring. Now, I invite Dr. Sadish Babu PK, head of the department, to present a memento to Mr. Sergeant P. John as a token of our gratitude. Mr. Sergeant P. John and Dr. Hasina K. are esteemed experts in the field and the wealth of knowledge and experiences promises to make this session a truly enriching experience for all of us. Now, let's start this paper presentations.
we have a total of four presentations. To the attention of participants and chairs, the total time allotted for each presentation is 12 minutes, followed by three minute Q&A session. We will ring a buzzer after 12 minutes to end the, end, to end the presentation. We will distribute the participation certificate at the end of the session. So let's move on to the first paper of the session, which is on the topic, a numerical methodology for early stage estimation of full scale resistance of base cruise boats in shallow water. Presented by Lieutenant Commander R. Kiran from IIT Gorakhpur. The co-authors of the paper are Dr. Sadish Babu PK and Sony TL. Moving on to command, Lieutenant Commander R. Kiran. Good afternoon. Uh, before I start, I would just like to uh, check if my voice and the presentation both are uh, working. Yeah, it's working. Uh, you are audible. Please continue. I'll just uh, quickly go through the slides just to see if it is crawling. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, so is the slide moving ahead? Uh, yeah, now it's uh, yeah moving. It's moving. Please continue. Okay. Um, respected chief guests, session chairs, dignitaries from the maritime industry, delegates and speakers of ICANO, head of the department, faculty, staff and students of the Department of Ship Technology, a warm good afternoon to all of you. I am Lieutenant Commander Kiran Ramesh and I am here to present a paper I had co-authored with HOD sir and Ship Tech Industrial Consultancy which is a startup incubator under QSAT. This was as part of my postgraduate curriculum at IIT Kharagpur. The topic of my presentation is as flashed on the screen. I will be covering the presentation under the following heads, starting with the objective or motivation behind the work. Houseboats. Houseboats are one of the main tourist attractions of Kerala. Trending amongst these today are those offering daytime tourism of these backwaters called day cruise boats or traditionally as shikaras. These are smaller than traditional houseboats though with a similar hull form. Hulls for these boats are designed primarily based on boat builders experience and they often need an optimization with respect to their hull forms to cater for various requirements including propulsion. Nowadays with an impetus on low carbon footprint in the maritime industry, Many of these agencies and companies are trying to switch to more carbon efficient means of propulsion like electric propulsion. With these points in mind, and also considering the fact that these boats fly in waters of shallow depths of around two to seven meters on an average, there's a requirement to assess or predict the powering requirements for these hull forms in the early design stages itself. This forms the motivation or objective for the analysis undertaken using CFD. Now, unlike traditional ships, houseboats do not undergo any model testing before they are built. However, the application and precision of CFD based studies for full scale simulation of ships have grown in recent years, and they provide good alternatives as predictive methodologies. Here, the shallow water resistance is compared with empirical methods and further analysis have been undertaken with respect to channel depth and width from a research point of view. Before I start, I would briefly speak about the theory of resistance in shallow and confined waters. A water that is restricted in depth is called shallow water. When there is restriction in width, it is called restricted. And when it is restricted both in depth and width, it is called as confined waters. When a ship moves in confined waters, the flow has less cross-sectional area, which leads it to speed up and therefore reducing pressure, causing the boat or ship to trim and sink, a combined effect called as squat. Presently, I have studied only the second effect, which is the increase in resistance. This also has two components. First, an increase in viscous component due to, again, an increased flow velocity and wetted surface area due to sinkage. And 
an increase in the wave resistance due to a change in wave pattern from the traditional Kelvin wave pattern. The main parameter that decides the uh, change in wave pattern is the depth fruit number or V by root G H, where H is the depth of the water. And accordingly, different speed regimes are defined as subcritical, critical, and supercritical. The plots shown here are quite familiar to all naval architects from our resistance classes. The empirical methodologies formulated by Schlichting and Land Weber have been used to compare the CFD results in the absence of any experimental data. It is submitted that all calculations are undertaken in the subcritical regime where the depth food number is less than one. Coming to the numerical analysis, the first step is the generation of geometry. A model houseboat of the given dimensions was used, modeled in Rhino 3D, and then the domain was developed as per ITTC recommendations for ship CFD studies in the commercial CFD uh, tool uh, ANSYS. A symmetry plane was cut at the center plane so as to uh, reduce the size of the computational domain and thus save computational efforts. To simulate shallow water, the domain was extended to a depth of two meters in the bottom. Later versions of ANSYS Fluent, I have used Fluent uh, 2020, they have an inbuilt meshing called as Fluent Meshing, which produces high quality poly hex core meshes with minimum user inputs and a very streamlined workflow. Mesh refinements have further been undertaken as two bodies of influence, one around the boat and one near the free surface. Boundary layers have been specified on the boat surface and also at the bottom to accurately model the flow dynamics. Mesh quality metrics have been checked with respect to skewness, aspect ratio, and orthogonality as specified in the ANSYS guidelines. These are the boundary conditions which I have used. I have used pressure inlet and pressure outlet both, but a flow velocity has been also included at the inlet. Open channel wave boundary conditions have been used both at the inlet and outlet to model the wave propagation that happens at the interface. Walls have been specified both on the boat and at the bottom, and the rest of the faces have been defined as symmetry boundary conditions. Coming to the physics or the solver methodology, the first step is to set up the case as a transient multi-phase analysis. This is done using the volume of fluid module of ANSYS. Now we are required to define the phases, that is air and water in this case, the extent of these phases and their volume fractions. Next, we choose the turbulence model. Here I have chosen the viscous K omega SST model and the pressure implicit splitting of operators or the PISO scheme for pressure velocity coupling. Also, second order schemes have been used for both spatial and temporal discretization to improve the accuracy. The final step, is the initialization. Here I have used the smart initialization or hybrid initialization option of ANSYS and a time step of 0 0.0001 second has been used to ensure stability of the simulations. Before moving on to the results, I would just like to briefly speak on the boundary layer on the boat. It is based on the famous law of the wall so here I have used enhanced wall function approach with the target Y plus kept greater than 30 because it's a full scale simulation. And this has been found to provide reasonably accurate results, but providing significant computational savings. For my simulations, the approximate time taken and the computational effort used are flashed on the screen for each simulation. Coming to the results I have obtained and further discussions on them. The first step for uh, any CFD simulation is to have a benchmark or any other result with which we can compare our results. So for this, the model was taken in MaxServe resistance module and then the deep water curve was obtained using the Haltrop and Menon method. Based on Schlichting's methodology, this curve was further modified to obtain the shallow water resistance curve which is the empirical curve based on which all the CFD results have been compared with. 
Now, the shallow water resistance at the design speed of 7 knots has been used as part of my grid refinement study. The grid was refined in four stages and this was based on the methodology of target Y plus gradually reduced from 150 to 40. Grid number 3 or fine 1 with nearly 2 million cells was finalized for the study. Once the grid was finalized, a numerical shallow water curve was obtained by running the simulations over a range of speeds and it has been found that there is reasonably good agreement with the empirical curve. Next step was to obtain a numerical deep water curve in a similar fashion. Here, the domain was extended from 2 meters to one time the length of the boat in the bottom. Then the speeds were varied and similar plot was obtained and this was compared with the Holtrop and Menon curve. Further studies was undertaken to uh, by changing the domain depth gradually from one time length to one meter. This shows the variation of depth through number from subcritical to supercritical regime. It was observed that there is an increase in resistance of around 36% with respect to the deep water conditions while approaching the critical speed and crossing over it to the supercritical regime. As part of post-processing, the wave patterns in critical and supercritical regimes were also plotted and they were found to match the theoretical predictions. As a final study, at the same shallow water depth of 2 meters, the half width of the domain was reduced from one time length to 2 meter gradually. This was used to compare, uh, to study the effect of confinement of the channel and the results were compared with Land Weber's chart. And this also uh, gives reasonably good agreement with the empirical data. It also shows that there is a total shallow water increase, uh, resistance increase of up to 32.59% when the uh, confinement of the channel becomes very obvious and in, uh, reduces to just 2 meter half width of domain. Based on these results, a few concluding remarks. First, the CFD methodology developed was found to be fairly accurate for full-scale shallow water resistance predictions. However, it is worth submitting that there is a lack of experimental data or trials data for validation and only comparison has been made with empirical uh, formulations. As mentioned earlier, a near wall treatment with wall Y plus close, close to one would give more accurate results, but these would require significant computational costs. Also, the meshing which forms the most important step in CFD analysis is quite iterative and takes a lot of time to obtain a fairly good mesh and with changes in domain uh, sizes like depth and width, the meshing will also have to be uh, uh, changed accordingly so as to obtain similarly accurate results in all cases with different boundary conditions. Further scope of study with respect to these houseboat hulls include next step towards uh, powering calculation, which is the open water characteristics of the selected propeller. Once this and the resistance data are available, we can go ahead with self-propulsion simulations for obtaining final propulsive parameters and then obtaining an estimate of the powering required. Here, we have not studied any of the motions of the boat. So to study sinkage and trim or squat, the dynamic fluid body interaction simulations can be undertaken as the next step. Finally, since many boats ply in these channels, effect of interactions with other boats in narrow channels can also be studied. These are few of the references I have used. Thank you. Any questions for the audience?
um, what was the Reynolds number for the flow? And the second question is whether you had a look at a longitudinal section to see what happens because of the bottom. Uh, so the uh, Reynolds number of the flow, uh, exactly, uh, it, it was in the turbulent region. That's all I remember. The exact value I have not uh, noted down, but uh, it was in, a full, in the fully turbulent region. So, and uh, regarding longitudinal sections, uh, if you could please repeat your question, I, I uh, failed to. Uh... Uh, if you had shown a longitudinal section. Yes, sir. Velocity and pressure maps. Then we can see how the bottom is interacting with the vessel. Okay. Uh, these plots I have not uh, plotted as part of my uh, post processing, sir, but uh, I'll take it into consideration and just check how uh, the uh, interaction with the bottom is taking place. Uh, you studied is shown a depth of two meter. Yes, sir. Uh, but uh, I I would see a problem because uh, depth available in, uh, most of inland waters here is actually less than two meter. So uh, how how we will uh, uh, how how helpful will be in that case? Uh, is... Sir, as mentioned earlier, I have even studied. Uh, to depth still one meter. So uh, this uh, two meter depth was just based on inputs that were received from the consultancy firm uh, in collaboration with whom I had done this uh, work. So they had told that an average depth of these backwaters would be around 1.5 to two meters. So that's how I just did for the research purpose. And for the study purpose, I just used two meters, but uh, the domain depth can be varied uh, even lesser. And uh, for uh, Two meter depth, the critical speed was somewhere greater than just greater than seven knots, around seven point five knots. So when the depth even comes down further, it uh, it would be required to uh, move at even slower speeds. But the design speed of these boats, as was informed to me, was seven knots. So roughly to uh, cater for the subcritical regime, I had uh, taken this uh, depth of two meters for my study. Kiran, actually this uh, figures and data everything is based on a simulation study only. Then uh, how can you can you add something to the uh, modeling of the system? Because for me, this is a system only, uh, whatever it be a ship or a houseboat, uh, this is a system only for the study purpose. Right. And can you add something on this uh, modeling of the system? Uh... Um, exactly with respect to uh, modeling of the system, I what I understood is that uh, you can use the same philosophy of the physics and the uh, meshing uh, for any different uh, configuration. It need not be a houseboat. It can be any other uh, ship uh, system also. But the setup would be quite similar. The physics setup would be quite similar like... Uh, any symmetric boat, you can cut the domain in half. And for deep water simulations, you just need to the domain to be extended uh, at the bottom also to the extent of one length, one times the length or more. And uh, the physics per se, since there is a interplay between the momentum and continuity equations, we just need to uh, model the correct uh, pressure velocity coupling. And uh, as per uh, um, many research papers, the K omega SST turbulence model has been found to be one of the best models for resistance uh, simulation. So that's why I have used that model. Uh, anything in particular, ma'am, that you would like to uh, know with regard to the physics and the modeling of this uh, simulations? No, no, it's enough. Okay. Thank you. Suppose you got another consultancy job. Would yes. you do using CFD or the empirical results? Uh, empirical results, I would say, are just a, a rough estimate, sir, because uh, there is no uh, real hull form data that is available in empirical. It's just 
broad parameters on which it is based on. So a CFD study is obviously much better than empirical data, but I needed some benchmark to compare it to just to know whether the model I was setting up was correct or not. So this was the only data available with which I could compare it. So that's why I compared it with the uh, empirical data. But of course, a model testing is the uh, best uh, validation uh, criteria available for CFD simulations. Did you do it full scale or? Uh, at it model? was done at full scale, sir. So it's very hard to do an experiment at full scale. Correct, sir. So is there some other way that you can say my CFD results are correct? without access to any empirical results or experimental results? Uh, correctness uh, in the sensor, we can actually uh, see the trend of the plots and uh, estimate whether the trend is matching or not, but accuracy of the results would require it to be uh, maybe uh, comparison with peer literature or uh, comparison with similar studies done or uh, if model tests have been undertaken, then model testing is the best way to com uh, compare the accuracy of the results. Okay, then uh, let's conclude this presentation here. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Let's move on to the next presentation. Next paper is on the topic reverse sea shipping for inland container transportation between Kuchi port and the inlands of northern, northern Kerala, presented by Srimadhi Tina Sara John from Kusat. The co author of the paper is Dr. C.B. Sudhir. Over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tina, and I'll be now presenting the salient features of a study conducted by me under the supervision of Dr. C.B. Sudhir, which has resulted in the development of a mathematical model uh, for assessing the suitability of using a river sea shipping corridor for inland container transportation from Cochin port to the hinterlands of northern Kerala. Let me start by introducing the term river sea shipping. River, the term river sea shipping is used uh, when the shipping route uh, can, uh, includes both a river link and a sea link. Uh, and um, though navigation through a river and a sea both have many common features, yet there are many differences with respect to the navigation navigability requirements between the two. So based on these, there are Currently, there are three types of river sea shipping transport technologies that are currently in use. The first is the type which uses the sea going vessel in the sea segment and the river going vessel in the river segment. In this case, there will be a cargo transshipment uh, uh, between the uh, sea vessel and the river vessel. The second case is the one in which the river sea vessel is used for tra tra traversing both the sea uh, segment and the river segment. And the third case and the third case is a river sea push barge system where a barge system that carries the cargo is connected to a is powered by a push boat. So in the sea segment, it will be powered by a sea push boat and in the river segment it will be powered. So these are the three types of river sea uh, transport technologies that are currently in use and all the three technologies are used in different cases based on the um, uh, suitability for that geography. So in this study we have considered the first type that is the one in which a sea going vessel is used in the sea segment and a river vessel is river vessels are used for the river segment. Uh, okay now let me start by introducing uh, this um, Okay, 
in the in the context of this study so in this study a model was developed uh, which is tested for a case uh, in which a sea going vessel is used between cochin port and beipur port and uh, river vessels are used for uh, and river vessels are used for inland uh, areas as feeder services along the river routes let me elaborate the background on which the study is based uh, around 3000 containers are imported through cochin port every month that are meant for uh, final utilization at in the regions in the in the malabar region that is northern kerala so all these uh, containers that are imported through cochin port move towards this region currently uh, through the roadways uh, by container trucks so recently uh, in july 2021 the government had introduced july 2021 the government had introduced a coastal shipping service between cochin port and beipur port and uh, the de details of the service are like this uh, uh, there was one vessel which operated twice a week and it had a carrying capacity of 106 tus however this uh, this service stopped after 8 months of service uh, by february 2022 the main reason was that though the containers were loaded from cochin port and they reached beipur when it came back it didn't have enough of return cargo so the return cargo is uh, actually the return cargo there is a potential to tap the main the main type of return cargo that we can tap is the export cargo the export cargo there are many export producing centers uh, in this region the northern malabar region uh, which uh, which uh, which export through the cochin port so such cargo can be attracted but uh, in uh, during this period of operation uh, they couldn't do that so through this model we are proposing a river extension from beipur port so that uh, the uh, from beipur port if feeder services go in further into the hinterlands uh, it will be a better we are testing that through the model we are trying to see whether it can be an optimal route the river route so this is the uh, the problem is described like this so uh, that uh, blue color is the river link that is formed by the river chaliar river chaliar and uh, we have uh, identified two uh, inland ports at mukkam and at edavana uh, these are uh, yeah uh, so these two inland ports that we have identified are uh, very well connected with the major highways that come from vayanad kolkata and malappuram so the these are the three districts that we have considered because of the accessibility towards this uh, river river route so uh, the first step was in identifying the origin nodes origin nodes are the nodes where the exports uh, ex export producing centers are there so uh, there are a lot of places that produce a lot of export commodities we have analyzed the data from the customs department what are the types of uh, commodities so what we have done is that we have assumed that uh, the uh, all the export commodities get, will get aggregated in a major town so uh, in the first step for identifying the origin nodes we have uh, taken the major towns mainly the municipalities and the corporations uh, 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 from these three districts so these are the uh, origin nodes there are 23 origin nodes the next is route description uh this uh, the routes shown in white are the major highways formed by the national highways and the state highways of uh, the three districts and the uh, proposed uh, inland waterway river route is the blue one then model formulation first we have uh, formulated a cost matrix so the 23 origin nodes for each of the 23 origin nodes there are two alternative routes the first route is the uh, route that is currently existing that is the route through the roadways how these 23 origin nodes can be uh, accessed can access beipur port 
uh, in the uh, road by roadways an alternative route 2 is the route for uh, uh, through which each origin node can access Baipur port uh, through the proposed waterway link that is up to the inland port they have to come by roadway and from the inland ports they can uh, uh, move through the waterway so that is alternative 2 so uh, and uh, c11 one, one is okay uh, uh, the this is the cost matrix so the cost in transporting freight from origin node 1 uh, through route 1 is c11 and uh, the cost of transporting freight from origin node 1 through alternative route 2 is c21 so that's how this cost matrix is formed then the algorithm uses uh, an assignment problem and this is the uh, it's a minimization problem by minimizing uh, cij xij where cij is the cost and xij is uh, like this it is if the root is assigned to the origin node it becomes one and if it's not it is zero so uh, the uh, the numerical simulation was performed using the programming language visual basic and uh, for that cij values were taken from a report released by the niti aayog of government of india in they have uh, calculated the cost for each mode of transport the cost of transporting freight in rupees per ton kilometer for each mode of uh, transport so uh, we have road links and waterway links so we took 3.6 rupees per ton kilometer for the road links and 2 uh, rupees per ton kilometer for the waterway links and, and then the program was run and uh, these are the results we obtained for all uh, route number one and route number two cij xij and uh, the uh, required values are calculated for origin nodes one to five six to ten eleven to fifteen and uh, sixteen to twenty and twenty one to twenty three for all the origin nodes and the results were obtained uh, and the Fine, total cost, optimal cost, that is all from all the optimal routes, the optimal cost was calculated like this. That is rupees 3,800 rupees for transporting per ton of freight. So the results are like this. Uh, from the uh, numerical results, there are seven nodes, node number 4, 7, 11, 14, 20, 19, 21, and 22 that have optimal routes along the alternative route number 2. That is the route which uses the inland waterway, the, that proposed river segment. And this is the pictorial representation of the results. Uh, these are the these are the seven routes. These are the seven nodes that are found optimal to use the inland waterway route. So coming on to the conclusions, uh, the export cargo generated from the whole from this uh, figure, we can see that the all the uh, export that comes from Vienna district can be uh, routed through this. Then few of these from 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 Kolkata and Malabar can, uh, from Malapuram can also be routed through this route uh, through the inland waterway route. So export cargo generated from the whole of Vienna and certain regions of Kolkata and Malapuram districts could be diverted towards the feeder services for further shipment by coastal shipping from Beipur to Cochin port. Uh, and uh, for bringing about that, we, a targeted approach could be used for attracting the exported cargo from the industries located in these seven origin nodes. These are the references I have used. Thank you. How much part of this river is navigable now? You had an analysis? Uh, yeah, uh, actually, uh, the stretch that I have taken that is up to Mukkam and up to Edamana are navigable currently. Uh, this uh, local, uh, many of the boats, uh, house boats, such services. Uh, some boats, people go for some leisure trips and all people go up to this region. After that, it becomes a little bit hilly and then it is a little shallow. So just for a curiosity, how you select these uh, elements in your course matrix? 
actually you yeah. select the cost of the travel only or do you consider any other factors there in that uh, elements yeah uh, the cost is it is a cost metric so cost is the cost of transporting freight from uh, each or, uh, origins so uh, currently the cost value i have taken from the report of niti ayog i have not done any uh, any other analysis i have directly taken the cost from the report but this cost is cost of transporting freight that's all so which is the optimization techniques that uh, you have used here it is assignment problem of, yeah. okay any questions from in your study will you be considering the size of the vessel or boat maybe uh, in yeah maybe in future yeah, yeah, yeah. will you be doing yeah because you are transporting yeah. some all to a feeder point yeah, and yeah 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 we will be considering size uh, that's why uh, initially because of the size restrictions only we have opted for the feeder services otherwise a river sea vessel can actually go in uh, has to go but because of the size restrictions we have currently taken uh, river vessels uh, actual analysis will be done further into my studies no, not the vessel design but size yeah, so many size, tons yeah yeah so many tons yes, or yes. some barges or something like that yes yes how many uh, tus of container cargo can be loaded that will be considering thanks yes, thanks Uh, whether you have uh, considered the presence of RCBs. Presence uh, of? RCBs, uh, this, uh, not RCB, our uh, uh, reservoir come bridge, yeah, yeah, RCB. Reservoir come bridge, some. Reservoir. Uh, come bridge, uh, reservoir come bridge. Okay. Uh. Uh, that, that at uh, Urkadav in Chaliar okay. and uh, Odaikal in Chaliar. So these are two huge uh, RCBs constructed by irrigation department. Okay, okay. So whether that will prevent the continuity of this inland waterway? Yeah, yeah. That we have to. Uh, I've not done details check. I've just seen. Uh, I've just checked whether uh, navigation is happening up to the stretches. Actually, Chaliar is uh, flowing from uh, the hills, western Ghats in Vayanad and all. I've taken only the lower stretch so that the the navigability is quite okay from. Uh, uh my uh, understanding further uh, checks have to be done and uh, this is just an analysis from uh, from our uh, this type of a study and further whether its navigability has to be included and all can be done uh, later i think this is just for understanding whether we can route export commodity along this uh, so that uh, model shift from roadways to coastal shipping can be improved and we can make it practical in the future. So almost one, the point is that one is all, almost in the downstream. Oh, okay. This yeah, uh, yeah. over regulator yeah. bridge is almost when yeah. some 20, then only 20 kilometers to Arabian Sea. Okay, okay. The other one is in the other regulator cum bridge is yeah. almost in the Nelambur side. Okay. So but, these, uh, the small boats can go, I think maybe, you know, they'll, understand. yeah, yeah, have yeah, that, that all. yeah. Because of the, uh, such uh, such such reservoir bridges and all are there, that's why we have chosen for small feeder services. So that uh, the just like we use uh, in our NW three, we have small shallow two meter depth. We use small vessels. So such vessels only we have considered for this also, like a feeder service. A question may be patently absurd. Uh, it is not directly linked to your study, but is a derivative of your study. May be answered by both you and Mr. John in the sense this I, after the boat ride in Water Metro, I was wondering uh, there was a time till recently where we were complaining about the waste of the city being transported from Cochin city, different parts of the city to Brahmapuram on road using lorries, which, which are, most of them were, I would say, completely polluting the, the route from Cochin to Brahmapuram. 
I was wondering why people had not, not thought about transporting the waste in containers on the waterway between Paitla to Brahmapuram. Because that, that, that river reaches, I am not pretty sure, but reaches almost very near to Brahmapuram on the Kadambrayar or somewhere. The, it will help in reducing the cost as well as reducing the carbon footprint of the city. When I saw your, that uh, diagram from Beipur to the inland birds, that idea seemed to be still uh, valid. If anybody has done any studies, it may be worth doing studies. It has got double effect of reducing the carbon footprint as well as making sure that it is transported safely along the waterways. Yeah. What do you think about it, sir? Your, your point also. Actually, initially when we were starting our research, we were thinking of uh, doing like uh, different types of uh, commodities and also such, as you said, uh, anything, any type of uh, fray, uh, yeah, in but because uh, it, the problem was becoming very huge and also we have restricted it to import export like that that's why we have taken it like this uh, we are thinking about like that uh, but uh, actually my guide so these was telling about all these small, all types of freight also we have to consider so uh, i think what sir said is relevant because waterway route is not uh, is a little bit remote and it does not uh, the it uh, the uh, emissions and all from this uh, waste and all does not affect the population so that's uh, uh, i don't know i think it's <laughs> uh, uh, gcda now they are planning to collect all waste in the marine drive in a container maybe this is a <laughs> good proposal i think Uh, I have another question. Uh, when you are considering container transport, yeah. this uh, uh, empty containers, yeah. uh, that is a concern. Have you taken into account? Yeah, actually this... Uh, empty containers movement. This, uh, this one, sir, this um, uh, vessel that was operated by the government in last year, that had a carrying capacity of 106 TEUs, in that all of the 106 is not uh, full loaded containers. Only 50 to 60 are loaded. The remaining are empty. So uh, for import, whatever empty comes, two-way empty will come. So that will definitely, uh, the design is like that. That's how I understood. Uh, see, uh, see, when you're considering that uh, con empty container versus uh, loaded container, Actually, it may not be the same place from where it is uh, coming because uh, somebody is importing, yeah. he is taking it to his place yes. when uh, somebody else is exporting. Yes. So between that uh, that kind of connectivity where uh, you yeah. are ensuring this. Uh, that kind of connectivity I have not considered in this specific, but I have um, I've made some understanding on that. Uh, there are some, uh, I don't know about... Uh, Bepur and all, but for Cochin region, there are container freight stations and uh, ICDs and all. They have this mechanism of uh, uh, container collection. That is the nodal point to which it happens. Thank you, Tina. Let's conclude this uh, presentation with this and let's move on to the next one. Next paper is on the topic automated river, automated river information services system for traffic control in the inland waterways of Kerala, presented by Mr. James K.J. from Kusat. Uh, the co-authors of the paper are Mr. Vikas Vishnoi, Dr. Sadish Babu P.K. and Dr. K. Prasad. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. So, this uh, presentation is on uh, automated river information services system for traffic control in the inland waterways of Kerala. In fact, uh, this supplements what uh, 
Mr. Sajin has stated. Kerala is bestowed with a, this is the next one. Kerala has a large network of uh, rivers, lakes, and backwaters, as he said, 1,760 kilometers of uh, motorable, I'm mean, sorry, yeah, navigable waterways with the motor boats is there. Till 1900s, I mean, till uh, 1,000, I mean, 1900s, 90% uh, of our cargo was transported by waterways. Even till 1980s, there were regular services of uh, what he showed, Ketwalams, from here to Changanashiri and to other places. In fact, a friend of mine, he used to come and source uh, uh, goods from here in Cochin and then give orders and went back. Then uh, the next day morning, the things were there in Changanashiri through such Ketwalams. Such was the uh, level of operations. After that, because of the, this uh, automobile revolution, things changed. Being a faster mode, this uh, uh, whole cargo transport shifted to roadways. And now we have, in 1980, it's, it's, uh, there is the NATPAC uh, details. 1980, we had, uh, uh, one second, yeah. We had nearly, 2 lakh vehicles on the registered vehicles in Kerala. Now it is 14 million in 2020, another nearly 3 million added in uh, three, la last three years. That means nearly 16 to 17 million registered vehicles in Kerala itself. Kerala is such a small stretch with road uh, limitations and all these things and then uh, there's uh, so much of uh, Accidents occurring on 1st of uh, November, this this uh, November, uh, one article came in the newspapers in Manorama, I read. In, 20, in 2022, 43,000 road accidents occurred and 4,000 people died. You said the 400, it's, I, I've read it as 4,300 4, plus. And Kerala stands third in the number of accidents in the country after uh, MP and then Gujarat. So let me see whether it is Gujarat or something. Recently I read that. Anyway, so because of that, uh, in 1986, Indian Water Waterways Authority of India was formed. And then uh, our uh, Saver Arakal MP from Cochin was the first chairman. And five waterways were declared as uh, national waterways. And later in 2016, another uh, 106 waterways were also added to this list for administrative convenience, they say, for gaining uh, grants from some central government for uh, developmental activities. Now we have 111 uh, national waterways. Now the, our NW3 is in Kerala, the uh, Kottapuram Kollam stretch along with the Champakara Canal, Udiyamund Canal, the total length is uh, 2005 kilometers. Now Alapura Kottai Madhurambada Canal is also uh, declared as a national waterway, just national waterway number 9. National waterway 3 has, uh, in fact, altogether 13 terminals, uh, not 11, that's it. Uh, Yeah, it's uh, in, in Kottapuram, Alua, then Bolgati, Wellington Island, Kakanad, Marad, Vaikam, Tanirmukam, Alapura, Trikundapura, Kayangulam, Chavara, and Kollam. That means all together it's 13, not 11. That was said now. Now, Valarpada International Continental Transshipment uh, Terminal is connected to NW3 and NW9 via Bolgati and Wellington Island terminals. In 2017, an inaugural trip of a uh, bus from Kochi to Chavra in Kollam was uh, operated, but that later that was stopped. Inaugural, that was an inaugural, inaugural trip only. In 2019, a 240 ton barge operated from Kochi to Kottayam, uh, 85 kilometers carrying containers. In Kottayam, we have a Kottayam port, which has uh, all these uh, facilities for uh, customs and other things, and then transporting containers from Kottayam to Kochi via the waterways. 
but later that also was stopped because of some occupational problem i mean uh, administrative problems now even now cochin port at the kotayam port is operating only thing is that they stuff everything uh, do all customs and then transfer the containers by trucks to cochin yeah so the whole purpose is lost anyway regarding the advantage advantage of reliability i would uh, just mention it's energy efficient when i speak and move 150 kilometers by road 500 kilometers by rail and 4000 kilometers by inland water transport and it has got a single unit carrying capacity 1500 ton bars can carry equivalent of 15 rail wagon loads or uh, even 60 truck loads then regarding fuel efficiency one liter of fuel can move uh, 24 ton kilometers by road 84 ton kilometers by rail and 105 ton kilometers by inland water transport it's a uh, iwt is environment friendly because of low air and noise pollution no land acquisitions required then suitable for dangerous cargo movement and suitable for uh, over dimensional cargo then it's ca less capital density when i say low no land acquisition is required then it's uh, less least capital density when we compare uh, your water, water metro with the kochi metro the amount of money involved is incomparable here so that way it's a uh, least capital density and uh, uh, no land acquisition is required because uh, it's a god given channel you know oh sorry then uh, a comparison with other modes of transport i would say uh, for the network size inland waterways is small for rail it is large and for uh, roads it is uh, very large then commodity type you can have uh, dry bulk liquid bulk uh, containers and special bulk uh, shipments dangerous goods everything could be transferred transported through inland waterways then uh, in rail all except perishables but now even perishables are being transported by railways because you know our uh, fish stock from uh, orissa is being transported to cochin especially this uh, orissa kajmin is available i mean transported uh, via this uh, railroads also then uh, all could be transported through roads then in airlines you know all except perishables then regarding the ship and size it's large depending upon the waterway class and the ship configuration then uh, for rail it's a train loads and wagon loads then road it's uh, up to 28 tons then for airlines it is small then commercial speed it's a slow mode approximately 12 km per hour scheduled trains travel at a speed of average uh, 50 to 60 km per hour uh, maybe in the during the night travel it, they, that may be more then for road it's approximately 40 and for uh, airlines it is a owner delivery approximately 900 km per hour then punctuality just in time sporadic congestion problems only then uh, for uh, rails it is a uh, predominantly night traffic then for it is road it is a uh, guaranteed delivery then uh, airlines also it's owner delivered uh, guaranteed delivery then reg regarding reliability it's a uh, climate problems uh, high and low tide low water levels then for uh, rails it is a uh, meteorological problems uh, labor conflicts then for uh, road it uh, roads it is a uh, major congestion accidents labor conflicts then minor meteorological problems are regarding airlines you know. regarding safety inland waterways is the best it's high then for rails it's a medium and uh, for roads it's a major problem and for uh, airlines is limited then energy comes consumption also this is the lowest then uh, rail uh, has medium and then for uh, roads it's high airlines is very high you know. and regarding a emissions also lowest in the inland waterways then rail for rails it depends on the type of traction either it could be electric or diesel electric you know. then uh, for roads it is high for air it is uh, still higher I'm sorry the above to uh, table clearly uh, shows that iwt has the highest level of safety in comparison with other modes of transport then increased priori priorities are accorded to iwt by the government agencies now growing growing in awareness of public on the harmful effects of carbon emissions resulting from ever increasing number of vehicles on the roads inland waterways are likely to be used extensively for transport and accident rates are likely to then when uh, inland waterways are likely to be extensively used accident rates are likely to increase yeah. 
Suitable measures have to be developed uh, to reduce the number of accidents and provide safe and efficient transport in inland waterways. Uh, this uh, paper has tried to analyze the problems encountered in traffic by traffic managers and suggest remedies while uh, rerouting of cargo movement through the waterways and establishing regular services. Developed countries in Europe and USA have uh, developed uh, river information service systems for successful operation of vessels in their IWT systems. Now, and, uh, an automated river information service system for traffic control in the inland waterways of Kerala is proposed for the cargo and container movement from Kollam to Kottayam, sorry, Kottapuram along National Waterway 3. Then Regarding methodology, river transport is a, it's not a standard concept. It's a, it consists of one or more harmonized information and communication technology systems intended to process information about water transport. Then the various services and their functions are interlinked with the multiple users and information flow will be multi-level. And for this uh, um, uh, automated RIA systems is relevant here, wherein the human element is replaced by uh, computerized information service in a processing system. Then, RA systems uh, facilitate inland water transport organization and management through information exchange, transport operations such as trip schedules, uh, terminal and local operations plans can easily be optimized, providing advantages for the inland navigation and enabling it to be integrated into the logistics chain. Then, the sector specific control systems are designed for aviation and railways are there, for maritime also is there, but systems in the IWT are in the nascent stage really. The CCNR, the Central Commission for Navigation River Rhine, has uh, uh, developed such systems. In India, NW1 from Hooghly to Prayagraj has introduced the RIA system in 2016. In NW3, cargo movement is picking up. Tourist vessel, vessels in large numbers are also in operation. Therefore, proper control of the vessels will be required. Yeah. Sorry. Then uh, regarding the functional decomposition, it's a fairway information service, traffic information service, traffic management, transport management, calamity abatement, and information for uh, transport logistics are also provided here. Yeah. Then uh, details regarding the fairway information is what all the details are to be provided, geography, the navigation aids, the water depth, temporary obstructions, etc., state of the rivers. Then uh, restrictions caused by flood and ice and short-term changes, uh, all those details are there. Then, traffic information regarding tactical traffic information, uh, which are short term based, and strategic tra uh, traffic information, which are uh, medium and long term related. Then, traffic management, vessel, uh, vessel traffic services, local and navigational support. Then, uh, local and bridge operations, local and bridge planning. Then, uh, cal calamity abatement, if at all something happens, you know, what all should be done. Then, uh, information for transport logistics and the voyage planning. Then, uh, uh, transport management also has to be done. Then uh, intermodal port and terminal management, presentation of actual terminal for port status, port and terminal planning. Then uh, cargo and fleet management, information for law enforcement, then statistics and waterway charges. Then stakeholders are shipmaster, VTS operator, lock and bridge operator, waterway authorities, terminal operator, calamity center personnel, fleet manager, cargo shipper, and uh, in fact, it includes banker organizations as well as repair organizations. The input parameters uh, are uh, for this program. Input parameters are given are given by the inland, inland uh, navigation rules, uh, uh, 2010. Then chapter four and five of that specifies the stipulations regarding light sounds and prevention and collision of safety and other things. Then uh, input. Then uh, ch part one, ch chapter four, part one regards uh, lookout duties, you know, safe speed, risk of collision, action to avoid collision, etc. Then uh, part two is regarding sailing vessels, overtaking, head off, head on situation, crossing situations, responsibilities between vessels. Then uh, chapter four, in restricted visibility regarding lights, then uh, lights to be exhibited uh, for various items. Then uh, uh, distress signals, uh, uh, sound signals, distress signals. Along with these rules, uh, Clause regarding the applicability of provisions of port rules and national waterway regulations are also given. This clause is a special reference to vessels operating in Cochin Portress area. Then uh, safety measures also are provided. Then uh, the uh, architecture uh, has been uh, drafted uh, where you have the policy makers who dictate policies to the regional managers and they will define the requirements. The system engineers will integrate the systems and design systems 
and that will be given to this refer information service system. They will give, get data supplied by the users and service providers, and then uh, they will give information to the users. And then feedback will be given to the regional managers and then further to the policy managers so that uh, they can modify it and then come back to uh, this, uh, this one. And then finally, the whole system will operate this way. This is an architecture. Yeah. Then regarding conclusions and development of infrastructure along NW3 undertaken to improve the utilization of waterways for the transport of goods and people. It reduces congestion on roads and railways. IWT has clear advantage in many aspects like cost, fuel consumption, and pollution. Implementation of RIS system will improve the traffic and transport operation. Benefits of Himalayan automation is uh, enunciated and various stakeholders in the IWT sector in traffic and transport management stand to gain from the adoption of the automated RIS system. And these are the references, and then thank you. Uh, I just want to point out on uh, the rules now. Uh, in and water, the Inland Vessel Rules 2020. 2020, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. Sorry, sorry. Man, it, got... uh, it has gone to national rules. Yeah, yeah. That's for national integration, no? For the waterways. Right, right. Okay. Then I, I just uh, want to ask, in, in this, uh, identifying the vessel is uh, an important uh, uh, yeah, point. Yeah, that is true. So are you considering something like an AI? No, in fact, it's, a, it's a, for a futuristic situation because nowadays no, none of the vessels, I mean, uh, even uh, the vessel which is uh, flying from here to Kotayam, that's all stopped uh, because of uh, the growth of water, hyacinth, uh, then uh, uh, silting, etc. There is no uh, removal of uh, the silt and other things, you know, no mining. There's a mining ban. And even uh, for uh, this one, um, Indian waterways, you know, the, what they have mined, for depositing that silt, you know, that was also a problem. You know, I say, I've seen in Chavara that being deposited on the banks, you know, without any, I mean, the, the people don't permit that. Like, you know. What I'm asking is actually, uh, are you considering something like an AAS, automatic yeah, automatic system 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 system. System. For the for the vessels? Yeah, and the vessel parameters I have not considered yet. Okay. Because you now our uh, drafts are rather less, you no know, less than a, uh, uh, least available draft is a minimum two meters you now for uh, inland water transport, but in very many places it's not available because you no know, uh, because of silting. And then I am from the backwaters area where we used to swim. Now we can walk up like. Any questions? Maybe this is out of sync with your uh, equations and <laughs> different equations you now. So you may not be able to ask questions you now. Look at the various accidents that has taken place in the land navigation, like uh, the Tekadi tragedy or the Kumaragan tragedy or the Tanur tragedy. All of them have been ultimately attributed to the Oh. laxity on the part of the enforcement agencies rather than any collision. Hardly any collision has taken place. Probably you would say that because the traffic is less. But the possibility of accidents are more by virtue of uh, people not conforming to the essential safety requirements that are demanded by the inland water rules. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, no amount of technology will be able to prevent that sort of happenings, which is likely to increase when the IWT increases over a period of time. Just a, a observation. If uh, proper RA systems are improved, uh, implemented, yeah. then yeah. the RA center can give directions, you know, go this way, go that way, halt, then proceed, all those things. The commands could be given, and if the uh, vessels comply with that, Accidents could be reduced. Yeah, that is that's uh, what is intended. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to the next uh, presentation. Next paper is on the topic: application of advanced power electronic switches on board ship for green shipping, presented by Srimadi Bini Rani Jos from Kusat. The co-author of the paper is Dr. Mariama Chako. 
over to you, ma'am. Good afternoon to one and all present here. The topic of my presentation is application of advanced power electronic switches on board ship for green shipping. As the heading itself indicates green shipping, green shipping as all of us know, using minimum resources and energy possible to protect the environment from pollutants, which is one among a major challenge in the current shipping industry. Studies shows maritime transportation emits approximately 10,000 million tons of carbon dioxide annually, and it accounts for 2.5 percentage of the global greenhouse gas emissions. And it is moreover anticipated to increase from 50 percentage to 250 percentage by 2050, which is going to create a serious impact on environment and human health. As part of strategic planning, IMO had already come up with the standards of by increasing the efficiency by 10 percentage in every consecutive five years, as well as reduction in the carbon dioxide emission by 10 percentage in the consecutive five years. But as Sir was mentioning in the talk, once we wanted to reduce the carbon dioxide emission, we need to completely rely on renewable energy sources. But once we rely on renewable energy sources like solar, automatically the efficiency is becoming a question mark and a challenge. So my paper focuses on the application of modern power electronic switches, advanced power electronic switches when applied onto the shipboard electrical system, what can be the change that is coming up in the efficiency. Just a quick glance into the shipboard electrical system. The circuit is a simple sim, single line diagram of a simple hybrid electrical system wherein we can see on one side, left side, the prime mover, the energy storage system battery, the solar fuel cell and wind, which is being the input and which is used to drive the output on the other side, uh, the propulsion motor or the loads, essential or the non-essential load. There are a factor which lies as PEI, that is power electronic interface, which is a link between the input and the output. So this power electronic interface is a mandatory, is a very important figure in the shipboard electrical system as it can as it consists of converters and inverters because there is a need for switching from AC to DC, there is a need for switching from DC to AC, there is a need for boosting up the voltage, uh, stepping down the voltage depending on the load requirement. So this PEI power electronic interface uh, as such is a switch. So that switch currently is made up of normal IGBT and MOSFET switches, which is applicable on all shipboard electrical system. But the major drawbacks which we face are the low switching frequency, more of switching losses, conduction losses. Since because these losses are coming in, we are that is leading into the poor efficiency when we rely only on these switches. So my topic deals with wide pan gap switches, which is a substitute to the normal switches. As the term indicates, wide pan gap, uh, the pan gap becoming more and more for different materials. A comparative study of the band gap is given. Uh, gallium for gallium and silicon it is 0 0.7 1.1 uh, silicon carbide gallium nitrate 3.3 3.4 wherein the band gap of the devices like silicon carbide and gallium nitrate falls under the category of wide band gap as the band gap increases uh, it it has the follow it the that material shows the property of high efficiency fast switching response high switching operations low losses reduced weight and low cheap overall cost which is very much advantageous on this shipboard electrical system so uh, replacing the pei with the no, with wide band gap switch instead of the normal igbt and mosfet switches is my area of research the figure is just a basic structure of a WBG of a wide band gap switch, which consists, which uh, uh, follows a two dimensional electron gas structure. Now, this is a circuit, this is a uh, figure of a WBG switch. Coming to the advantages of these WBG switches on, on board ships, uh, high, high breakdown voltage. 
on, on shipboard electrical system, we require a higher breakdown voltage wherein this need to be, uh, breakdown voltage is the lowest voltage at which an insulator begins to behave like a conductor and transmit electric current. And a greater breakdown voltage, it results from a wider band gap. So a wide, the, this property leads to the usage in high voltage applications, which is very much advantageous for the ship electrical system. Moreover, the requirement of generators, motors, wires, and other electrical equipments, if it is reduced, that can reduce the space and money, and thereby the efficiency can be boosted. Uh, switching losses is another important is another important parameter in um, on the shipboard electrical system wherein we need to have low switching losses the lo losses that happens when a power device switches from the on state to the off state is what we call as the switching losses for normal switches the switching losses are very high because of which the efficiency is low now, uh, for WBG devices, the switching losses gives the advantage due to lower capacitance, lower reverse recovery charge, and lower on state resistance. This for WBG devices, the switching losses are comparatively low, leading to higher efficiency in turn meeting the IMO standards. High switching frequency, this is another very important parameter which is required on the shipboard system uh, determines how quickly it how quickly the um, it can operate and uh, less switching losses and conduction losses reduced capacitance value low intrinsic carrier concentration and high temperature performances are the reasons for the switching frequency this helps in attaining improved power quality reduced harmonic content reduced weight and size on the shipboard electrical system now since all these losses are comparatively less when less when we go with a wbg device the efficiency of this switch is turning out to be 95 to 99 percentage so a replace the higher efficiency ranging in 90 percentage and above will be a great blessing for the shipboard electrical system when relying on renewable energy sources for power generation and distribution and attaining better efficiency is one among the major challenges for green shipping then uh, reduced weight size and low overall cost, which is another important parameter which is required on the shipboard electrical system. Uh, since this can operate at high temperature due to large band gaps, this uh, requirement of additional cooling equipments is not that much required when compared to a normal switch. So once the, the number of these comp the cooling components are withdrawn from the electrical system, definitely the weight size and the low overall cost, cost is becoming uh, an important advantage. EMI effect with regard to the EMI effect on the shipboard electrical system, that is a major challenge. But uh, usage of this, which is definitely leads to a huge amount of EMI effect when compared to other switching losses. But this can be reduced. Uh, this can be reduced by proper circuit design, device packaging, filtering, and the modulation techniques. So, in conclusion, the paper presents the study on the merits of WBG switches on board ships which helps in attaining the green shipping, thereby in turn leading to meet the IMO standards. This is all about my presentation. Thank you. Any questions? So when you use this uh, wind gap, uh, switch, uh, band gap switches uh, to the uh, ship electrical board system, that is uh, during the practical application, if you uh, face any uh, saturation problem, how will you accommodate it? Uh, Ma'am, I have just gone through the qualitative methodologies only, the quantitative analysis part, even in the literature review sections, it is not available because the major shortcoming which I'm facing is this switch as such is not available for simulation. Uh, so uh, in the MATLAB, I'm on the process of designing the switch to meet the transfer characteristics. So only once I go into the quantitative analysis, I can comment on this now. Uh, so uh, have you any plan to incorporate this in a space uh, control module or anything like that or just a simulation? As such now, I'm planning to simulate the circuit and then go for a comparison with a only solar energy what is the efficiency comparison normally in with the normal switches when we go with an efficiency it goes 17 to 34 percentage if we can get a better comparison say around 80 or 90 percentage then only i can think of other simulation techniques okay 
Okay. Uh, thank you, Bini. Let's uh, conclude this presentation with this. And uh, this come to the end of the uh, technical uh, presentation. Now, moving on to the distribution of certificates. Congratulations, everyone. Your dedication and hard work have brought you to this moment. Now, I request the session chair, Mr. Sergeant P. John, to give the presentation certificates. First, I invite Sony TL on behalf of Kiran to collect the, cert collect the uh, presenter certificate. Next, I invite Srimadhi Tina Sara John to collect the certificate. I invite Mr. James KJ to collect the certificate. Srimati Bini Rani Jos, please come forward to collect the certificate. Thank you, sir. Now, I would like to express our deep gratitude to our session chair and co-chair who have made this session very delightful. Thank you all for your kind attention to this wonderful session. Let's conclude this session. Now it's time for lunch break. I request everybody to come back for resuming the conference, sharp 2 p.m. So we, uh, we, please be available for the sponsor session at 2 p.m. Thank you all. the participation certificate from the res registration desk.
welcome all uh, to the afternoon session of uh, ikenoi um, so this session is especially dedicated to our sponsors who make our uh, conference uh, much brighter and uh, they actually they are the one who make us to uh, arrange the things properly in, not only in financial way they are actually helping us in getting our students to get placed there and uh, uh so this uh, conference is because of uh, sponsorship from our uh, sets uh, platinum sponsorship from sets and gold sponsorship from sando maritime and uh, gold sponsorship also from uh, css and silver sponsorship from aries energy um the concept of sponsorship is not just financial aspect only it is just to it is to create the main or primary objective is to create networking and to bring our alumni back to department so we have our alumni is representing their companies and it starts uh, uh, first with uh, the platinum sponsorship uh, smart energy de and design solutions uh, sets uh, it's uh, sets provide complete uh, design solution from concept uh from uh, by providing projects on ocean ongoing continental uh, inland uh, and naval vessels it has completed 234 projects uh, it has also um, uh, taken projects of uh, 36 clients and um, uh, sets got around 6 awards so now i invite uh, vivek <laughs> to uh, say a few words about sets and to introduce you and uh, he is alumni from here. So back to home. Excuse me, Vivek. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh, for the kind words. Um, so, yeah. So it's a privilege uh, to be back here. Uh, I was here just two weeks back. So every time I'm around, I'll, I'll try to drop in. And uh, it's also a privilege for SETS to sponsor this event uh, as, a, as a platinum sponsor. Uh, when I saw the tagline of the conference, Advances in uh, Naval Technology and Ocean Engineering. Uh, it was so rhyming with what we are trying to achieve, what we are trying to, uh, you know, reach. Uh, so again, uh, myself Vivek, uh, I'm the Deputy General Manager for Advanced Analysis in SETS. So I look at structures and advanced analysis. Um, I'll, I'll get into the slides. Uh, so, yeah. So, yeah. So I thought I would tell the story of sets, which uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, portrays how we did our advancement in technology as we grew up. I joined sets in 2007, uh, and uh, that was the year it was established. I'm not sure how many of you know about the sister concerns of sets. There are three concerns. So yesterday our president was here. I'm not sure if uh, he told you about them. There is a, there is a firm called Algoship Designers, and then there is Algo Ship Brokers and then GTR Campbell Marine Consultants. So these three concerns, the three companies, uh, you know, are our sister or parent concerns. Uh, you know, our story will not start without telling about them. So Algo Ship designers are basically concept designers. So they talk to the owners about, you know, new, new concepts, new technologies that they can uh, talk about new types of cargo, which they can carry, et cetera, and get the client interested in projects. And the next uh, is the role of uh, algo ship brokers who go and then talk to the owners, also talk to the shipyards, get the deal done, sometimes also arrange, uh, you know, finances. Then comes the role for uh, GTR Campbell Marine Consultants who are uh, owners representatives and they look at uh, shipyard workflow, uh, you know, the building supervision and various other things and they make sure that the ship is delivered in a pristine manner. So what was missing until 2007 was a basic and a detailed design partner, or they were taking designs from outside. And so the president uh, of our group, Mr. Prince, decided that we should have a basic and, uh, you know, detailed production design arm. So that's how we started. We started, uh, you know, supporting our group firms in design. So the first order we got was for 24 ships of Sakura class. And, uh, you know, we, uh, at that point in time, in 2007, I was just three years experienced. I came back to sets, came back to Cochin from Dubai Dry Rocks. So the weight of that legacy of the other companies. So GTRC 
had built about 600 to 700 ships at that point in time, about 75 years experience then. And uh, the expectation and uh, so when, when, we dis when we were discussing with the clients, uh, the weight of that legacy was actually a bit too much for us. Uh, many of us, including Anish, who was there at that point in time, I guess, in 2008. So many of us had, uh, you know, uh, I recently read about, uh, you know, a debate of, of Narayana Murthy saying, you know, 70 hours work week. So we, we literally, many of the, you know, first, uh, uh, you know, the starters there were having such time because, you know, we were supposed to give the clients the kind of service the parent concerns were giving. So this is, uh, you know, one of that uh, vessels, the bulk carriers. Uh, a different series, sea transporter series, which were built in China. And uh, the, the the challenge was until, uh, oh, sorry. It, it, yeah, until 2006, uh, you know, every ship was built using empirical rules. And 2006 is when uh, the common structural rules came into picture. And all the, the whole concept changed. So the rules were now from first principle based. Uh, it's a goal based approach. The finite element analysis was first introduced in Marines, made, made mandatory for three holes, etc. Like global, local, fatigue analysis, etc. For these kind of ships. And we were all new. We didn't know about anything. And uh, we never had a picture of, uh, you know, what finite element analysis, even though, you know, uh, we had seen some of the MTEC, uh, you know, people here who were doing it. We had no idea. So we had to train it. The class societies were also partly in the dark because they were not having a uh, clear rules. They didn't have the proper tools to do CSR. So that was a struggle, but it all went well. Uh, so this is how we started our journey. And uh, soon we moved, we we thought, okay, uh, you know, we should not just limit ourselves to the, the group, that is Algo Ship Designers and GTRC. We got our first naval auxiliary order, 20 ships of Adesh class built in Cochin Shipyard, water jet propelled, thin plated construction, high speed. And uh, the, leg, uh, the, the the problem was the vessels which were built before in India, uh, even though it was designed for 34 knots, it could only achieve 28 knots. And that also with some of the weapons removed uh, because the weight control, the LCG control was of prime importance for these vessels. And uh, so that was a big challenge. Water jet propelled was a new thing. Semi-planing type vessel was another thing. And uh, so we, what we did was uh, started looking at, you know, so there, there, that's how we started, uh, you know, where, where we started to learn more, to grow more. Uh, the weight control was done in such a way, we, we did, uh, for this vessel, the weight control was done in kilograms, not in tons. And uh, Cochin Shipyard did a very, very good job because they built the ship with just one ton excess, all the 20 ships, just one ton excess. You can imagine it's a 310 tons odd vessel. Uh, built within plus or minus one ton, all the ship, all ships achieved, uh, you know, uh, its its uh, design speed and more. I think even after many years, I I heard that it is still achieving very good speeds. And I recently visited one a few of these vessels for another another job, and it's still in pristine. Uh, you know, uh, the way Coast Guard has maintained is is very good. It's, it's pristine, um, uh, you know, pristine uh, condition. So then, okay, uh, from these kind of ships. What next was our, uh, so okay, this is one uh, of uh, an operation very recently in Baipur, I think last uh, July, when one of these vessels were, uh, you know, uh, doing a saving operation. So you, you, whenever you see a vessel, Coast Guard vessel with the name A, starting with A, Adesh, Arinjai, uh, Ariyaman, and a lot of these things. You know, all, all of these are from this class. So whenever I hear a news about, say, a drug-busted uh, an Iranian ship or a mothership was, uh, you know, uh, captured. Yeah, it's class, yes. yes. It's an ABS and IRS class. Yeah. So uh, basically, uh, uh, the good thing about this, you, you look at the vessel, it doesn't look that fast. And that's how even the adversaries think. But it just, you know, it's really fast and it catches up. And that's how it works most of the time. And then we graduated, we moved to our next big challenge, the passenger vessels. There were four passenger vessels, uh, the 500 passenger vessels, Sindhu and Nalanda, uh, both for Andaman and Nicobar administration. And then Atal and Ashoga, 200 passenger vessels uh, for uh, the, again, Andaman and Nicobar administration. Classed with uh, the, the 500 passenger vessels were classed with ABS and IRS, dual classed, and 200 passenger with uh, LR and IRS, again, dual classed. 
so the challenges i mean uh, when we started discussing about passenger vessels you know uh, the, you know we we never did it uh, everybody had their own uh, uh, you know they thought it's it's going to be very tough because you know the waste vcg control evacuation uh, the the ventilation and everything i mean there are a lot of mul it's highly regulated uh, per se i mean it's not just engineering the regulations are so stringent the interpretations are very different Uh, and in india it's very uh, you know the uh, director general of shipping has very special requirements uh, of having both deterministic and probabilistic dimensionality driven which is very very rare so we had to do all these things and uh, these are now in operation and the good we we get very good feedback now we have been called by this uh, atman nicobar administration to upgrade some of their vessels to this kind of uh, comfort levels so you have you to look at the the Uh, the noise the vibration uh, and various other things stability statutory aspects etc etc so these uh, you know it was a big jump for us from uh, you know uh, what we were doing earlier so again i when i talked when this is this is our journey of uh, advancement in technology that we went through and i'm uh, i'm let me be very clear these are only the key projects that we did of, of course we cannot just survive with these projects for the last 16 17 years i am not talking about vijay is not here i think he was here yesterday there were there were projects coordinated by others like a beat boy tender vessel built in colombo dockyard etc i'm not talking about it those are i still do not consider those as key because this these are the ones where we have to grow a, i mean learn a lot we have to really spend midnight oil for these things the 200 passenger vessels this had in asia this was for the first time a safe return to port notation was introduced in asia so we had no references nobody was experienced even class Uh, i'm not sure if vargis is here so vargis was the person who was i think he is not here he is now representing he was the lr surveyor he, he is now representing s and o i know so uh, vargis you, you know we all had nightmares in understanding the philosophy it was a big uh, you know it it has a lot of redundancies uh, the the philosophy is ship is its own uh, you know uh, lifeboat you don't have to come back so even if you have a complete main vertical zone gone you still can survive in that ship the ship ship can still function so that was the the kind of uh, design uh, we had to do and uh, so that's the 200 passenger vessel now of course uh, moving further we got our first naval combatant vessel uh, the anti submarine warfare shallow water corvettes currently under construction i'm this month three of these vessels are getting launched in cochin shipyard it was supposed to be uh, launched on the 1st of november so i was expecting that uh, i could uh, mention that but now i heard it might it is slightly delayed but definitely within this month so this was a whole another level of uh, uh, you know design that you know or the effort that we had to put in uh, the first naval combatant vessel coming to the private a private industry till this time all the naval combatant vessel not the auxiliaries the combatant vessels were done by uh the directorate of naval design the erstwhile name then now it is called warship design bureau so this is the first time when it came to a private player and this had all kinds of requirements uh, uh, concerning the uh, survivability so i will just uh, have a quick uh, show of what it means for a commercial vessel you look at fuel optimization you look at uh, maximum cargo carrying and things like that but for a naval ship a combatant vessel it's all about survivability and the three pillars of survivability susceptibility where you are you know the, the others try to track you and you minimize your all your signatures you make sure that you jam everything uh, the tactics training all these kind of things then vulnerability which is basically once you are attacked once you are under attack how vulnerable you are what is your compartment disposition do you, are you uh, uh, have do you have sufficient redundancy uh, what about your armor and shielding Uh, how are your weapons and sensors position what all systems you have etc etc many other things and then recoverability that is battle damage control and damage strength etc so these are the three pillars i wouldn't want to detail all these things because of due to paucity of time we already i mean i had a session in dims if uh, any of you were uh, uh, there you may have uh, again refer to that and uh, of course this also require a lot of uh, advanced simulations that we had to uh part of uh, uh you know this is what um, yeah uh i do so if anybody wants to talk about any of these things we can always discuss so i am basically uh, in front of all the students i i can tell that we need more people we have got about four to you know at least four uh, at the most six projects now we are looking at all uh, complex projects 
somehow uh, i don't know we always land in some complex projects good or bad so okay so uh, i i uh, i that's my case thank you very much Uh, I just want to thank you for supporting the Iconoi and the and the department. You have you have come to teach also. I know that for the so thank you. So thank you very much, and also hope to uh, continue to get for the next programs also. Okay, thank you. Students have any quick questions you can ask. One or two questions we have time for. Malayalam Parayya na. Namaloru Malayalam thoru chellu na muttatta mulle ke mana mille. Ye kuri muttatta mulle na pashe mana mundu. Nalla sugandha mundu. My question is, uh, from your uh, presentation, it was very obvious that you are a self made naval architect in industry what is your perception about uh, those who are joining your company from this department i have a special intention also to uh, get some feedback from you how equipped are they for design i'm proud to say that yeah i'm i'm honest 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 i can actually name people so not a not at all a problem so we we took four uh, beta graduates last last year we took two mta graduates last year even before that we we have many many people from department of technology including me many at least 20 people uh, from this department in our uh, in our company uh, i believe we are some of the most practical people uh, maybe not the best in theoretical but definitely practical which is very important uh, when we are running projects uh, and i'm i'm very happy only uh, see the basic three qualities i would look in a candidate is one is yearning for knowledge i mean if you want to because uh, the idea that you can stop learning once you graduate is wrong uh, did you have to dedicate at least 15 minutes a day to do you know read one paper even one page of it uh, will be good enough if you do that in six months you will be you know a, a voice in that subject that is what i understood especially when we were looking at the signatures uh, just reading a paper uh, for six months after 6 months you you uh, you know you become an expert knowingly or unknowingly that is one thing point two is perseverance don't lose your heart if you are not recognized immediately especially for the youngsters i see this uh, trend a lot now people are uh, in the coming to the company immediately they want like huge salary hikes they want promotions immediately so play out slow make sure that you learn that will bring you uh, you know that is the long term uh, sustenance the last one is integrity integrity is out of the three this is what i look for maximum and uh, i i'm hope i hope that you know what is integrity uh, what i mean uh, like uh, just if you give me 30 seconds more an example of integrity is there was a there's an instance in 2013 where a runner was you know trailing uh, you know a long distance run uh, competition trailing for 200 meters he uh, you know uh, but he found that the runner ahead of him stopped as thinking he has finished the race but he had not but this guy did not uh, want to win the race because he had no chance otherwise so he pushed the other guy and won and when uh, you know everybody asked why you did that he said what would my mother have thought about me had i not done this so that was the question so that is one line for integrity uh, i think that these are the three qualities that any i think not just sets any company looks for so be be prepared for that thank you Vivek is always uh, cautious about integrity. He used to say that integrity means uh, one of the values in professional ethics, which means that you do your duty if nobody is observing it. You know that. Then you will actually you cannot cheat the person in front of the mirror. So integrity is an important aspect of professional ethics. Uh, let's go to the next uh, um, uh, sponsor. Uh, our next sponsor is Sando Maritime. His founder director Girish uh, is having a busy schedule right now, so he is not available right now here. So, um, um, 
I'm not explaining much about Ascend of Maritime. You can visit the website and get more details. And Girish is also one of the our uh, uh, alumni who always comes in our department for seminar and uh, webinars and all. Uh, let's go to the next uh, sponsor. Our next sponsor is uh, Gold Sponsor um, Capital Ship Solutions. Um, uh, it's a company in uh, Ernagul itself, Fedapalli, which was founded by our ship technology alumni. And uh, it's a company which uh, discuss about the registration of ships and survey. And uh, I invite Anish, uh, our ship technology alumni, BTEC and MTEC alumni, uh, Anish to say a few words about capital ship solutions. Over to you, Anish. Thank you, Rajesh, sir. So a very good afternoon. Uh, so respected uh, alumni, um, the very distinguished guest and uh, my dear friends. So uh, I'll introduce myself. My name is Anish Kumar and uh, uh, the easiest way, to, way for me to introduce myself is I'm part of the department, always been part of the department, still being part of the department. So uh, many people, when they say, when they come to department, they feel like it's a homecoming. I mean, I never feel like that because I have always been at home. So uh, uh, then moving on, uh, uh, before introducing my company, I thought I mean I should do some justice, I mean, because I've been seeing that there are other sponsors. So one good thing I see over here is that I mean, after a long time, when I come here, I feel like, I mean I get reminded of my past when I was studying over here. So after so many years, I can see that I mean all these prominent companies over here, I mean, has been represented by people from our department, be it uh, be my ex colleague Vivek or I mean Grish who has not come or uh, my classmate uh, uh, Commander Navin Nair who is about to come next. So it's a proud moment for the department over here. So I just wanted to, so I just wanted to use this opportunity to highlight all the uh, to all the people who are uh, studying here, like I mean, how privileged we are being over here, and what's the importance of this department. So please uh, uh, understand that and try to make the best use of it. Now coming to our company uh, CSS uh, Capital Ship Solutions, uh, I'm not sure if all of you are head of it. I mean, is there anybody who has not even head of the company? Okay, thankfully, I mean, nobody is raising their hands. I mean, so uh, we are a company uh, founded by our own alumni. Um, there are a few guys, I mean, uh, who has studied here and then they moved on. So one uh, one speciality, what I want to tell about our company is, I mean, there are uh, different, different verticals. So like, I mean, we normally concentrate on engineering, but this company has got various verticals on uh, different aspects of shipping, which I'll explain the slides to come. And I don't have much of time. I'll try to finish off uh, pretty quickly. So uh, this is basically, I mean, our uh, goal and motto. We don't want to go much into that one, but uh, uh, just to say that, I mean, we are uh, an expert technical legal training and management consultancy. So if you look at the icons, those are our uh, uh, key verticals. So one thing like most of the consultants do here, we are uh, into naval architecture. We do design ships. We do design off-road structures. Uh, it, it when it comes to repair or uh, major overhaul or if it's an enhancement, if it's from the scratch. So basic design we do cover. We do the detail design. We do the production engineering, and it's a, it's a growing company basically. I mean, probably if I asked you a few years ago, I mean, I'm sure some of you would have raised your hands when I asked you, have you heard of the company or not? So it's a fast growing company. And then one unique vertical which I want to highlight over here is ship registration. I hope, I mean, there are a lot of uh, aspiring guys over here who want to be ship owners in the, in the future. So normally when ship owners come, they don't do the registration themselves directly. There are agencies who help them out on that one. And uh, we are well connected with uh, various flags in the sense of I mean, various countries where people want to register their ships. So we do assist them in setting up their companies, uh, do the necessary insurance and then do the registration for the ships. And also we have a, a, a survey vertical, which does the third party survey. Like you go on board the ship and do assessment. I mean, probably finding out what is the valuation of the ship or, and also we have got one uh, known IX class, which is part of our, uh, it's not directly uh, in our organization. It's like a sister company, Capital Register of Shipping. It's a non IX class. So we also do the, the uh, like uh, the classing of the ships, which are uh, not required to be necessarily classified in IX. And recently, I mean, we have got some interesting projects on uh, port development we are doing in East Africa. We have got a significant presence in East Africa in one of the countries, I think, Southam, right? Southam, we are having a new port development. 
and these are areas which i want to highlight over here because i mean uh, uh, i mean things are pretty new i mean there are certain things which all of us are not expert but i always believe like i mean academics and uh, the commercial aspect i mean the, com- the company should work together so i'm actually looking forward for uh, having some support from the department i mean interacting with you guys and getting some support from here that's why i'm explain even though it's a pretty new project then obviously she prepare uh, building and project management also we got presence don't want to explain too much you will be understanding from the logo itself okay so these are uh, some of the flags which uh, we are a registered organization for so uh, flags like uh, saint kitts and navies palau uh, belize so this uh, i mean i don't want to explain much i mean these are the flags where we help the ship owners to register the ships into and uh, this is again the extension i mean this is uh, barbados and kids and sierra leone so just wanted to say that i mean shipping is a vast industry and there are a lot of uh, opportunities just want to uh, highlight that one over here self explanatory figure i'll skip this so service inspection i mean we are uh, supporting certain ship building projects in africa as well as we have a current construction that is ongoing in goa and then we do the project management in the sense i mean we help the ship owners to Uh, execute their project and we'll be doing the project management for uh, the building the vessels there so we are basically liaison between the owner and the shipyard so this again i mean uh, there will be a lot of uh, uh, many companies i mean vivek also has explained i mean how they are doing the concept design so it's like bread and butter for everybody every consultant so we do concept design we do basic design as i explained all the way up to production design we do so uh the, the, this the the steps are explained there like i mean in, right from understand the client requirements to moving forward skipping it again if you have any specific question you can ask over here so this is uh, uh, some fe i mean i don't have to tell you what is fe i mean i, I know when people are uh, spending much more time than what i'm spending over here i mean on fe so structural engineering we are doing it and there are quite many uh, fe analysis that is being done over there so production design so we do uh, 3d models and uh, to 3d models and then drawing making the drawings out of there so that shipyard can construct it it's like i mean production drawing is nothing but you are giving a jigsaw puzzle kind of thing so the person who is uh, uh, getting the drawings he can assemble all the parts and just make the ship so electrical structure piping various domains skipping that so these are i mean new build modification i mean recently you would have heard like there is bwts was a big thing uh, the new rule came and then people had to do 3d 3d scanning and then do the engineering so we were also doing a bit of that one and this is a project management i mean we were supporting one of the clients in uh, in in in, in a lift and lifting analysis this is on the offshore side and then uh, this is what i said i mean we are we are doing certain port development for african countries now i mean so there are uh, interesting concept like port and ship yard together uh, then you have to develop slipway in that and uh, where the basic infrastructure is not there there is a lot of visits that are required and there is a lot of uh, intercultural exchange that has to happen to understand the the requirement in the first place that is the most important aspect over here so uh, again the pictures are self explanatory i mean uh, so i will skip this part i mean this is done from a dubai office i was not personally part of this so i won't be able to explain much over here but uh, we do i mean uh, um, offshore rises and subsea uh, analysis so these are the basic uh, analysis what we do i think i have covered most of it i mean uh, naval architecture and then vessel registration survey offshore engineering vessel conversions so again uh, sub, sub of that when mooring analysis i mean uh, like that will be of interest for the students over here then terminal designs is, is a new thing that we are doing so these are the softwares which we have in house i mean we have uh, acquired most of the softwares either bought or when leased i mean uh, so invested con- significantly over here don't want to go through that but you can see that i mean right from analysis software to engineering drawing software you are having over there so just a, a snippet of the client list we are having from all over the world including uh, dnvgl so these are just the pictures i'll i mean because we are running short of time and uh, next chair uh, uh, person she has asked me to save some time for her so i'll try to conclude right now so these are some of the pictures of the completed projects this is being done in africa this is again for south sudan
So this is a, a slipway design that we are doing for one of the clients. So this is our global presence. I mean, uh, we have got uh, offices in various uh, countries and headquarters in, in US. And here the local office we have in Adapli and we have in Mumbai. And uh, we have got, uh, uh, in our, my colleagues, I mean, there are a lot of naval architects, mainly from this department. And there are some from the other, other colleges also. And we are also looking for uh, uh, MTech graduates. I think that answers some of the questions which somebody asked me before coming over here. So I think with that, I'll conclude my session. And uh, uh, if there is any question, then you can ask me. Yeah, please ask some questions. Some people are lawyers, and then we send some people, and then they want to assist in the one of our companies. Some other people are not. Okay. Thank you, sir. The actual conception is happening. It's happening. Yes. I need to do something. You can go. <laughs> Yeah. So Anish, a big thank you to CSS for supporting the department and uh, in general and Iconoi in particular. And we look forward to, you said uh, we some collaboration is required. We are, we will be ready anytime. Okay. Thank you very much. Questions from audience, please. Amshu. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Anish. Uh, now we move to the last sponsor for uh, silver sponsor, uh, Aries. Uh, Aries Energy. Aries founder is uh, Alumni from here, Sohan Roy and. We have with us uh, Commander Naveen. Uh, he will talk about Aries Energy. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first of all, uh, uh, thanks for attending this session. I can see that uh, this session has had the most attendance uh, till now among all the sessions till now. Um, I actually am perplexed uh, as to what you are so interested to hear about three companies than the technical uh, information that was available in all the previous sessions. But all the same, it's nice to see uh, the hall filled. And uh, I'll try to keep it brief so I can have your attention for the full uh, duration. Uh, somehow I probably misinterpreted uh, what I'm supposed to present now. So I don't formally have a, a presentation about the company. Uh, what I have is... Uh, a new uh, novel uh, product which my uh, company is introducing. Uh, but before I go there, uh, uh, I, I understand that I'm required to also introduce uh, my company. So I'll uh, first do that and then introduce uh, the product that I'm talking about. So uh, Aries Energy is the latest uh, brand of the Aries Group. And this brand uh, consolidates uh, our services involved in um, decarbonization and uh, digitization. Uh, Aries Group was uh, formed in 1998 by uh, the alumni of uh, uh, our own uh, college, Mr. Sohan Roy. And uh, today uh, we are uh, a complete uh, overall manpower of the company is close to 2,200. Uh, we primarily have two verticals. First is the design consultancy vertical, and the second is the uh, marine inspection vertical. Uh, I'll first talk about the marine inspection vertical because that is uh, numerically superior and in terms of revenue, uh, they have the higher share. Uh, so the marine inspection vertical is primarily involved in uh, doing periodic uh, inspections uh, of vessels. Uh, to be specific, uh, they, you, they do uh, uh, inspection of the ship's hull by ultrasonic gauging. Then they do uh, non-destructive uh, testing for uh, marine as well as uh, non-marine sectors. So when I talk about non-marine sectors, I'm talking about the industrial sector like refineries and factories. 
and uh, in the marine sector they do like i said ultrasonic gauging and uh, uh, conventional and advanced uh, non destructive uh, testing techniques uh, in addition to that there are a lot of other verticals which uh, have started because uh, our uh, ceo already always had a vision that uh, to mitigate uh, risk you have to expand into different fields and that is something which has helped the company a lot because when uh, uh, when when one one field is uh, having a recession uh, some other field is there which is appreciating so it it's always good to have your uh, presence in different fields so that you mitigate the risk for the uh, it's it's good for the overall health of the company so as per that vision uh, we are uh, entering into different fields constantly uh the latest one is our uh, solar division uh, wherein um, uh, we uh, provide solar energy solutions for the civil and the marine sector um we also have a <clears throat> we are also now involved in um, the going up the value chain and uh, introducing um, execution of projects not just uh, giving the design consultancy so we have teams which uh, execute uh, structural fabrication works while uh, sailing uh, we don't do uh, structural executions in in ports because then we compete with our own clients which are typically most of the shipyards but we have riding teams which do these scopes we have a hvac team uh, i'm now talking about the new teams because these are some of the uh, teams which you may not have talk, talked about so we give turnkey uh, hvac uh, solutions air conditioning uh, solutions for ships uh, supply of material and installations for uh, new build and for refurbishment of uh, existing uh, then we have a very big uh, lifting team uh, the lifting team primary responsibility is to uh, to uh, check calibrate and certify lifting appliances for uh, marine and uh, offshore sector this again is a, a very big team considering that um uh, lifting appliances have to be periodically uh, health of these have to be periodically checked and verified and certified now i come to specifically the design uh, consultancy wing we started with uh, only the marine uh, design team in uh, 1998 um subsequently after uh, a few years again as per the vision of the ceo we moved on to the offshore uh, sector so we are involved in uh, new build designs of uh, uh, many vessels and also offshore structures uh, i don't have a separate presentation but uh, you would have seen the presentations uh, shown by my predecessors so uh, almost all the types of ships that were shown uh, are also uh, uh, in the product portfolio of aries except uh, core warship uh, new build design for warships which uh, was shown in uh, vivek's presentation and the other service which uh, the ship registration service is also not uh, in our portfolio as of now <clears throat> uh, so uh, one of the prominent areas uh, yeah so one of the prominent areas which is uh, uh, seeing lot of interest recently is uh, decarbonization and uh, digital digitalization fields so uh, aries is the world leader i repeat that we are the world number one in terms of uh, the number of uh, ballast water treatment retrofit projects then uh, exhaust gas cleaning system retrofit projects we also are the world number one in terms of uh, hull inspection that is uh, we have the most number of uh, uh, class certified technicians for ut gauging and also um class uh, irata irata is the international organization certifying rope access technicians so uh, we are the world's number one in uh, rope access services also having the most number of uh, irata certified uh, technicians so these are four fields in which uh, aries marine is world number one um i now go on to the specific product that uh, i was intending to talk about uh, so this is called uh, visual asset management uh, this is a product which i have already introduced in the previous uh, uh, dims conference uh, and some of you uh, were thankfully i i don't see too many familiar faces so that's why i took the chance of doing it again here uh, i can see my friend he's smiling there but i think that's okay 
So, uh, so uh, the subject is digital data capture applications uh, and applica digital data capture and its applications in asset management. So, um, uh, one of the prominent uh, uh, difficulties that is faced by uh, an asset operator is uh, the easy storage and retrieval of data uh, connected to an asset. Uh, now, when we are talking about a complicated asset, uh, which is remote at sea, say a fixed offshore platform, there are hundreds of equipments, uh, hundreds of systems uh, operating simultaneously in that, uh, for which uh, uh, each of uh, which has its associated information. So uh, we need to have a, a efficient system of uh, storage and easy retrieval of this information. So uh, conventionally, uh, what what has been happening is information in the form of PDF or Excel are all just uh, curated and stored in folders. Uh, and uh, you just have to search and uh, take it from them, which is cumbersome and um, uh, not user friendly. So what is, uh, uh, okay, this is the same concept. So what we propose to have is um, a, a centralized storing, uh, uh, organizing and retrieving function for the database and uh, having uh, rights for uh, specific users and write, uh, write restrictions for uh, uh, access of this data. So uh, the concept that we introduce is called visual asset management. The premise of that is if you can see it, then you can manage it better. Uh, what is the idea is you connect the data to what you physically see on the asset. So you first make a 3D model of the asset, not an engineering 3D model, a, 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 an as-built 3D model of the asset, and then physically connect the data to each of the components in that model. So uh, now this is one of the snapshots of a model. This is, this is a, a snapshot of the 3D model that is created, as-built 3D model. So you can actually go around each and every nook and corner of this asset uh, uh, in this model. So this model is created using a special camera. Uh, yeah, so this is a camera that is used. It's called a Civetta uh, camera. It's of German make. The concept itself was introduced uh, by a German, com German company called Weisagi for uh, industrial applications. Uh, but we collaborated with them because we saw that there is a lot of opportunity for this in the marine sector. Because marine assets are um, remote especially the ones offshore and even ships are remote assets wherein uh, data retrieval and uh, access is very important and even data sharing is very important. So this camera is used to take three-dimensional photographs with a stitch together to make a 3D as-built model. And um, yeah, these are some of the uh, parameters and specifications of the camera. As you see, it's a high resolution camera of 230 megapixel. And uh, it can take a photograph in 30 to 40 seconds. One uh, uh, rotation of that will take 40 seconds uh, and uh, rugged design basically, uh, yeah. So now all the data that is to be stored because data will, will be there in different formats like PDF, Excel, uh, Word. So all of that is converted into a format which can be uh, opened in a web browser. So, so that is done and then the data is uh, uh, stored and retrieved. So uh, applications, if you can uh, access and retrieve this data uh, at a remote location quickly, then it, it is useful for, uh, now imagine a case wherein you are an, uh, are an uh, at, at CA, you are an offshore asset and you have a, a leak uh, of an equipment and uh, you have a subject matter expert which is in some shore location. So if you have, this application installed in 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 your in your company so the particular area where you are having the problem can be visually seen by the uh, the person at sea and the subject matter ex expert at office and the person here can visually see and then uh, give a, a resolution what is to be done so that uh, essentially is the overall aim of this and then of course it can also you can also connect the data to different components and uh, achieve it this also assists in crew training. That is, uh, before you actually transfer the crew to a, a remote location, since you have the 3D model, as built 3D model of that, you can uh, uh, give classroom instructions as to what, what the crew is going to expect when you uh, actually reach the asset. So crew familiarization is one of the 
important uh, 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 advantages of uh, the system. Then, of course, if you want to make some modifications and you want to take approval for that from higher ups, it is always easy to show it in an as built model and uh, show and explain what are the things needed. So now uh, my talk will be uh, succeeded by a five minute video wherein what I'm telling will be amply clear. Yeah, can I have the video please? Sound. Marine in an offshore industry worldwide. From modest first steps in 1998, the company's growth in the industry has been a remarkable story of achievement, with 45 group companies in the Aries Group Consortium. We now have offices in 15 countries around the world. That is 25 as on day. In 18 years, we have completed close to 30,000 projects for 2,500 clients spread over 72 countries. The Aries Marine has been working in association with the diversified oil and gas industry all over the globe since Aries Marine began operation in the Middle East. Aries Intelligent Detailed Engineering, as built and 3D scanning works, introduced Visual Asset Management Application, VAN, in association with Bees AG from Germany, who provides superior solution for digital imaging and visualization market worldwide. VAN is a browser-based database application that allows you to visualize and manage all existing digital file formats via drag and drop in a visual way. Application for users worldwide, oil and gas, industry, forensics, cultural heritage, construction, oil and gas. Our unique background in engineering and oil and gas gives us insight into the life cycle of visual assets and the importance of creating and maintaining a system that allows for maximum accessibility, adaptability, security, and communication. VAM enables the asset owner to monitor and maintain the asset right from its commission stage to regular inspection, repair, maintenance over years, and finally, decommissioning. It helps create a virtual walkthrough of your asset with interlinked high definition 360 degree photographic captures with links that lead you to documentations. From any remote location, you are able to navigate around assets and call upon any documentation related to any specific part of the asset. It helps you to access your asset without needing to be physically present. Inbuilt photogrammetry enables a user to measure the size of objects, spaces, flash checks, and clearance heights within each image. The integrated search engine inbuilt within BAM enables search of any specific content. How BAM helps an efficient asset management. The detailed 3D visual imagery helps site teams to familiarize themselves with the working environment before reaching the asset. The well platform is generally located in the middle of the ocean, so the round trip to the platform requires a lot of manpower, and material resources, and time. Through the flat van platform, companies can remotely train new employees and regularly carry out remote safety training. The three-dimensional display function makes the performance of remote training clearer and the training effect is more obvious. The interiors of equipments and tanks can be visualized before the space become accessible. Repair or maintenance activities can be planned between projects and operational teams. Original imagery of the subsea equipment and infrastructure can be incorporated before installation and helps monitoring over time. VAM can be used to distribute information to make the tendering process more efficient and quicker and more accurate and reduce the cost associates. If a technical issue or a breakdown occurs, VAM provides rapid access to operational data, engineering drawings, and visual reference material. 
On-site personnel can quickly and easily update van page contents and provide supplementary information to other personnel. At the end of an asset's operational life, use VAM to explore decommissioning methodologies. Desktop access to remote asset visuals, documentations, communication and media provides a powerful means of planning activity, operating facilities, and maintaining integrity across the entire life of an asset. Through the synergies of the VAM, all visual imagery can be shared greatly facilitating the exchange and discussion of the same problem among the staff and experts in different regions and developing solutions sufficiently. If any incident takes place in the field and the onshore response team requires the visual capture of the areas affected, the software presents a speedy visual solution and thus acts as emergency response intelligence. Providing onshore personnel with a detailed view of offshore facilities, visual context, and measuring capabilities, VAM creates a virtual environment that is more realistic, much faster, less costly, and more engaging than any other option. Thank you. Aries Marine and Engineering Services requires a little in the way. I, I also want to highlight that Aries is thrilled to have uh, many employees, uh, many, many employees who are alumni of this institution. We, we employ more than uh, 20 personnel as on date. And um, all of them have been performing very well. Um, uh, there was an earlier question uh, from uh, the HOD uh, as to... Um, what is what what is the what is the assessment or the industry assessment of the uh, personnel joining? Um, uh, to be frank, uh, I'll be very specific. Uh, what I see is that the naval architects who come from uh, ship tech, not just now, this applies to when I passed out also. Um, uh, they are reasonably good in uh, naval architectural fields. For example. Uh, uh, structural engineering or basic uh, main dimension fix in lines plan and things like that. But uh, we see a distinct uh, gap in fields like uh, ship systems, uh, uh, specifically piping systems and uh, electrical. And uh, we firmly believe that uh, a naval architect should have uh, knowledge about these two important components. Uh, otherwise, Ultimately, it is a naval architect who steers the uh, design project. So a very good knowledge of these two fields is essential. And that that area, I think, is a gap which uh, you have to bridge. Uh, I, this is I'm not telling about uh, how the, 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 the information is being administered in the, uh, uh, in the department. I'm sure it is being taught properly, but it's just that I think the students don't understand the importance of these two subjects. They are as important as your structural design or uh, your uh, lines plan. Uh, so, uh, and uh, piping design and uh, uh, the electrical uh, design, load analysis, etc., are uh, bread and butter jobs which uh, happen day in and day out. And uh, it is good to know these uh, two things. Uh, otherwise, uh, people tend to struggle on these these two fields. That's it. Thanks. So, a uh, big thank you from the department to Aries Group, and please convey our regards to Sohan. We we actually we spoke to him and to bring him for this event, but he said he is out of station. Yeah, yeah. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Naveen. So with this, uh, we conclude the session, special session for the sponsors. Thank you, sponsors, for funding our conference. Uh, now, next, uh, we move to the uh, fourth session of our conference. It's computational methods. Um, so I hand over the session to our research scholars, Tina. And... Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, for sponsors, uh, we are giving a token of appreciation. Uh, so the sponsors, uh, we'll start with the first sponsor, uh, Sets uh, Vivek, please come forward. And 
I request HOD to hand over the token of appreciation. Uh, next, I invite uh, uh, second uh, sponsor, uh, Asando Maritime. Uh, he's not here, so his memento will give you later. Uh, gold sponsor, uh, CSS Anish, please come forward and receive the yeah officials of CSS. Please come forward and collect the memento. Our silver sponsor, Aries, uh, please come forward, Navid Nair, Commander Navid Nair. Thank you. Okay. Um, now we'll have the... Uh, last session, uh, session four, uh, computational methods in engineering. Um, so I hand over the uh, the session to our research scholars, Jasna and uh, Tina. They will continue the session. Over to you, yes. Distinguished guests and esteemed participants, welcome to the fourth session of ICANO 2023. The technical session four deals with computational methods in engineering. This session is chaired by Dr. Shija J, Associate Professor, Indian Maritime University, Vishakapatnam, and is co-chaired by Dr. Manoj T. Isaac. It is with great pleasure that we introduce Dr. Manoj T. Isaac, an accomplished scholar and an expert in the field of ocean engineering. He currently serves as an Associate Assistant Professor in the Department of Ship, Te Ship Technology at QZET. Since 2015, his extensive expertise in the realm of ocean engineering is a testament to his dedication and passion for advancing maritime technology. Now I welcome Dr. Manoj T. Isaac to introduce the session chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so we welcome to the fourth and final session of this two-day seminar, International Conference, uh, sorry, two-day International Conference on Advances in Naval and Ocean Engineering. Uh, the task entrusted with me is to introduce our chair and the speaker for this uh, session, Dr. Shija Janadhanan. Uh, Dr. Shija Janadhanan is an associate, uh, associate professor and head of the School of Naval Architecture and Ocean Engineering, Indian Maritime University, Vishagapatnam campus. Uh, she earned a PhD in numerical uh, ship hydrodynamics from Indian Institute of Madras, so Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, uh, in 2010. Formerly, she worked as professor and head department of mechanical engineering, SCMS School of Engineering and Technology between 2013 and uh, 2021. She also served as a surveyor in the research and rule development division of Indian Register of Shipping, Mumbai. Uh, between 2010 and 2013. Her research interest includes uh, controllability of surface ships, underwater robotics, vibration of risers, and computational fluid dynamics. She is the editor of, book, uh, of the book uh, Advances in Visualization and Optimization Techniques for Multidisciplinary Research, Lecture Notes in Mechanical Engineering, Springer Nature, Germany. Uh, she has been an invited speaker in the International Conference on Advanced Computational uh, Engineering and Experimenting, ASEX, since 2017, and was elevated to the level of session organizer, uh, visualization in multidisciplinary engineering in 2019. She has about 50 publications to her credit and also served as a reviewer to uh, journals published by Elsevier, Springer, and Taylor and Francis. She was appointed as a technical committee member to IR class during 2021-22. So um, maybe welcome Dr. Shija for this 
session please thank you Thank you, Manoj, for your generous introduction. And above all, I would like to say that I'm a proud alumnus of this university. I studied MTech here during the period 2003 to 2005 um, uh, in the only uh, uh, program of MTech here, that is uh, Computer Aided Structural Analysis and Design. I have my uh, classmates here. I have my teachers here. I have my IIT DC members and mentors here. So it's an overwhelming moment to be here and share some insights with you. Uh, 20 years ago, when I stepped into this campus, least did I know anything about hydrodynamics. I learned my basics of hydrodynamics from here. And uh, in my journey of 20 years, I picked up some concepts of hydrodynamics. Maybe the lessons I learned here helped me fetch a degree from IIT Madras. And thereafter, I have been using uh, uh, simulation-based designs or computational fluid dynamics as a major tool in my research. So uh, with all your blessings and good wishes, here we go. I'm here to take a small, I, I'm rather I'm here to share my insights on simulations-based designs in hydrodynamics. So uh, will there be somebody to help me change the slides or do I have I'll try myself. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, give you a brief about Indian Maritime University. We have six campuses and we have four schools and my campus is in Vishakhapatnam and we have four schools and I'm heading one of the schools at the School of Naval Architecture and Ocean Engineering. And here we are committed to do some uh, simulation based designs. And we uh, try to become the leading educator in naval architecture, shipbuilding and ocean engineering. And we also like to be the preferred consultant in ship design and optimization, coastal and tidal hydrodynamics and underwater noise assessment. We are uh, uh, being partnered with Indian Navy and uh, we would also like to partner with other research organizations. Uh, we are also uh, doing our level best to produce uh, numerical solutions for various problems at sea. And we are also emerging as a uh, part and parcel of policy decisions. And we also imbibe the spirit of the International Maritime Organization, safer ships and cleaner oceans. So we have uh, four programs. The uh, BTEC Naval Architecture and Shipbuilding is a nascent one. We just introduced it this year. Otherwise, we have uh, BTEC Naval Architecture and Ocean Engineering, BTEC Naval Architecture, MTEC Naval Architecture and Ocean Engineering, MTEC Dredging and Harbor Engineering, with the intake shown there and the placement percentage shown there. These are our usual recruiters. And now coming to the point, overview of my talk. I would like to take you through the importance of numerical experiments when we also have physical experiments and uh, they are always the domineering and the most uh, genuine ones, yet we do numerical experiments. We have uh, simulations uh, in hydrodynamic de uh, design. We also have simulation based hydrodynamic designs. We have simulations driven hydrodynamic design. Then that leads slightly to the digital threads, digital twins, I'll show you some case studies on simulation-based designs and the process of digital threads. And finally, the innovation and sustainability we have to make use of or we have to uh, build in our designs. So now if we ask ourselves the questions, why not physical experiments when the very famous uh, statement of Max Planck goes like this, an experiment is a question which science poses to the nature and a measurement is a recording of nature's answer. That is the importance experiments or model testing have got. They are the most efficient way of establishing a cause and effect relationship. And in engineering or in physical sciences, uh, they are the primary component and they form a very important part of scientific method. 
So they are also used to test thesis and hypothesis. So with all this, uh, why don't we always do experiments? I can uh, show you a typical test facility, which is uh, which I've picked up from the DRDO site. And uh, one is a towing tank. Uh, uh, the other one is also similar hydrodynamic test facility. But the reason we don't use them very frequently is because they are very expensive. So what do we do? How do we uh, substantiate our designs or how do we complement our designs? That is when we have this numerical experiments or simulations with the advent of digital technology or the fast computing digital comp uh, devices available these days. So we uh, have in our uh, normal jargons, the car simulators, ship simulator, fight simulators. It's the same principle with which we do the simulation, that is uh, putting in what all is required based on experience and then realizing the results as uh, you know some, some inputs to the future. So this is indeed a modern day's experience and this is what we are trying to take forward to complement our model testing or experimental methods. So the various steps involved in uh, typical simulation is uh, we start with pre-processing that uh, will entail a mathematical model, meshing and incorporating boundary conditions. Then uh, we have a solution uh, where we numerically discretize the domain. Then we also give some numerical schemes for the computation of solution. Then we have the post-processing, that is where we make the right interpretation of the phenomenon through visualization. And finally, we should also do an uncertainty analysis or validation to ascertain the uh, percentage difference between the uh, already accomplished uh, experimental method and the uh, uh, being tested numerical method. So these four methods constitute important element in simulation. Having said that, how do we address the hydrodynamic designs through simulation? So when we speak about hydrodynamic designs, I would like to touch upon four uh, systems here, surface systems, subsea sub systems, underwater systems, and offshore systems. So no matter whatever is the system, uh, we have some standard numerical methods that go into simulation. First one is the finite element method, the finite difference method, the finite volume method, and MATLAB coding. So using these methods, we, we build our simulation models. And computational fluid dynamics is a, a most prominent of, the, of all these computational fluid dynamics based on finite volume method is the most prominent. And um, it goes with all these governing equation. And whenever there is a boundary moving, the problem becomes more complex because you have to not only solve the normal conservation laws, you also have to solve a grid conservation law so as not to get a negative volume element. Then we have the uh, major, major equations that go into the simulation process. That is the continuity equation and the Navier-Stokes equation. The Navier-Stokes equation is solved on a guessing basis and that is checked with continuity equation and that goes in an iterative process. And then what is more important is taking turbulence into account. I don't want to dwell much here because uh, I want uh, you to, I, I would like to pay more attention onto my case studies. Uh, so I would say that the K omega SST turbulence model has been uh, more or less a uh, 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 unique model or more or less a uh, most preferred model uh, in, in hydrodynamics ship or offshore hydrodynamics unless the concentration is more on wake. And so we do a, a turbulence model also to close the solution that's shown by the equations before. The important part here, which uh, I have uh, seen from my observation is normally what is overlooked is the discretization part. When we do a discretization, it's very important to capture the boundary layer properly uh, to get uh, uh, reasonably reliable solutions. So when we uh, capture the boundary layer, we should always look into the regions which undergo a sudden change in geometry, something like a wake of a sail or the uh, propellers or some uh, attachment, uh, in, uh, immediate attachments or a, a place where 
there are there is a possibility of vertical structures so when we are want to capture the boundary layer we have to use the uh, blasius uh, flat plate uh, theory uh, to determine the boundary layer thickness and the boundary layer thickness is finer dis uh, is finely discretized into several other elements it depends upon the complexity of your problem. So normally the mesh law or the mesh uh, pr uh, proportion that goes into any simulation is we go for 15% of the mesh in the far field, 40% of the mesh in the near region or the buffer region and the boundary layer region, we go for the remaining 45% of the mesh. And that's the most important part of your mesh. So then there is something called as Y plus and the value of the Y plus dictates how accurate your solution is. Normally, if the Y plus is less than five, the boundary layer is resolved. If the Y plus is uh, around 30, you know, you need special wall treatments. And if the Y plus is greater than 50, you have to uh, go for a uh, much uh, careful treatment of the walls for your solution to be uh, uh, you know, quite reasonable. And thereafter, when you cross the boundary layer, a growth ratio of 1.2 to 1.5 is used. I spent some time on this because if this is not done pro properly, the whatever I speak later is of no use, will be of not no use because this is where the accuracy of the problem lies in. Now, the next part is to bring the problem close to the physical conditions, and that's normally decided by the boundary conditions. So you have to take a real-time boundary conditions that makes your simulation close to your physical experiments. So we have these boundary conditions, the no-slip condition, the pressure opening at the top. On the body, it's always the no-slip condition to capture the boundary layer. Then bottom also, depending upon the shallow water or the deep water condition, the bottom has to have an effect on the body. So we go for a no slip condition. Sides, it's normally free stream. And these days, people also use symmetric condition. That is also good enough. Velocity inlet at the inlet and the pressure outlet at the outlet. And then again, the accuracy of your solution or the stability of your numerical schemes depend on how you discretize your equations. So discretizing the equation is another major uh, uh, step in uh, uh, a simulation-based method. So uh, as I mentioned, we normally go for K-omega shear stress transport scheme, and uh, we go for, uh, that's especially for the RANS models. And if you are looking particularly at the way K epsilon is more preferable, and these are the uh, schemes we have for the temporal and the spatial discretization. We normally go for the second order methods. And whenever there is air water interface, especially in the case of surface ship, we also go for a method called volume of fluid methods. So this is how the solution process goes on. This is a simple algorithm. If you have a more complex a problem with two phase flow and all, you go for a pressure correction in three step and we normally call that a piezo algorithm. Uh, I'll skip this. Now, what is important to understand here is what are the different levels of simulation we have in the uh, hydrodynamic design? The first one is simulations in design. We do a simulation in design with all these uh, techniques mentioned in my previous slides, basically for understanding the physics. How is a wake formed or what is the interaction of the boundary layer with uh, an adjacent body that is passing or what is the bo bottom effects with a body uh, in shallow waters? All these are some phenomena which, which we would like to know uh, before we go for uh, any further study on uh, in, in a particular field. So simulations in design is you know a selective understanding of flow physics. But there is a much advanced stage of that called a simulations based design where the design is optimized. The design, uh, the shape undergoes the changes from the input from the simulations. The simulations give you some uh, insight saying that the shape is not conducive. For example, the first body the, uh, that uh, is shown there is, uh, has a bulbous bow that is not conducive to a performance so that consumes more fuel and it, it consumes more power. So we see that by a slight modification we do to the bow shape, we come to a much lesser flu uh, fuel consumption and power consumption. So we have optimized the shape and this is what we refer to as simulations based design. And there is yet another complex uh, form which we call a simulation driven design. So say simulation design, uh, 
driven design takes into the entire process uh, of design in a holistic way and uh, it has a life cycle approach rather than a component or a product approach. It has a life cycle approach. So it takes care of the uh, production uh, cycle. It also design phase. It also takes care of the production phase. It also takes care of the operation phase. Some you know uh, components that are reasonable in the uh, design phase may not be really reasonable in the operation phase. So it is a kind of you know iterative way in which we come to an optimized uh, process or a life cycle or a holistic approach. And Europe has a design all by itself uh, on this holistic approach called as the Holy Ship Project. So this is a simulation driven approach. So all these lead us to different modules in design uh, ship design is just a module which we call as a digital thread and the other processes in the ship production and operation con constitute other parts of digital threads and when all the digital threads are put together we finally derive at the digital twin of the entire ship so right from its birth its inception that is the concept design to the day it is recycled in a yard or it is uh, dismantled in a yard, what it goes through is understood from its digital twin. So simulation-based design paves way for all these things. So now I, like, I would like to bring to your uh, uh, notice uh, the different simulation-based designs which we do at uh, um, Indian Maritime University Vishakhapatnam campus. We use uh, ANSYS, we use uh, the Numeca Fine Marine, ANSYS CFX and Fluent, ANSYS ISOM CFD. So this is a typical simulation we have run in the uh, Numeca base where you see the uh, wave generated uh, or the ship generated wave around a DTMB model. And the first thing we do is to validate and we validate with standard results. Then we take the CFD model forward. So this is a comparison of various uh, uh, turbulence models at uh, fruit number point. three to check which works well because though we say k omega sst works well for the near wall region but we are not sure what happens in the wake so we try different uh, models out and we see that easm so expl explicit uh, algebraic stress model and the ds detached ad simulation models come quite close when the fruit number goes and we understand that as the uh, turbulence further builds up RANS models do not serve much purpose and we have to go for LES and DES models. So these are the typical uh, streamlines plotted around the DTMB model. And uh, from the streamlines, we get a lot of insights. And if we put the model to a drift, uh, we, if we get to see some vortical structures, that is a scope for vortex shedding, we understand that there is a chance of flow getting separated from there. And that results in a uh, bubbly turbulent wake Every ship has a turbulent wake. And if the turbulent wake becomes bubbly because of the flow separation and air entrapment, then we have a concern of the ship's stealth. So these are the predictions we come up with from every simulation. So we normally go for the normal resistance simulations where we study the resistance of the hull, the pressure resistance, the frictional resistance, wave making resistance and all. And we do a lot of uh, shape optimization for reducing the resistance. Then comes the naval vessels. Uh, we all know that the naval vessels have got uh, normally big bulbous bows because they house the sonar dooms. And when the bulbous bow size increases, it is not less than in a bluff body. And we all know that the bluff bodies shed vortices. And these vortices are not really taken well by the propeller plane. So we do a shape op optimization and we can't compromise on the size of the uh, bow because it has to serve a mission. The, so then we carefully do the bow optimization and um, uh, we go for the simulation based design and you see that dynamically we go for different uh, uh, options and uh, we see the flow profile changing and the wake fraction at the uh, 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 the first picture shows the uh, propeller plane wake fraction and the minimum wake fraction is considered as the optimal solution. If the wake fraction is not properly taken care of, the propellers start cavitating at a very early stage. They produce a lot of noise and uh, it is again, uh, uh, it, it, it builds on the OPEX cost. 
then ship motions ship motions is something very important and now because the simulations are matured enough they are ripe enough to capture sim uh, motions we have been able to do more realistic simulations because we have been able to get lot of uh, uh, motion related phenomenon from simulations earlier in the during the early 80s when cfd was in in its nascent stage people used to do the uh, designers used to do a kind of quasi static simulations but with the present cfd dynamic real time simulations are possible and these are the six degrees of freedom motion of the ship and we classify them into sea keeping and maneuvering so whatever i'm um, encircling here are the horizontal plane motions and we uh, take care of maneuvering through horizontal plane motions role is an exception i'm, I'm not uh, dealing with role now or the parametric role uh, just the simple maneuvering with uh, uh, horizontal plane motions and if we consider the vertical plane motions on the other side we have the problem of sea keeping so with uh, realistic simulations with user defined functions hooked to the solvers we have been able to capture the sea keeping uh, i've typically brought two cases here uh, that is uh, the heave uh, uh, resonance condition that is the wave uh, frequency in um, uh, and the uh, uh, the wave encountering fre uh, frequency the wave uh, uh, frequency and the ship encountering frequency in heave happen to be the same so we have a resonance condition here and this is uh, these are two simulations that have been carried out in head c and beam c then we have maneuvering simulations we do this uh, captive model test a simulation of the captive model test uh, where we do a simulation of the pure yaw, pure sway, pure uh, yaw, and the combined sway and yaw motions to obtain the forces and moment in these motions uh, on the hull so that we can extract the hydrodynamic derivatives. And once the hydrodynamic derivatives are extracted, they go into the equation of motion. We can predict the vessel trajectory that speaks a lot about the vessel's maneuvering characteristics. Then uh, we also do a, a simulation of sloshing of tanks. Uh, sloshing of tanks have ever been a big problem. So when the we have taken the uh, tank with half fill condition, that is the most uh, vulnerable condition, and we see that uh, with no baffles inside, uh, uh, the uh, there's a violent uh, motion of the free surface happening. Uh, the, this experiment uh, shown on the left side and the numerical simulation on the right side, and then we. Uh, provided a solution with uh, ball baffles. These ball baffles are perforated balls that absorb the sloshing, energy in sloshing. And we see that the free surface is more or less calmed down. And the peak loads, uh, the, those are shown in the adjacent graph uh, that is existing without the presence of ball baffles have been much brought down with the presence of ball ba baffles. So this is one prediction that is very much understood by a simulation-based design. Then the next case is um, the free fall lifeboat. So a lifeboat, uh, a co totally covered lifeboat that is falling from a ship is simulated using numerical methods. The problem is when a lifeboat falls freely from the deck to the, uh, uh, it goes on overboard, uh, the nose part undergoes severe stresses. So the stresses on the hull has been estimated uh, using a finite element method thereafter of, after obtaining the loads from the hydrodynamic model we have gone for a, a, a from cfd we have gone to finite element method to estimate the stress distribution on the hull now this were these were all about the surface system now we'll go to the underwater system in our underwater we have bigger challenge if in surface we have air water interface as a challenge then for underwater, the depth is always a challenge. So uh, the biggest uh, the hydrodynamic design parameters that pose challenges are the depth range, endurance, payload, and energy efficiency. So we should have a sound hydrodynamic design, uh, which in, uh, we investigate in two stages, early design and advanced design. In early design, we uh, normally investigate the resistance, propulsion, and maneuvering characteristics. But when we go to the advanced part, we see the hull and propeller interaction, hull to hull interaction if multiple AUVs are present. So this is one project called NEMO project, Navigational Emergency Marine Object, uh, for which we took the shark model from QFUS. 
uh, to understand uh, the shark uh, proportions. We have been uh, sitting in front of quite a good number of aquariums to understand the star, star, uh, shark locomotion. And this is typically called as a Karanji form locomotion. Uh, and this is a shark inspired underwater vehicle so that the propeller can be a flapping foil to reduce the propeller related noise because we know that the anthropogenic noise have made uh, more than 300 to 400 species vanish from the ocean environment. So in order to address such problems, there has been a need to go for bio-inspired propulsion. This is just a humble attempt to a hum bio-inspired propulsion. And uh, uh, the uh, forces or the loads coming on the pectoral and the uh, dorsal fins have been estimated using CFD. So this shows the uh, first picture shows the uh, uh, von Karman vortex street around the body. It's a typical uh, uh, signature of uh, any body that is propelling. This reverse von Karman, if it's von Karman, it would give additional load. If it's reverse von Karman, it would propel. Uh, uh, so it is, uh, uh, and the second one uh, shows the, uh, 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 can you play the video, please? Will you be able to play, play the video? There's a video here. The second one is a video. That's okay. If it's not possible. Uh, yeah. Uh, can we play this video, please? Can we go to the escape mode and play, please? Can we escape? Go to the previous slide. Previous slide. This one, will you be able to play the video there? No, sorry, um, I don't know, something went wrong. It was a video. It's okay, it's okay. Uh, we have more slides to go before they drive me away. Let me finish. So, uh, okay, uh, so that was the second one was the pitching and heaving motions of a box fish, a box fish inspired a UV design. Unfortunately, I'm unable to show you the video. Never mind. Then, uh, then moving from uh, underwater systems to subsea system. So we go for a typical marine riser. Marine riser is a block body and the block body always sheds, sheds vortices. The CFD model was first validated using smoke tests in a wind tunnel. And we see that the CFD model has been able to give some uh, good uh, and encouraging results. Uh, so the first colorful thing is the CFD results. The second part, which is uh, mostly dominant in green, black and green, is a smoke test uh, picture. And we see that the angle of uh, separation and the uh, length at which the vortices are shed are more or less the same, uh, you know, validating the CFD model. So uh, So this is how a typically a riser related problem is formulated. It is a, a, a spring mass system with a damper. Will this video be played? There's some incompatibility issue. It still plays on my laptop, I don't know why. Okay, so uh, this video would have shown you the galloping of the riser because of two-wave FSI. The galloping of the riser was brought about by a code UDF, which gives it a freedom in both uh, X and Y directions. So finally, when we are able to uh, do such simulations where we can understand uh, the uh, motions of a riser, we will uh, also be able to understand the shedding patterns which would also give us the trajectory of the riser in uh, a locked-in condition, that is a resonance condition. And from all these things, we, uh, we get a lot of insights into harnessing the vortex-induced vibrations. So when we are able to harness the vortex-induced vibrations, 
we come across a product called as a hydro vortex power generator. If you look at the subsea system in the petroleum industry, the motions of the risers are not permitted. But it's very difficult to arrest their motions because of the vortex shedding as it's a bluff body. So if you put it, if you look at it the other way, if you want to harness these motions, it gives rise to a mechanism as shown here, where the bluff body goes up and down. When the bluff body goes up and down, the translationary motions are converted into rotatory motions and the shaft is made to rotate in an electromagnetic field and we have electricity. So this is a very clean energy source, which you know, prevents to a greater extent the building of dams and this gives uh, power with minimal current speed of, of the order of 0.5 meters per second to 1.2 meters per second. And uh, uh, if you use proper paints, you can improve their longevity. And Im most importantly, they are eco-friendly. So this is a project under development, which is uh, being uh, envisaged, uh, which is envisaged at having an array of such things on the ocean bed to uh, get some standard to get power on a standalone unit that can uh, give a you know a kind of a standby battery to a ship. Then, then we move on to the simulation based designs and offshore systems. In offshore systems, if you look at an FPSO, seventy percent of the load is coming from a uh, wave and current and wave and current loading. So wave and current are being simulated uh, as shown in this picture. You can see uh, the wave uh, going past an FPSO. And it also results in green water shipping load. And all these loads go as an input in the finite emit analysis that gives the uh, uh, stress distribution on the top side facilitating. Then we also have uh, uh, more uh, uh, offshore uh, legs are uh, cylindrical in shape. So we have such cylindrical structures here. So cylindrical structures are encountered by waves depending on the cylindrical structure size. We can either use a Morrison's approach, a fruit kill up theory or a diffraction theory, but CFD takes care of everything without being partial about the theory, but you can definitely check your answers with the right theory depending upon the flow regime. And such loads help you uh, find out the uh, mode shapes or the modal analysis. And from all these uh, simulations based design, we go a little advanced. What is the bigger picture? The bigger picture is to have a digital twin of the system you have, whether it's a surface system, a subsurface system, um, or a underwater system, or an offshore system. It, if it has a digital twin during its inception stage, uh, it will the system will have better operational efficiency and better performance. So the process of a digital twin is simple. It works between two models. One is a simulation model, which we discussed just now, and then is a smart ship model. A smart ship model always take, takes data from the sensors and it gives the input to the bridge. And from the bridge, the master uh, takes care of all the corrections. But here, the smart ship model is coupled to a simulation model. So all the output that's coming from a sensor is directly going into a design and the design becomes more and more evolved so that the realistic conditions at sea is taken care of into a digital model and we have exactly the digital i mean a twin in digital sense of a physical system so that is where we are advancing to by uh, from a simulation from just a simulation in design simulation based design simulation driven design to a digital twin. So this is how a digital twin typically works. You have your virtual space on one side, you have your physical space on one side. From your virtual uh, space, you have, uh, from your uh, physical space, you have some data going onto your virtual space. Virtual space makes the corrections in the design, gives the performance estimates and gives decisions to the physical space. So this can be done in two phases. One is in the design stage and another one is in the post design stage. So in the design stage, you get data from, a, uh, you get historical data or from other databases, but in real time, you get data from the sensors at the site. Depending on this, what are the different decisions we make from a digital twin? We make a decision on routing, we make a decision on operational speeds, hull cleaning, painting, engine health, 
recovery of waste heat renewable energy sources whether we should go for a renewable energy source or we can still continue with the um, fuel we have been using whether we should go for a hybrid mode of propulsion whether the ship has to go for a decommissioning so these are the different decisions we go get immediately without much hassles when we have a digital twin so so beyond predictions we have something more to achieve so we revisit the philosophy of predictions through simulations so we have to always identify the needs why should we do simulations why should we enhance the designs these needs have to be identified with the society and environment then we do the calculation of wave loads and moments on the hull then we do the predictions of vessel motion stability and whatever is required then we go to the next input uh, to the hull optimization and when we integrate such modules we get the digital twin the philosophy doesn't end here so when we identify ourselves with the society we identify ourselves with the coastal communities because there are many rules for shipping related pollutions in the ocean the discharge of the uh, discharge from the ships in the ocean but we have not addressed much about the coastal communities who are the most vulnerable communities to this pollution they are they are affected by all kinds of shipping pollution so the problem has to be identified with them and one such problem we identified is the ballast water and the invasive species which was extensively talked about in yesterday session by my uh, colleague and scholar mr avinash godi so the next one is the oil spill and pollution so in order to address the ballast free and the invasive species we have taken up extensive research on ballast free ships and for addressing the oil spill and pollution we have taken up extensive research on safe maneuvering in shallow water with waves so now we have a lot of designs coming from simulations and uh, now it's time to understand what's innovative and what's sustainable so for accommodating our designs for the future generation ships because the future generation ships comes from the demands from the shipping industry we are going with green technologies we are going with uh, all these kind of new equipments going on board ca carbon capturing techniques energy saving devices sensors all these are now becoming part and parcel of the ship's uh, design which is different from the conventional design and of course they are innovative in nature but the question is how many of them are sustainable so we have to understand what is sustainable design sustainable design has to cater to the society society in terms of safety security health work conditions and employment it has to cater to economy because the opex cost cannot be greater than the capex cost so we have to look at the quality uh, and energy efficiency or exi di cii and all those then the environment the pollution emissions wastewater management or waste treatment and the biodiversity so we can say that all sustainable solutions are innovative but not all innovative solutions are sustainable we have to make a judicial choice uh, to keep our solutions sustainable something very useful for the future generations so on my concluding a note i would like to say that cfd simulations have uh, already proved their efficacy in bringing the cumbersome model testing task to the desk the insights obtained from the cfd simulations give a lot of insights and inputs to the early design design optimization which we call as the simulation based design and uh, the revolution in uh, digital computing cloud based storage have helped us move uh, do more and more uh, numerical experiments nevertheless they have not yet reached a stage where they can completely replace experiments experiments are supposed to be still the most trusted and genuine way of questioning the nature and uh, with careful integration of uh, simulation based design and simulation de driven design we can come to digital threads and digital twins and we all know that digitalization will be the next generation standardization in industry 4.0 thank you
um, thank you so much for this opportunity. Any questions? I'm sorry. Uh, you have some questions. I would like to answer them. For the ship at the air water interface, you showed boundary conditions. And the boundary conditions at top, you mentioned are what? So air water interface, we don't have a boundary condition. So we just use a method to capture the air water interface, which is called as the volume of fluid method. So what's the boundary condition on the top? At the your... top, that is uh, at the opening where, you know, the air boundary is there, where we have the pressure opening conditions. Uh, yeah. In... What package did you, is it called pressure opening? And answers uh, CFX. Okay. Any okay. package, it comes with two options. Both the conditions go well. It ultimately during the iterations, it's correct. It not usually corrects. You can go for a pressure opening or you can go for a free slip. Uh -huh. Uh, at the outlet, we have pressure outlet, but at the top... That's pressure outlet. Pressure opening means it is open to the environment. It's You have the atmospheric air acting there. So, so what is CFX that? prominently uses this uh, boundary condition. Okay. What does it translate to in terms of velocity and pressure? You have the atmospheric pressure constant there, sir, at the free surface. Okay. So it takes a pressure value rather than computing a pressure value. Any more? So, am I done? So, ma'am, there's a question from the online. Okay. That's a question from an online audience. Kindly unmute the. Hello. Yeah, am I audible? Hello, I'm sir. Audible. You're ahead. Yes, sir. Ma'am, uh, the system, you know, uh, it's very good, but the, my concern is uh, how about the adaptation part, ma'am? Like because we know that when it comes to adaptation of the new technologies, it's the biggest challenge. So uh, how do you see it on that concern? I didn't get you. Are you speaking about the electrification? I'm speaking of the adaptation, adaptation of the new technologies that are coming up. Like, you know, how you have shown it, like, you know, if we go to like different sort of simulation and everything, but whether the uh, industry is ready to adopt all those technologies, you mean the future technologies which I've spoken during the uh, ending right, part right, of my presentation? Right, ma'am. Yes. The future technologies are not what we decide, sir. They are the demands from the maritime industry. Because uh, we speak about the green uh, uh, shipping and, uh, uh, you know, carbonless, zero carbon targets of 2050, COP 26, 27. All these come with certain requirements. And that is what make us, uh, you know, slightly revamp our designs. If we have to put a carbon, a carbon capturing technique uh, or a carbon capturing uh, uh, tank or something on board, there are so many stability calculations that go into it. That's what I was trying to say. So after all these, if this uh, new design is not sustainable, uh, we have not made, uh, we have not done any good to ourselves. So I, that's what I'm saying. We have not. We are not just looking into innovation. We are also looking into sustainability. Did I make myself clear, sir? Yes, that is clear. But my my question was like you know when we speak about the Indian market also, like we have seen that you know when it comes to new technology and especially when it comes to you know uh, the uh, the ship industry, uh, they don't move fast in transforming themselves. We have seen it from last twenty years. Also, it's like there has been there has been a transformation, but it's very slow. And uh, we are not just speaking today about the conservation and uh, everything. It's long time we have been speaking about it. Cop and all. Yes, we agree that it's coming up now in front. But uh, but it uh, but in the industry, these words have been utilized from last many years. 
but when it comes to the technology adaptation uh, to uh, to ensure the uh, good conservation of our ocean uh, the the work is very less we really need to understand so that's my concern like how 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 do we see the future out in that manner? and uh, whether you like you know whether you see it like you know, it's going to happen in the next two years five years ten years like if there is something in your mind please please do share Yes, shipping is a difficult to abate industry. We all accept that. And India is not a major shipbuilding industry. We should also accept that. But we did make a lot of strides in the recent past to go towards a greener future. So also there, uh, if you look at Maersk, it has already uh, started its liners with uh, um, uh, uh, green fuels, uh, uh, methanol. And uh, we also have uh, ammonia bunkers coming up. So we are making our strides, you know, uh, though not uh, bigger steps, we are definitely laying our baby steps towards a greener future. We have so many technologies, you know, people are speaking about, people are researching. That is where we have to make a judicial decision, how many of them are sustainable and they stay with us for the future. That is where we have to make a judicial choice. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes. So how does it, uh, have you done any prototype or how does it uh, work? We built a prototype and we try to harness uh, somewhere around um, 50, 50 watts of uh, electric power. It's a, it's a model and it's scalable. Uh, so it works on the principle of vortex induced vibration. So whenever uh, a slow moving current, that is a current with Reynolds number between 50 and 2000 in the laminar, uh, in the uh, transition region, not to the turbulent region, goes past a bluff body. The bluff body sheds alter alternate vortices and it creates a difference in the pressure, lift difference, and it starts galloping or oscillating. So we have tried to move this in a controlled fashion. We have made the bluff body move in a controlled fashion in some kind of a groove with uh, springs. And when it moves in a controlled fashion, it's it's totally a translatory motion. And we have tried to convert the translatory motions into rotatory motion, just like the mechanism that wo works in your car wiper. So this uh, uh, rotatory motion by means of shaft, it is further coupled to a generator that produces electricity. Yeah, yeah. my question was slightly different. Man. Uh I come from an offshore background. Like yeah. Designing steel catenaries for deep water. So we put uh, spirals on the catenaries to reduce the vibration. Yes. That that is that that I made a mention that yeah. when you look into a subsea system, an offshore production unit, you would not like to have these motions because that is very detrimental to your operations. So you put strakes. You put extra devices that, you know, just cuts the vortices away and the vortices do not get enough time to, you know, give this pressure difference. Yeah, and it, it reduces the motion. Yeah, it reduces the motion. That is what is required in an offshore industry. But if you look at the problem in a different perspective, if you have a bluff body and that is uh, uh, put in a flow and that is ready to gallop, yeah. make use of it in harnessing power, clean power. Yeah. So that is the I, I philosophy. Then analogy, for example, to reduce the motion, you are putting a damper, which is a spiral thing. Yeah. Yes. I do reduce the vibration. So if you put a uh, power uh, generating device onto that. Uh, no, no, no. I'm not talking. I'm not saying that I'm going to put the power generating device in the subsea system. There, I'm only trying to reduce motion. I use this philosophy or the physics somewhere else to produce electricity. Maybe on an ocean bed. Okay, okay, okay. It's not the I place. Uh, no, 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 no. I, I don't play with the petroleum. You know, I know it's inflammable. <laughs> because once it goes to the seabed, then there is no motion at all. You know, just... Yes, you, you have underwater currents and they are in the conducive range for uh, the vortex uh, related uh, power generation. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, ma'am, for the very interesting presentation. Thank you. Uh, I ha uh, we had uh, I had some one or two queries on the um, the slide that we, unfortunately unfortunately we could not view the uh, videos. 
Uh, but uh, I, I don't know what went yeah, wrong. Yeah. They were playing very well when I sent you. They are JIP files, that yeah. too. Uh, so, ma'am, uh, I just wanted to know about that, uh, the rigid cylinder, the fixed cylinder that you had shown. Yes. Uh, I mean, what is the, is it a rigid one or a flexible one that you have? It's shown? a rigid body. Okay. And it's a rigid body and um, uh, any rigid body would undergo, you know, uh, you know, uh, See, you, there are two ways of looking at it. If you are looking at the motions, you have to look at it at, at, at a rigid body. If you want to look into its vibration characteristics, you have to look at, at, uh, at it as a, from a strength of materials perspective. Uh, from a dynamics of body perspective, if you're looking at its motions and a strength of materials perspective and you're looking at it into its vibrations. Here we do uh, the rigid body dynamics we are not looking into the microscopic level of vibrations. We are looking only into the modal changes, simple, the eigenvalue problem of a simple spring mass system. Uh, yeah, ma'am, I didn't mean that uh, flexibility. I meant the uh, material, material of the uh, the cylinder that is used. It's it's steel. Steel, okay. Yeah. If it, is, it was a flexible one, like there will be swaying motions. So how well can we predict that in a numerical modeling? No, we, we try to replicate uh, the leg of an offshore structure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And leg of an offshore structure are typically made of steel. Yeah. For steel st tubular structures, it's it typically rep represents the tubular leg of an offshore yeah, okay. structure. Okay. So if it's uh, flexible, uh, the uh, it would go, the model analysis, the shape represented there would have been different. Yeah, uh, we cannot view the video. Uh, and then, uh, the and, uh, yeah, that is one aspect. The other one was about uh, the uh, the second example that you showed. That was, uh, I think, which is the one? Uh, Can I go back to these yeah, slides, please? Ah, the biomimicking, the biomimicking of the, the, that also the video, uh, because we cannot see the, uh, how, how is the tail beat frequency of the, uh, I mean, like that characteristic, we could not. Uh, the frequency so, of yeah. the tail, you know, it was just borrowed from a shark, how the shark wags its tail for a no, given no. Yeah. speed for attaining, see the, the, the way it, uh, uh, oscillates its tail and the, uh, thrust it's obtained. It's a, uh, they are interrelated. So. Uh, every thrust comes with a propelling speed, a forward speed. So all these calculations have gone in the background to give a frequency to the tail. And the tail motion was incorporated as a user-defined function in the ANSYS module. Oh, okay. okay. As a user-defined function. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Am I done? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, ma'am, for the insightful talk. Uh, 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 dear participants, the tea has been arranged in the front entrance area, but since we are running out of time, it will be a working tea break, uh, and we'll be continuing with the next uh, with the uh, technical sessions immediately. Uh, those of you who want to have tea can. Go quickly and come, but we'll start with the sessions. Handing over to Jessna. Now let's start the paper presentations. We have a total of six presentations. To attention of participants and chairs, the total time allotted for each presentation is 12 minutes, followed by a three minute question and answer section. We will ring a buzzer after 12 minutes to end the presentation. We will distribute the presentation certificate at the end of the session. Our first paper is on the topic Investigating turbulence model to ship prediction air wake using numerical simulations presented by Dr. Joseph Prabhu from Indian Register of Shipping. The co-authors of the paper are Kalyanam Shanmugat Srinivas, Ram Kumar Joga, and Sharad Dawalika.
yeah just one announcement bro yeah uh, one more announcement um, we have best paper award uh, at the validatory function for each session we have best paper award so please wait till validatory function and uh, the other thing is that uh, uh, after 10 minutes we'll put one uh, bell then uh, 12 minutes the last one okay, okay. okay. please try to finish mm-hmm. it thank you okay good evening to all so my myself dr joseph prabhu i am working in department of hydrodynamics and multi multiphysics indian register of shipping so my paper is titled as investigation of investigation of turbulence model to predict ship air wake resistance using numerical simulations so now my co-authors are uh, k srinivas ram kumar and sharath so what is the importance of this air wake Uh, study normally this air wake study is carried out on naval vessels naval vessels actually in order to we need to capture the hollow deck air wake very precisely for the safe landing of the aircrafts on the hollow deck so we all know actually that landing of a aircraft in the hollow deck area is still a tedious process for the pilots so we need to know the regions where flow in the slide you can see the there is a flow pressure zone as the hangar stands as a bluff body so there is a separation zone so that may pull the aircraft and aircraft the pilot need to be prepared for that okay so we can see another aspect of this air wake study is the plume reentry the plume exhaust from the plume has to be dispersed safely to the wake else some re- some due to the bluff body seen here it will be recirculated and again it goes to the intake so that is the bad and that will be reduce the efficiency of our engine so that need to be avoided by air wake study we can uh, do some an- analysis and we can place the funnel height or some alternative we can find it to avoid the intake uh, gt intakes then the typical sole diagram so preparation of this sole diagram um, initial stage cfd can uh, make an uh, initial approximate so each aircraft uh, aircraft has its own uh, sole characteristics so we can see in the each heading wind uh, wind limits are given so in forward it can go i can handle up to 50 knots but when it comes to the 10 15 and other aft it can land at only 10 to 15 knots so this initial stage cfd can uh, predict using this sole diagram cfd can read which weather is suitable for which aircraft to land and the t- pilot can take a call according to it so this is another thing animate anemometer location so in aircraft vessels so there will be a, so how we can find a, a location where we can keep oh, i think animation is went wrong so which location will be suitable to get the catch the exact free stream and any deviation in the free stream can be modeled so this polar chart can be seen it particular r0 uh, g stands for green and r stands for red so in r0 heading means so flow is from the ahead so we will be our anemometer will not uh, will be capturing very precisely but if the wind is from other angles it may uh, reduce the accuracy so for that we need to place the alternative anemometer to capture the if the wind is from the aft and other directions so let's come to the the my as my presentation is on investigation of the turbulence various turbulence models on to affect on the air wake study so this is the basic computational fluid dynamics model so already dr shijay has talked much on cfd so i am not wasting much time on this so normally the governing equations navier stokes equation will be solved in a discretized domain and we will be using computer it's a set of numerical equations and that can be solved using some computer programmings and that program is can be in the form of commercial software or and some open source software uh, open source form also can be used and computational resources how based on availability parallel computing and gpu techniques how we can fast then we can see the i am here i am talking about uh, four turbulence models actually one equation and two equation models so we can see the um, k omega and k omega sst and i will be talking about uh, rst and uh, spallatellams that is the one equation model so k epsilon model 
is a two equation model that will solve all the uh, governing equations into a two equation form that is turbulent and uh, kinetic energy and turbulent distribution rate and it will solve the two equation form so it is k epsilon is good for capturing the far field effect good but it may miss in some cases it may fix at the near field boundary layer so if uh, we can if cos mass y plus is greater than 30 we can um, uh, if we are much about about the far field effect, then we can go for k epsilon. And k omega SST is the most uh, randomly um, often used, maybe the best were used for this uh, ship and uh, airway analysis. So it's a combination of k omega and SST. Um, k omega, k epsilon, and k omega is the k omega SST model. So wherever k omega is good in capturing the near field boundary layer, so it combines in the near for boundary layer it will solve for k omega and far field it will solve k epsilon that's got the sst model then regarding the Reynolds stress transfer it directly solves the governing and uh, never stokes equation so it's by the it's uh, very computationally expensive as compared to the other two models so whenever we need more accuracy and more precise uh, the rest, then we will be doing this Reynolds stress like uh, uh, flow through in biological problems they may be uh, using Reynolds stress in flow through veins and arts and all those things Reynolds stress transport maybe can be used then spalat elements is very quick solution it will be given as it is solving only one equations it, um, and it is um, capable of catching separated and uh, um, many uh, separated flows and it may fail in recirculation rotation at high strain rate so whenever recirculation zones we need to capture precisely, we can't go for this. Then my present study, I have uh, taken this uh, SFS2, simple frigate uh, ship model. This is famous for the airway studies. Already uh, model test have been carried out for this. And, and it is designed in such a way, so many bluffs bodies are created. And because of that, what is the effect in the flow can be learned. So, I have taken this model and one is 200 model scale we prepared and dimensions are given here. So it's normal procedure meshing. I took in the domain as per ITTC guidelines, then the refinement zones. So you can see the R5 refinement. It is um, as we are my main concentration in the halo deck area. So more refinement is finer grid is prepared in the halo deck zone. Then mesh refinement study. Then I am in order to catch up the boundary layer very precisely. The prism layers are prepared. Eight prism layers are prepared, and these are the three types of mesh study can be carried out and checked with the uh, barrel um, uh, resistance, air air resistance, and this is the my O plus. So we can see the. Various, I, the, I made a cut section in the mid section and we can see the flow visualization of the various models. So you can see in K Omega SS team, it was capturing the boundary layer effect that we are missing here. It's almost everything averaged out and it is giving a smooth swing the K epsilon. But if you see in, again, if you see the RSST in the far field wake is almost captured well. That things in SA, BSA and K Omega, we can find it as smoothly averaged out then it is the cut plane of the deck level we are cutting and showing this so we can same similar same thing with this far field wake you can see it is almost averaging out but the turbulence is very well captured in k omega ssd and rss rssd is more well captured but it's computationally more SS expensive like four times more expensive than k omega ssd so main focus is our separation length for the preparation of shoal diagram and the landing capability. So the separation length is computed for various uh, models is shown here. So we can see K omega SST and I am compared with the experiment results of the um, compared with SFS2. You can see K omega SST almost uh, is very close to the experiment result and the other models are more overestimating the overestimating the separation length. So for validation purpose, um, I placed few velocity probes in the mid of the halo deck. 
and uh, 10 11 probes i will be placing in this thing and velocity and recording the all the three commands of velocity and that will be compared in this chart you can see the u common and v common and, and w common and is compared here so all the models are more or less well established in case of the velocity components it is well capturing the things except some models in sa may going out and u common and all the models are very good capturing but in case of separation length i feel like k omega ssd is the best so this is the study and unsteady part so we are done two types of simulation to check what is the difference between unsteady and steady so steady we can save computational time so steady simulation is sufficient for do the airway analysis it's more or less uh, giving the same results but we can go for steady state simulations and the physical computation time is given in the chart you can see here the Reynolds stress transport is giving consuming more time com at computational time than k omega sst and k epsilon model and obviously the spalot results we need on so the key conclusions so as discussed earlier so all turbulence models are um, good in capturing the model but only k epsilon is the flow fixation are captured well so the flow physics near wall and flow separation are best captured in rst followed by k omega sst but computationally rs is rst is more expensive and the flow separation length is almost half length of the flight leg while the k omega ssd is predicting the closest value to the experiment in the predicting the separation length so as the industry the flow physics of the flight deck and the study of the separation length then the steady state simulation can be ut utilized that are computationally cheaper while compromising and accuracy if the industry is to capture what is precisely unsteady stimulation needs to be carried out these are a few references thank you Any questions from the audience? The runtime was 3.33 hours for both the K Omega and the K Epsilon. Yeah. Exactly the same. Was the mesh the same? Um, same mesh. Everything run in same mesh. I see. And what was Y wall plus? Y wall plus is maintained as less than one. And you run K epsilon on that. Yeah. I see. K mega SST and K epsilon. Yeah. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. yeah. For K epsilon, I we need more Y plus. For courses, mesh can be solved in K epsilon. Yeah. Then it may take lesser time. Lesser time. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what's the Reynolds number? What's the speed of the ship? Speed of uh, Reynolds think, number? Yeah. Reynolds in number water? is 10 to the power 6. This is the air wake. Actually, air is the thing. Inflow. Okay. So 20 knots is the inflow air inflow is given yeah. so what's more important your water reynolds number or the air reynolds number no what i can't get it uh, which reynolds number is important in this uh, is air based reynolds number important important air uh, yeah yeah viscosity in air is different from viscosity in water yeah so so this is turbulent zone i am and it's Reynolds number is 10 to the power 5 so, no only air is considered yes. i will cut the hull in the water uh, water plane and we'll consider only air no air water interface is carried out here okay okay thanks as the model test is carried out in the same way we carried the same I have a quick question yeah. for you. See, this uh, is a normal deck. Yeah. With a rising platforms here and there. Yeah, bluff bodies. Uh. It's it's it doesn't constitute essentially to a bluff body because every ship is like that. So when you look at the hydrodynamic uh, forces uh. or the hydrodynamic uh, pressures, uh, you know, water is thousand times more denser okay. than. Uh, and thousand yeah. times more viscous than air. 
So when you look at those magnitude of forces, how much do these contribute? What is the purpose of carrying out this? Yeah, that is nice. Actually, I am not calculating air resistance or this thing. So my main intention is to the halo deck, what is the circulation happening? As for the aircraft is landing, the circulation, air circulation will play the major role while the pilot need to take a call. So which portion he need to land and that thing. So that's the purpose of doing this air well calculation. So this is not, not carried out for commercial vessels. It's for, for naval vessels. It a lot depends on the wind direction, right? Uh, it depends on the wind. So if and the, how much is that predictable? In the sense, predictable in the sense? See, the wind direction is not uh, something, see, uh, when you are doing a simulation, there should be certain things under your control, the direction of flow. Yeah. But when you are looking into uh, the air circulation that is coming as a resultant of wind, yeah. Um, how will you predict that? Yeah, based on this uh, shoal diagram, I beginning I showed the SO okay. shoal diagram. So Just that need to be prepared. Some, uh, yeah, it's but, all heading simulation need to carry it out. Forecast models? No, not forecast model. So it the simulation to be carried out for the, all the 360 degrees and the shoal diagrams need to be prepared based on that. Okay. Okay. You have some kind of a, a mathematical thing. 20 knots. This is the relative speed I am talking about. Relative speed. Um, all the three will do be as in the simulation as turbulent model is concerned we consider as only four right and in real case we will be doing all the 360 degree we will be giving the inflow in all the 360 degrees and we will be checking out so which heading is different uh, vulnerable for the landing science journal which uh, looks at the airflow in a uh, aircraft carrier yeah uh, and they got the split uh, superstructure you may find it interesting okay fine i'll look into it yeah vijay kumar and other authors okay any other questions okay then we'll go to the next one. okay thank you The next paper is on the topic computational modeling and analysis of ship responses to underwater explosions presented by Mr. Sachin Suryakant Avasri from Indian Register of Shipping. The co-author of the paper is Sharad S. Dawalika. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, myself, Sachin Osare, and I'm presenting a paper on computational modeling and analysis of ship response to underwater explosion. My co-author for this paper is Mr. Sharad Dawlikar. Uh, move on to the content of uh, my paper. I will start with the introduction, what the underwater explosion it is. Then it is followed by the theoretical background for uh, shockwave phenomena during the index. Then the general, uh, general rules to assess the uh, vessel when it is subjected to underwater explosion. Then numerical background. So in numerical background, uh, I will uh, focus mainly on the different types of solver and the hydro codes that are available. And uh, based on that, uh, we choose that CEL method and we uh, took the some sample uh, naval ship for the analysis. And in this, uh, we considered uh, the structure, uh, localized structure as shock phenomena is morally uh, is a localized phenomena so in this i will mention uh, i will uh, brief on the assumptions then simulation and afterwards the results followed by the conclusion so what is the underwater explosion generally underwater explosion is nothing but the explosion uh, with certain uh, mass and at a particular distance from the ship it gets explode 
and it involves mainly three parameters like uh, the formation of shock wave then its propagation and its third the its interaction with the ship structure and why we are uh, it is required to study the underwater explosion there are mainly aspect to uh, estimate the damage of the uh, uh, ship in case of naval ship then survivability of the naval vessel is important and the third one uh, is the integrity of na uh, naval competent ship if it is subjected to some localized uh, uh, phenomena of the index then underwater explosion is exp uh, examined by two perspectives one is detonation and propagation of shock wave which is localized phenomena the next one is formation and uh, pulsation of the gas bubbles it is morely related to whipping analysis due to the index and the uh, index can be uh, studied by two approach like first one is experimental study and another one is numerical as experimental study is bit uh, have negative Im impact on the environment so if we uh, optimize the uh, experimental study with the numerical study and then we can uh, save a lot of cost and negative impact on the uh, environment also as as a class we have two notation for this uh, underwater explosion the first one is uh, uwfe which is uh, for sh uh, shock assessment of the hull and next one is VP, uh, is due to the whipping assessment uh, which is formed due to the bubble uh, of the sh uh, this underwater explosion phenomena so objective of the paper is to uh, present a methodology uh, then uh, we use CEL method uh, for this and the localized structure from sample naval ship we have considered and uh, we have used Altair radio software for this and uh, in this we determine the threat level from uh, the rules that are specified by the IRS. The theoretical background, uh, if we see the index phenomena, it starts with detonation of the uh, detonator, which is highly uh, unstable uh, uh, explosive uh, product. Uh, if it is gets explored, then uh, the highly exothermic reaction it occurs, and due to this reaction, uh, the, uh, the gases are formed inside it, and do uh, this is the ma major force uh, to travel the uh, these gases uh, towards the boundary of the uh, explosive or the boundary of the water, and this uh, this get in this process first one the detonation wave is getting created, and it it's uh, from center when it's travel to the boundary the shock wave gets created. And and this shock wave, as it travels from this explosive to the uh, surface, uh, its velocity is uh, first of all it is supersonic velocity, and afterwards the velocity is equal to the velocity of sound in the water. If we measure some points uh, from the center of the, this explosive, the points near to the uh, explosives, uh, their peak pressures are uh, very much high, and as we measure away from this uh, explosive, uh, the rise of the pressure is a bit slow and uh, if you observe uh, the index phenomena in this mostly more than 50 percent of the energy uh, get converted into the uh, shock wave and about 45 percent is into the uh, bubble energy so from this two figure we can uh, uh, easily make out that this is a shock phenomena is a localized phenomena if we uh, consider then uh, generally the shock pressure is determined by this Coles formula, uh, which is dependent upon the weight and its uh, distance. Uh, and it follows the experimental uh, decay in it. So structure closer to the source experiment high pressure compared to the uh, uh, away from the explosive. So this necessitates the detailed analysis. So generally uh, the shock assessment is carried by some empirical formula. Uh, in this Taylor plate theory is there, then hull shock factor, some uh, uh, straightforward equations are there. Then threat level is uh, generally given by the naval authorities. And in absence of the, uh, this data, we have determined from the uh, rules that are mentioned in the uh, rule book. So numerical background, uh, actually there are uh, various ways to estimate this. Uh, the sum of the numerical solvers are CFD codes, then uh, DAA codes uh, pertaining to this uh, boundary element method then hydro codes in hydro codes uh, th there are uh, different types lagrangian eulerian cel and orbitary lagrangian uh, eulerian in this diagram uh, it is mentioned like uh, how uh, these four uh, hydro codes generally work so uh, in radios uh, we consider radios alter software for this and in this uh, we have um, 
estimated the context uh, with uh, the, some uh, empirical formulas uh, that that are mentioned and that mostly depends upon the uh, mesh size of the uh, fluid element as well as the mesh size of lagrangian element that is the uh, structural element and this context uh, uh, considers uh, the uh, structure as a master and slave as a fluid elements and the equation of states is used for, to define air and water domain and they, then jwl equation is used uh, to model the uh, explosive and this uh, the coefficients from this jwl are uh, changes with the type of explosion changes then numerical simulation of naval ship we considered uh, sample uh, naval ship uh, for this analysis and we followed the methodology as mentioned uh, uh, for the uh, uw fea notation that is mentioned in the irs uh, rule book so the type 18 contact from the uh, radios uh, we have used then modeling and uh, problem definition so this is the overall length of the ship that is 72 uh, meter and from this we considered the uh, localized structure uh, that is around 7.5 meter and this structure is uh, uh, mostly the machinery structure which contributes the normal uh, operation of the ship and this involves the discretization of uh, computational domain into air domain water domain and uh, uh, the ship structure in it so we use J law 51 from uh, radios and the outlet condition are modeled using non uh, non reflective boundary condition for air and water and uh, tnt is modeled with respect to uh, jwl equation of state and for the material structure uh, we considered uh, johnson's cook material model these are the properties for this uh, actually, this is the problem definition uh, for uh, simulation. On left side, you can see uh, I have considered the uh, air domain, water domain surrounding to the ship structure, and we simulated the symmetric boundary condition at the bottom of the uh, explosive. And on right side, you can uh, see the uh, structure that we have considered. And in this, around 40 lakh solid elements uh, are involved, and around 21,000 shale plus beam elements uh, we have considered. So assumptions coming to the assumption parts, the waterline at the vessel design draft is considered and wave are not modeled in this and only structural mass is considered. The no inertia effect from the internal tanks are considered for this and the TNT is considered as a cubical and we arrived at a, a TNT of 53 kg at a distance of 10 meter from uh, hull structure uh, can satisfy the requirement as mentioned in the IRS rule and no reflection from, boundary, uh, from boundaries are uh, there as no reflective uh, boundary condition are uh, considered. So simulation and validation for this uh, we have considered one paper uh, jaha so in this uh, the peak pressure uh, uh, for the explosive kept of uh, at a 1.2 uh, meter uh, with the weight 10 kg uh, in this the author has validated the result with experimental and they use the ansys atodyne for this and uh, we compared our results uh, uh, to their analysis and we found that our present uh, simulation is uh, the pressure at certain distance from the explosive it's a little bit higher but if you uh, see the trends the both trends are matching well so ansys satodyne and radios uh, it is following uh, means the results are uh, al uh, almost matching the only little bit uh, variation with the respect to coal's uh, formulation is there so we uh, same methodology uh, in this we consider total time duration about 9 milliseconds the shock wave arrives at uh, around 6.55 millisecond and uh, empirically determined value for uh, this threat level is 16.5 mpa uh, obtained by cole's formula initially uh, through our simulation uh, we uh, we got the peak pressure around 11 uh, mpa then we have carried out the sensitivity study and we found the pressure it's uh, around 17.1 mpa which is on higher side uh, uh, compared to the coles formula but it's followed the same strain uh, same trend that uh, we observed in the validation in this no fixity is applied for the structure then this is the results from our simulation. The left hand side, you can see the shock wave, how it stick to the uh, hull. And on right side, the actual deflection of the uh, uh, ship. 
we considered uh, two time dur uh, duration for this when uh, first one is shock wave when it stuck to the uh, hull so there it is observed that the stress uh, is uh, below yield stress that is yield stress around 390 uh, uh, mpa and uh, but uh, we observed that the stress uh, getting exceeded at the frames uh, below the uh, hull and uh, that is uh, around 419 but it's less than the uts of the uh, material this one plot is at when the actual the uh, shock wave gets uh, diminished and here also the same uh, trend is observed that bottom plating is safe uh, for particular threat level. Then conclusion, the threat level is determined by a numerical uh, <clears throat> is calculated by the formulation and validated with numerical results and we uh, use CEL approach for this and the guideline as mentioned in the IRS, IR class rule that we have followed with uh, UW uh, for the UWFE notation and the threat level is determined by considering the allowable plate thickness up to two times the plate thickness and we have validated results with uh, public uh, publi published uh, paper then assessment of uh, the bottom hull and uh, some of the uh, structure are considered in this deflection and one mass stress we uh, typically calculated the mitigation uh, could be the uh, eye type baffle we can use with double layer structure in this but for naval vessel it's a bit difficult then uh, we can think of uh, v type baffle uh, and the presented methodology holds promise for assessing the ship structure in the underwater uh, simulation and subsequently determine the threat level for the naval authorities thank you Yeah, it's a, a good attempt that you are trying to do the underwater explosion. Uh, you mentioned about, uh, just go to your, can you go to your previous slide? Yeah, just last slide. Which results were? No, the concluding. Conclusion. Yeah, results. Next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, Undex simulation is it a uh, CFD based uh, software package? Uh, it's uh, Alter Radios that we have used. Okay. So, have you done a mesh conversion study? Yeah, yeah. That's what uh, actually I mentioned now that previously uh, uh, for this particular analysis, we were getting uh, peak pressure al almost around 11 MPA. Then we have considered uh, means, uh, mesh sensitivity study and then that pressure gets uh, almost around 17 MPA, which is close to the uh, new, uh, sorry empirical formula. But here the main challenge is uh, to optimize the mesh because... Uh, yeah, if, fine. Okay, so you have done. Uh, my... Uh... I have only one question. Uh, in what condition there can be an underwater explosion? What is the need, motivation for doing this simulation? So if suppose vessel is moving, then uh, if, uh, in case of enemies and all that, it gets that... Uh, underwater uh, mines, you are concerned? Yeah, underwater mines. Or if it has already been there and if vessel is uh, moving in that particular... so. Uh, I don't know. I mean... Uh, Maybe it's uh, you have to consider the effect of uh, soil fluid interaction also if you are con considering the underwater mines. Uh, so it means you are talking uh, fluid structure yeah. interaction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Interfa to... interface will be there. Fluid structure interaction will be there if it's a underwater structure. I'm saying if the mine is behind, I mean below the soil level, underwater soil, then you have to consider the soil fluid interaction also. Uh, yeah, yeah, th that is there. But uh, here, actually, we considered it is like uh, it's some uh, uh, distance from the ship uh, bottom, so okay. we not considered that like it is in the soil. And for that, another, I think that approach might be different. And what's the major uh, results you got? What re major uh, results? I mean, is it uh, the work is still progressing, or you have some uh, concluding? Uh, no, it's kind of initial study, uh, and uh, we are looking forward for this next uh, that whipping assessment is there. That work is uh, also going on for this, and another like uh, validation or uh, kind of uh, other uh, validation in terms of other results. Also we are looking for this. Okay, thank you. Yeah.
on ground and since the gable ship uh, data might not be currently available so we have used the uh, general strip structure to take the analysis there. so that threat level was uh, not uh, like uh, provided or can be uh, so that's why we arrived at like threat level from the rules and yeah, Okay. Okay. Sachin, uh, that was a nice presentation, but I was just wondering at your assumptions, the first assumption you have, where you have completely neglected the waves. Yes. See, when there is a detonation happening, it's this enormous pressure energy released. When a pressure energy is released uh, in, in underwater, how does it manifest? It manifests as waves. So, so much of pressure energy is getting converted into kinetic energy. That means the water waves are traveling towards the ship with a very high velocity, just like in the case of a tsunami or something. Then how could you neglect the effect of waves here? Could you please justify? Uh, yeah, ma'am, that is, that is right. Like uh, that because tremendous... These space. waves, if I'm correct, would set the hull structure to enormous vibrations, which you perhaps you mentioned that's whipping. But uh, but that whipping that will become uh, after the this phenomenon basically. Yeah, but and out th that's okay. That's the uh, effect later. But the cause are the waves, and why are the waves neglected? Actually, we consider that uh, maximum pressure it is getting matched, so that uh, I think uh, we no think the wave in dynamic action does double the effect of a pressure. But the, that maybe uh, with this assumption alone, your results might be slightly underpredicted. So, just it's it's only a concern. You just think about it. Maybe yes. your software has some other way of dealing with it. But just think about it. It's my uh, concern. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. sure, ma'am. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Our next paper is on the topic Structural Engineering Challenges in MODU to MOPU Conversion Project presented by Mr. Thomas Stewart from R2 Tech Consultants Private Limited. The co-authors of the paper are Neetu Narayanan and Tomin Matthew. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, let me get straight into the subject. Uh, it is actually regarding uh, the conversion of an offshore asset. So this is a drilling unit into a production unit. So MODU, MODU stands for Mobile Offshore Drilling Unit, and MOPU stands for Mobile Offshore Production Unit. So we are converting a drilling unit to the production unit. So basically, the process involves removing all the drilling facilities from the MODU. And we add the production facilities onto the free deck area of a MODU. So the advantage of such projects is that uh, this works very well for the marginal fields. Uh, that means uh, if the oil is there for next five years or maximum seven or eight years, it is not sensible to install any fixed offshore asset there. So it is easy to convert an existing vessel into a production facility. And then we can deploy it here and it is mobile and you can take it out and install it somewhere else. So that's the advantage of uh, MOPU. Um, yeah, and it is quite cost effective compared to a fixed off installation. Uh, usually that is done for a 25 year or 30 year time period. But we do it only for the next five years, then MOPU is the ideal choice. So these are the challenges what we face generally in a conversion projects. Uh, we will discuss about each topic uh, in detail. So layout, weight control engineering, the environmental aspects, uh, the dynamic amplifications, soil conditions, and the nature of variable loads, uh, marine growth, global, the, the hull strength and the leg strength, and the jacking system capacities. So basically, uh, a three-legged, uh, uh, most of the designs 
for the mode exists in a form of three leg triangular shaped jacob so that is generally converted into mopu you can see these figures uh, so once the drilling unit is gone the entire area is packed up with all the process equipments in the right hand side picture so uh, why layout is important this is the most important thing in this conversion project uh, usually too many people uh, involved in such a conversion so generally the top side facility is given to one contractor and the marine scope is uh, handled by some other contractor so usually the layout is designed by the process process people and usually not in great discussion with the structural team so the layout is decided by the easiness of the process equipment or the process flow but generally it's not always seen like if it is is ideal choice for the structural stability of the vessels okay and then usually it happens that there there will be disagreement with the teams even within the same company so one will be handled by the process team and the, the, the structural team is less involved in the initial process uh, layout preparation so the cog is not controlled uh, initially at the stage of i mean start starting stage of the project so we'll we'll see how it affects the entire project so basically this is a, this is a mode you can see that you, you have a cantilever and drilling structure towards the aft of the structure we will remove that and we will add the all the production facilities uh, onto the free deck area but what we get after the removal of these equipments so in in our uh, analytical study you can consider that the, the drilling rig originally is designed for 100 meter water depth and uh, the the location where the mopu is going to be installed is also only 67 meters so initially we we feel that the the drilling rig is designed for 100 meters so it is ideal for 67 meter we are going to have any problems we are not going to have any problems that is initial assessment that uh, okay and we'll see whether that is a case so uh, the weight control engineering is the most important part of any any jackup project because uh, more than a floating vessel it is it is a structure that is standing on seabed and it is it has three points support generally so the cog is uh, very very important and ideally it should be at the centroid of these three legs so that it equally gets loaded so slight variation in that even one or two meters one of the legs will heavily will be heavily loaded and the environment comes from the opposite direction it is going to get loaded much more so uh, the problem with mopu is that it cannot shed any weights during the storm conditions so once a mopu is up there and you don't have much options to reduce the weight that is not the case with the drilling rigs whether you can reduce the uh, variable loads if the if, if a storm is predicted and uh, this is the one i have explained so ideal post of uh, cog should be the centroid of the legs and during a conversion project usually the cog is usually it tends to go aft because of the additional process equipment so what happens is that if it goes aft then on a later stage in the project you will need to add water in the front to get the cog to the right position and if it is shifted towards side also then you will be in much uh, you know bad position and you have to fill some other tanks in either starboard or port side so that will make these these waters added like it's not small quantity we have seen the projects like even 1000 tons of water, water added just to make the cog in the ideal location so that is not really uh, anticipated in the initial stage of the project once you add 1000 tons it is as good as adding uh like uh, 2000 tons in effect and all the system uh, the hull leg and the jacket system will get overloaded because of this so this initial design condition of a drilling rig will look something like this and you should understand that the drilling rigs are never designed for any particular location so it is supposed to operate any part of the world so before each deployment they will ensure that whether it is safe to operate there so they will they will design the drilling rigs based on some standard environmental condition that that will not correlate with any actual site conditions so they can assume 3 meter penetration penetration in the initial design as per the class rules so 100 knots wind uh, let's say 1 knot current uh, at the seabed and 0 knots current at sorry 1 knot current at the surface and 0 knot current at seabed 
and these are the conditions generally used in the initial design so when the when there is a mopu project and when we decide to convert a modu into mopu so we have an actual condition so basically the wind lord almost remains the same let us say uh, the way might you feel that it might be reduced a bit but the current values it could be as big as 3.6 knots compared to the one knot in the original designs so so in indian cost we generally use 3.6 knots for ngc projects for the uh, for the jacket design so that is almost like four times the speed average speed current so the the, the current current forces will become four times um, 16 times just because of that uh, if we are using the entire 100 meter water depth but here we have only 67 so there will be some reduction on that and the next point is the dynamic amplification so this comes from the wave loading so uh, as you know this usually we do the single degree of approach uh, so based on the incident wave and the structural natural frequency we will calculate the dynamic amplification forces on the structure and will uh, as per the class rules we have to apply the same loads to the wave load plus the current load that load combination we have to apply the dynamic amplification so basically if you see that the initial 15 seconds we have to consider for a drilling rig and we have calculated the natural frequency of the structure as around 8 seconds as a modu so the current study we have I mean, we have we have seen an increase in the weight around 1000 tons here so let's say yeah it's around 1000 1300 tons when it is converted to a mopu so because of the weight increase uh, there is a uh, you know natural frequency will shift up for upwards and the wave frequency reduces from 15 seconds to 13.5 seconds so basically the dynamic amplification will increase this this will directly imply that your wave and current load is going to increase a lot and then the fifth point is the site specific soil conditions so initially we have mentioned about this this particular site was only for 67 meter water depth which looks good uh, when we when we see that the drilling rig is actually designed for 100 meter water depth so what happens is that this is this particular mopo was going to an indonesian field where the soil conditions are very weak uh, which is as good as water uh, for the first 25 meters so the estimated penetration was up, uh, is maybe 10 or 12 meters they have anticipated but the, this became 36 meters after all the addition of weights and everything so it is designed for 100 meters then in effect actually it, uh, the mopu even the water depth is 67 uh, 67 meters the actual leg length utilization is 102 in that range 102 meters so that initial advantage what we envisage for 67 meter water depth is not there anymore okay and the variable loads so we have mentioned about this variable loads already so uh, the drilling rig has a peculiarity that it can uh, prepare for the storm i mean it can reduce the variable loads if the storm is anticipated but for the mopu uh, you cannot uh, reduce any weights during storm so uh, so there are, uh, if you really see the marine operation manual of a drilling rig they will specifically say that you know the uh, the variable loads uh, that should be kept as a minimum if a, if a storm is anticipated so where in the case of a mopu you don't have that uh, privilege to reduce that uh, variable load so again uh, the next uh, next point is the marine growth so usually for the drilling rigs we don't have to consider any marine growth because this is normally deployed for a short time for a six months one year so for each before each assignment they can clean the legs and uh, make it smooth so we don't have to consider any marine growth so in a mopu uh, the client will specifically say that you have to consider a marine growth of around 50 mm 100 mm or 150 mm so that based upon the project so once a marine growth is there then the actually the aerodynamic diameter is going to increase the load is going to increase also you have to use the uh, cd and cm values for the rough rough surface as per the morrison's equation so these things are going to increase the wave loading and the current loading at the same time so and the jacking system limitations this is the most important thing because uh, in a conversion project the jacking system capacity that you should not exceed at any point because uh, the jacking system application is not anticipated in any at any point of the project because that involves a lot of cost and uh, 
procuring a jacket system or uh, upgradation of a jacket system is a long lead item. So any Mopu conversion, conversion to a Mopu project, people don't uh, really uh, anticipate any 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 changes in the jacking system. So jacking system has capacities, different capacities during storm and different capacity for operation and different capacity at the time of jacking. So basically, uh, compared, compared only the storm capacities here. So that is not going to increase. So the weight, if, if the weight is increasing, you don't have any other choice than to abandon the project. So as per this, the, all the loads are going to increase both on the legs and the footings and the hull, you have to recheck all these things. Uh, one thing we have covered is the spot can, spot can loads that is almost increased by uh, around 15 to 20 percentage because of this. So, but this design are already done and you need a lot of modifications to make it strong. And that's uh, that's it. And the conclusions is that because of if you don't do a proper pre-purchase study and do the engineering, at least the basic engineering, uh, you will end up in a uh, disaster project and uh, you might end up abandoning the project in a future stage also. That's it. Thank you. So much of structural dynamics going into it. I, I would like to wonder what would be the typical value of the damping factor. Yeah, typical value. Uh, for a drilling rig, it'll, it'll, it'll be right 1.3, let us say 1.3 dynamic, yeah, dynamic amplification factor, which will be damping factor, oh. your epsilon, what you have represented with epsilon. Ah, that's 7% of that damping ratio you are talking about. Yeah. Yeah, that is as per the rules, we can consider 7%. Okay. Yeah. Uh, then what would be uh, ideally the uh, resonance uh, period or the frequency? What will be the range of the uh, resonance period or frequency? Yeah, that that again, it is around eight seconds. Uh, that is the resonance period we we get for a drilling rig. But you what what is typically the wave period in that location? Yeah, wave period we generally design it for the uh, you know the highest wave. So the initial design it's done always. Typically, what what 15, is going into your design? Fifteen seconds. Fifteen seconds. So it's not resonating. It's not resonating. Okay. Yeah. But in an actual case, uh, you see, I have uh, shown only one case. Let us say we have different cases like uh, different directional approach of the wave. Okay. In some approaches, the wave period may be only 10 seconds. Or in some operating condition, it will be maybe only 8.5 seconds. So when the wave height is low, it is resonating closely to the natural frequency. So it is kept well out of the range. Of uh, initial descent, yes. 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 It's a good practical challenge out in the field there, right? Yes. yes. So that by itself is a great work. Thank you. Sir. My one question, you are talking about the Modu and the Mopu. Yes. You showed the Modu in the elevated condition. Yes. Now, what about the operational condition of the Mopu? Is it also in the it's elevated also in the, condition? Oh, yeah. It's or the, is it in a part buoyant condition? No, no. It will be never be in a part, part buoyant condition. I see. Then uh, how does this uh, fouling go to 150 mm thickness? That is on the legs, not on the hull. But then the same legs are there for the modu and the modu. Yeah, that is what. That's what. Modu, we don't need to consider the fouling because it is generally deployed for a shorter period. Maybe for three months, six months. It will come up, come back after each assignment oh. and they will clean the uh, hull. I mean, we will clean the legs. So ideally, as per class also will not recommend. I mean, if we specify in our operation manual that we are going to clean the legs and in the actual operation, so they won't uh, impose this condition onto you to consider the marine growth. Okay. But in Mopu, it is going to stay there for five years or 10 years. You don't know. So it is generally uh, decided by the requirements of the client, like ONGC or we whoever operates the oil field. Okay. So that 150 mm or or there, there may be a variation oh. at the sea surface it is 150 and bottom it is 100 something like that and uh, a, th a third question your weight has gone up from 7000 to 8500 8, yes. or something yes now does it mean that the original legs are retained or do you have to consider strengthening of the legs yes yeah, sometimes we do have but we have to anticipate this in the initial stage the current pro project we have done this one, 
see generally i'm talking about the ballast weight so two projects i have seen that 1000 tons of ballast weight is added that comes due the during the course of the project not anticipated at the initial stage okay so whatever we could do uh, with the available weights we will do that i mean we can reduce the dynamic amplification by doing a time domain analysis and things like that yes. so we will go into the extensive analysis and where wherever possible we will optimize that hmm. if it is not possible we will have to go for strengthening okay. somehow yes so with all these weight changes have we also reckoned the uh hydrostatic uh, stability yeah yeah whenever the weight changes okay we are to that seems to be a very primary consideration uh, yeah but the, the requirements for the stability is not that stringent for a drilling rig because it is only torn only once once to the site and then back to the yard after the after 5 yeah, years or know, 6 that years. once is a very important yeah that, <laughs> yeah even if there is uh, some compromise on that the class will approve that one tow okay. because you can you can control i mean you can do that operation in a controlled environment only no? is usually one day one day travel to the site okay. is this an ongoing project or have you completed it i completed the project wonderful yes. great yeah, yeah. Thank, you. thank you thank you yeah i've seen you using morrison's equation for predicting the wave forces on yes. the legs yes have you checked the kuligan carpenter number uh yes i mean uh, uh -huh. this is particularly done uh, for offshore structures the standard practice not necessarily no. that's why i'm checking how much is your kulig and carpenter number no, I, i don't remember that for this project because no. uh, it it makes a lot of no. difference yes so you have to check your the i mean you have to properly ascertain the regime in which this flow is coming yeah, the but, wave structure interaction but, is coming uh, wave we cannot actually do for a, uh, this jacket legs it's a truss structure it's not a single uh, circular it, thing it could be jacket you ah. know for jacket you know d by l is less than 0.2 no doubt mm. but which regime it comes to that decides the entire the wave otherwise you know the wave forces could be underestimated no the wave forces uh, we estimate based on the morrison equation what whatever is the uh, morrison that's why i'm saying yes. morrison equation has to be judicially chosen Yes, it can't be used everywhere. It depends again on the Kulagan Carpenter number. Uh, but, I didn't see any description on that, so I was just wondering. Yeah, okay, but generally, uh, it's only so a suggestion. You yeah, need not agree. to worry about it. Yeah, you have to thoroughly check the regime because otherwise, experience. Um, I felt that you know there's a lot of difference coming in the wave force estimation. Morrison's equation it normally underestimates. Yeah, I agree, uh, but. see uh, the 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 design is generally governed by the class rules so they have it is not an experimental based on you have some written rules that yes, for this yes, you have to yes, use this yes, because despite the, the wave uh, uh, celerity and the other things yes yes okay yes any other questions next paper is on the topic tethering point estimation of positively buoyant underwater float presented by mr aravind dinesh p from np oil the co-authors of the paper are anshad hussain and anand p good evening everyone myself aravind dinesh p and i'm working as a jr of at npol drdo kochi and mr anshal sen anshal sen sir and anand sir are guiding me for this work so before moving on to the topic uh, i would like to uh, thank the coordinators of this uh, conference for giving me an opportunity to present here so moving on my topic is tethering point estimation of a possibly buoyant float so these are the outline of my uh, work so generally towed bodies are Uh, used for uh, uh, used for in situ measurements, defense and research applications. And the working depth of this uh, towed body is controlled using uh, speed uh, various parameters such as speed of the towing ship and pay payout length of the cable and the uh, the at angle of attack of the wing that is attached to the towed body. So, for example, if a body is uh, towed by a ship. If we increase the speed of the vessel, then the uh, 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 then the working depth of this towed body will get reduced. So, and also to achieve a particular 
to increase the working depth of a towed body at a particular towing speed, we can con mainly control three parameters. First, first is uh, by increasing the uh, payout length of the cable. So if we increase the payout length of the cable, it comes at a cost. It will increase the tension, cable tension, uh, near cable tension at the wind side. And next is we can change the hydrodynamic characteristics of the cable that we are used by using by attaching a additional attachment such as hard fairing. But this also comes at a cost. Like uh, it will increase the complexity of the handling system of the cable, and uh, and also it will be also difficult to. Uh, deploy and retrieve the system and next is uh, finally we can add depressor wing for increasing the working depth of the towed body and most of the stored bodies request to be in stable condition during its towing condition uh, during its towing configuration so uh, here i am analyzing such a body which is positively buoyant in nature and it is a part of a temperature measurement probe launching system so uh, as you can see in the figure it has two, mainly two subsystems, probe carrier lifting unit and a posterior buoyant float. So this probe carrier lifting unit has a temperature measurement probe inside it. And this probe carrier lifting unit is posterior buoyant in nature. And this will it will carry the temperature measurement probe to the surface. And once it reaches the surface, uh, once it reaches the sea surface, it will deploy the uh, temperature measurement probe using a... Uh, uh, using a spring actuated mechanism and once uh, this uh, probe comes in contact with the water it will start its measurement so these measurements are transferred to the parent vehicle through a cop wire copper wire so during this uh, and this copper wire will be connected to the posterior buoyant float and this posterior buoyant float is mechanically and electrically connected to the parent vehicle and uh, this will be uh, and this posterior buoyant float will be uh, towed during the entire operation of this uh, measurement phase. So, even if a small force acts on this copper wire, it will break. So, it is essential that this post chili buoyant float should remain its uh, horizontality, keep its horizontality while it, it's in a towing condition. So, and after once this measurement is, measurement is completed, uh, this tether cable will be severed from the uh, parent vehicle and this entire system will be disposed. So the end, the whole temperature measurement probe launching system is an expendable unit. So this is the uh, body of posterior buoyant float. It has a cylindrical chamber with a hemispherical dome at the front, and it has a conical shaped uh, skirt like structure at the rear side, which covers the uh, which uh, which will cover the spool on its rear side. And we are providing a wing on the a wing at its rear side so that it will it will keep its horizontality during its towing condition. So uh, what I have done here is I have studied the hydrodynamic characteristics of this body at different wing angles from 10 degree to 30 degree using CFD analysis, and I have analytically estimated the uh, tethering point end of this this body at different wing angles. Wing angles, okay. And I used ANSYS Fluent for uh, ANSYS Fluent for doing the CFD analysis. And uh, uh, I used uh, this is the domain I used for my analysis. And I used a uh, cylindrical domain whose axis is with, is coinciding with the axis of the float. And the this uh, analysis is, has been carried out at a six knot speed. Uh, this is the computational domain I have used for my analysis. As you can see, I used a fine mesh behind the body to capture the weight characteristics. And I also used prism layers over the uh, at near wall conditions uh, so to capture the velocity gradient. And uh, the lengthwise, lengthwise Reynolds number for this flow is uh, 1.1 into 10 raised to 6. So it comes under turbulent condition. So I used the SST K omega turbulent model for the analysis. And the flow is considered to be steady. And the working of this uh, working of, of this body is in sea water. So the density of the fluid is considered as 1025 kilogram per meter cube. And I used the no slip wall condition. And for all the cases, 
I use the uh, y plus near wall condition as less than phi. And I have also recorded the value of uh, pressure, pressure values at, at, the, at, at each node set coordinate, at each node and its coordinates for finding out the center of pressure of the body. So this is the uh, simulation result. I have summarized the simulation result in, in this table. So as the a wing angle is increased, the drag and lift forces acting on this body is increasing. And using these values, uh, using these values, I have calculated the tethering point of the body. So this is the free body diagram, uh, free body diagram of the posteriorly buoyant float. So I consider a static equilibrium condition. Here there are three unknowns, tension force, angle theta, and the tethering point, uh, location of the tethering point with respect to the reference point O. So uh, we get, here there are three unknowns and three equations. So if, by solving this, we can find out the location of the tethering point at uh, point, point for different wing angles. So uh, I summarize the uh, values that I got from analytical calculation in this table. So uh, as the wing, ang wing angle of the posteriorly buoyant float has increased, the tethering, tethering point was observed to be shifting away from the reference point O. And I have chosen 20 degree angle uh, for my uh, uh, for my body as a final like uh, it is big, uh, it will uh, it will help assist in actually cable routing. That's why I selected a 20 degree wing angle. And using this 20 degree wing angle body, I have numerically verified the model whether uh, this model have model is keeping its horizontality during its towing. So uh, for this, I used a uh, I have done a orc, uh, analysis in Orcaplex software, and I model this posteriorly buoyant body using a 6D buoy in Orcaplex software. And these are the table shows the characteristics, the geometrical parameters that I input into the software for modeling the body. And I used a tether cable of a, a tether cable having diameter 6 mm and 7 meter length for this analysis. And after carrying out the static analysis of the uh, static analysis in Orcoflex, I found the uh, static analysis at 6 knot speed. Uh, the tension at point A is found to be 10.93 Newton and this was matching with the values that I got from the analytical calculation with a deviation of 7.6 percentage. So as so a next step we are uh, planning uh, planning to experimentally validate this study. Uh, so the uh, float is under manufacturing currently. So these are the references I used for study. Thank you. Are there any questions? Sika, could you please show me the orientation of your wing angle, which you have gone up to 30 degrees? I hope you have used RANS for your simulation, right? Yeah. RANS yes. solver. Yes. So, what is the orientation? What do you call this wing angle? Could you please uh, show me properly? Uh, this one, man. The with respect to horizontal. Like so, the, that particular part, the uh, the wing, you have oriented at different angles. Oh uh, yeah. And uh, as far as my experience goes, thirty degrees is quite a big angle for rants. Okay. After fifteen degrees, there is considerable flow separation which is not normally captured by RANS. Okay. So 30 degrees sounds quite surprising okay. to me. So you please relook into it because it's okay. beyond the capabilities of RANS. Okay. Okay, madam. Um, that's it. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Since you said you have done the simulation, you are going to do the experiment. Yes. Where where would you do it? Uh, ex uh, mostly in NSTL. At NSTL. NSTL. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay.
Next paper is on the topic Catenary Analysis of Twin Line Toad Array System, presented by Mr. Mebin A. Abraham from NP Oil. The co author is S. Sendhil Rajan. Good evening all. I am Abit. I am JR of at NPOL. My topic is on catenary analysis of tin line toad array system and my co-author is Sri Sandil Rajan. Moving to the topic, you can see a schematic diagram of toad array system. Uh, toad array system is nothing but a system of uh, hydrophone toad uh, behind a surface ship or uh, submarine. It is used to capture acoustic signals uh, that's the, in that way we can uh, target uh, find out our target and all uh, it, it may be our passive or active type it can be used in uh, military and civilian application some of the application of uh, toad systems are in seismic exploration uh, fishing industries military uh, surveys and surveillance etc uh, the cable the array catenary and the payout uh, length are the uh, payout length are the two important parameters in uh, tow system uh, there are two uh, type of cables are used in uh, uh, tow array systems first is heavy tow cable and you can see this is the heavy tow cable and it is a negatively buoyant cable and it is used to uh, deploy the array at the specific depth. Uh, uh, so uh, we know that the see how uh, different layers, uh, different layers. Uh, so we can uh, play with the payout length and operate the our array system in different layers so that we can exploit ocean acoustic characteristics. And second type of cable is uh, this. Uh, Light cut, light tow cable, which can be used to increase the or maintain the horizontal distance from the rear side of the ship. It is uh, used because we can align our array systems far away from the ship so that the uh, noise produced by the ship can be uh, eliminated or the array could not pick the own ship noises. And these are the uh, these are the two type of uh, cables used in toad array system. And we usually use a tail rope at the end of the array system. The use of tail rope is uh, to give a axial pull to the array so that the array become straight. Uh, the thing is that the uh, horizontality of this array is very important in. Uh, dictating the target. If the array is on, uh, is a une if the array is in uneven style, then the there should be a uh, error in the signal detection and all. So, for maintaining the uh, horizontality of the array, it is very important in terms of toad array system. And uh, why tin toad array system? Uh, that the question. Uh, there are uh, uh, some. Uh, features for tin uh, toad array system. You can see this is a typical tin toad array system. There are uh, two array uh, formed. Uh, the advantage is that for tin array system, we can get better left, left right ambiguity. So the target detection uh, of this system is uh, very good. And uh, being the system is small in length, we can also this system in shallow waters. These are the two advantages of tin uh, type toad array system. And what is a catenary analysis? Catenary is the formation of uh, the array when it after the deployment of this uh, array system. It is the shape of the array formed after the deployment. I already said that the horizontality of the array is important because uh, if the array is in an uneven manner, then the signal detection is 
difficult or the error come on signal detection is there so we have to uh, find whether the array is in a horizontal manner or not so that's why catenary studies are done and also uh, after the catenary studies we can know the winds uh, tension the tension at the winds end so that we can determine our whether our winge system is able to capable to handle the uh, tin array system or not and uh, uh, for achieving the neutral buoyancy of the array uh, if we achieve the neutral buoyancy then it is assumed that uh, the uh, tor array become a horizontal uh, tor array will made a horizontality so uh, for maintaining the neutral buoyancy we first of all uh, uh, made the array by uh, estimating the weight of the uh, components used in the array the components used include different type of sensors shape uh, spaces filler materials and all so we account for the weight of the all the component used in the array and we can alter with the uh, housing spaces and filler material to make the uh, array neutrally buoyant and uh, uh, you can see the table which are the components specification of components used in our tin array system you can see the length diameter and weight per length of different uh, components used in uh, tin array system uh, i use uh, orcaflex software to uh, study the cat uh, to conduct the catenary studies and this is the model of tin array system in our orcaflex model you can see uh, uh, heavy tow cable, light tow cable, uh, he uh, heavy tow cables, uh, RS, uh, tail ropes, etc. In the Orcaflex, they are modeled at as finite line elements, and uh, you can see separators. Separators are uh, and connectors. Connectors is uh, from the connectors, the array is split into two lines, and the separators used to maintain the uh, horizontal distance between array and the end of and uh, uh, these type of uh, connectors and separators are modeled as 3d boys and these are the result i obtained from uh, orcaflex analysis uh, we run for uh, three payout lengths of uh, 25 meter 30 meter and 50 meter of uh, hdc you can see this is the HDC and this is the tail rope and this is the array. This is a uh, sim uh, that is an element in uh, tin array system. Uh, you can see it is inclined because it is, HDC is natively buoyant and uh, array is uh, somewhat near neutrally buoyant. So the that's why the, there is a straight line. It is less inclined because it is neutrally buoyant and uh, the tail rope used for our analysis tail rope in the system is uh, slightly positively buoyant that's why it is forming a inclination over here and you can say uh, we can see uh, for increase speed uh, the inclination of the array become less this is the inclination uh, uh, vertical distance from one end to other end is the inclination of array it become uh, less at higher speeds we can see that like that and this is the catenary of tin array system at uh, 30 meter payout of HTC. And this is the catenary of 50 at 50 meter payout of HTC. This is, this is the comparison of uh, catenaries of RS at uh, 25, 30, and 50 meter payout of HTC uh, for 2 and 6 knot speed. And uh, so summarizing the result in the table, we can uh, see the lo loads and uh, array inclination of array system uh, for 25, 30, and 50 meter payload payout of HDC. And it is estimated that the winds load increasing at the wind load will increase for the increasing speed. And uh, it is noted that the uh, array inclination become uh, same for 
different payload for same speed and uh, one uh, experimental trial for this uh, tin array is also conducted in the acoustic facilities at Kulamau. Uh, the trials carried out using 25 meter and 50 meter payout of HDC at, at uh, 5 knot speed and uh, it is observed that the uh, analysis result and uh, experimental results are uh, matching. There is a only 3% error for 25 uh, meter deployment of HDC and there is only 5% error in 50 meter of deployment of HDC. So uh, these are my conclusion. We uh, conducted catenary studies for uh, different uh, payout length and different speed. And uh, we also concluded that the inclination of acoustic section will remain the same for uh, different payload at same speed. And we also uh, obtained the analysis result and experiment results in a good correlation. These are the results. Thank you. Are there any questions? Can you please go to, go, go to the previous slide, 11? 11. Uh, um, can you please explain that uh, you see for 25 meter payload, payout, mm -hmm. uh, at six knots, you are getting 500, 558 Newton. And then double that payout, you are getting at 686. There's not a at two nodes, you are getting significant increase in the winch load. And at six nodes, you are... Uh, because uh, here, here it is making so much of drag. Creation of drag is there. Oh, because of the inclining. Incline, because it is so much inclined like this. And at the six node, uh, uh, because of the velocity, there is a uh, increase in load, but uh, here also there is significant uh, load on the wind because of this uh, the, this much inclination. Anybody else? No. Thank you. The next paper is on the topic Parametric Study of Hydrodynamic Drag on a Towed Body with Fin System, presented by Srimadhi Shijasi from Department of Ship Technology, Kusat. The co authors of the paper are Shraddha Hari, Manoj T. Isaac, and D.D. Ebenezer. Good evening, all. My talk is Title, Parametric Study of Hydrodynamic Drag on a Towed Body with Fins. And this work was uh, completed as a part of student project funded by KCST and it is gratefully acknowledged. And towed bodies are the underwater marine systems uh, which are used for conducting oceanographic surveys and they are towed behind ships or submarines. And uh, the analysis of these hydrodynamic uh, parameters are important for the stability and control of this towed body. Here, uh, this study focuses on uh, numerically investigating the hydrodynamic drag on the towed body with fins. And after that, the effect of the fin and the uh, nose is also studied. The base geometry is a frustum of a cone with a hemispherical nose and fins are attached on either side. And the main objective of this study is to determine the hydrodynamic characteristics of this towed body with and without fin. And after that, we will find the effect of nose and fin length. And the CFD analysis is carried out uh, using Star CCM Plus software. And the entire work can be divided into different stages. Towed body without fin is an axisymmetric body. So we will start the analysis of a simple axisymmetric body. Here, a sphere is selected. 
and after analyzing the toad body without fin and with fin case we will analyze the effect of the nose and the fin length before moving into detail uh, let me explain some terms i will be using throughout my presentation one is wa wall vipers here in star cecm the boundary layer is uh, provided with fine mesh using prism layers which are in geometric progression and the wall y plus is the normalized wall distance to the centroid of the wall adjacent layer since we are uh, interested in drag on the body so and it is depend on the wall shear stress and the pressure distribution on the body so we are using k omega sst turbulent model in conjunction with the low wall y plus treatment to solve this rans equation and the wall y plus is uh, kept less than one throughout the analysis for an axisymmetric body uh, it possesses an axis of symmetry and if the boundary conditions and all other parameters are symmetric about this axis and the flow is uh, along the axis of this body uh, we can use 2d axisymmetric time saving technique instead of using 3d simulations now verification and validation which is an essential part for any analysis for verification we will compare our result with the with the published numerical result and for validation we will compare our result with the experimental result when coming to 2d axisymmetric flow around the sphere a diameter of the sphere is 80 mm selector which is same as the nose diameter of the proposed toad body and the reynolds number of 1.14 e6 is selected since the results are available for this reynolds number to compare figure shows the domain and boundary conditions and the boundary conditions provided uh, like a inlet as velocity inlet outlet as pressure outlet and the domain provided with a slip wall condition and the body surface which is no slip condition and the ittc recommended value of uh, fresh water properties at 15 degrees celsius is taken for uh, for throughout the analysis and figure shows the uh, mesh detail here the high dense mesh is provided at the boundary layer region using uh, prism layers and the prism layer is provided which is uh, more than the boundary layer thickness and star system provides different mesh quality parameters such as skewness angle cell aspect ratio volume change face validity and chevron quality which are shake and these are uh, within the allowable limit then domain study is conducted to find the smallest domain which can capture accurately the flow effect and uh, here the 5d by 5d by 10d domain is selected and which is having a, a, a small error percentage of drag coefficient and and uh, the low ratio of uh, dip in the pressure in the uh, uh, near wall domain uh, near domain uh, sorry near domain and uh, the stagnation pressure and before moving into result analysis we we will check the wall wall y plus and it is uh, less than 1 and uh, the star cecm result for uh, drag coefficient which is uh, 1.96 percent sh which shows 1.96 percentage of error with the numerical results by constant sq and the figure shows uh, the pressure coefficient and the drag coefficient versus reynolds number plot and it can be seen that the star cecm result shows a uh, good agreement with the experimental result and the numerical result and we can conclude that good cfd practices are followed here and the same procedure can be used for further analysis when coming to uh, toad body analysis toad body without fin is an axisymmetric one so we can use the same technique that is 2d axisymmetric technique uh, for analyzing this toad body and these are the uh, mesh details and uh, the high density mesh is provided at the boundary layer region and the domain study is uh, conducted as in the previous case and 2l by 3l by 4l is uh, sufficient for the analysis and after analyzing the toad body without fin the fins are attached to the toad body and the catia v6 is used uh, to model this toad body since the toad body with fin is not an is not an axisymmetric so we have to do 3d simulation we have used a 3d domain and uh, the mesh details are shown here here uh, 14.85 million cells are generated and among this 12.15 million cells are in the prism layer region
and the domain study is here also conducted and find out 2l by 3l by 4l uh, domain is sufficient for the analysis and the mesh quality parameters specified by star system is also checked all are within the allowable limit and uncertainty due to uh, mesh is uh, calculated using Richardson extrapolation. Here, the wall adjacent layer thickness is selected as the representative cell length, and the convergence criteria sh uh, show that it is monotonic convergence. And the GCI index, uh, grid convergence index value of uh, 0.75 indicate that the mesh uh, the quality of the mesh is good. And the wall Y plus is checked and it is less than one for the uh, without fin and with fin case. And from the drag contribution details, it can be seen that uh, the fin contribute one percentage increase in the drag. Then a drag curve for different velocity plotted and the second, second order polynomial approximation, which is valid between minimum and maximum uh, velocity is shown in the slide. Uh, we can use this equation to find the drag between this uh, minimum and maximum velocity. And figure shows the pressure coefficient and skin friction coefficient plot for toad body with and without fin case. And the wall shear stress is maximum at, at the starting of the fin. And figure shows uh, this pressure condors and velocity condors. Here, uh, the maximum pressure occurs at the leading edge at which um, that was the th that is the stagnation point. And after analyzing the toad body without fin, we have to move move a parametric study. First, we will consider effect of the nose. Uh, here, the overall length, half diameter, and the angle of the frustum is kept constant, and the hemispherical nose is changed into prolate spheroid noses, uh, having different major and minor radius. And the domain, boundary conditions, and mesh details are same as that of the base geometry. And uh, the wall Y plus is kept less than 1. And when analyzing the uh, res result, can be seen that when prolate spheroid noses are used, it can reduce 1.3 percentage of drag. Can be seen that when the major radius increases, the pressure drag getting decreases. Because uh, the pressure drag depend on the blandness of the body at the fore and aft end. So prolate spheroid noses are uh, more streamlined than hemispherical nose. That's why the pressure drag getting decreases. Figure shows uh, the pressure coefficient plot for pressure coefficient and skin friction coefficient plot for different uh, nose geometries. And it can be seen that at the lead, leading edge, at the nose region, the wall wall shear stress get a decrease. And it is a uh, velocity condos for uh, different NOS geometries. And uh, it is the pressure condos for uh, different NOS geometries. And the maximum pressure occurs at the leading, leading edge. That is the stagnation point. And after analyzing the effect of the NOS, uh, we will move on to effect of fin length. Three fin lengths are cons considered 134, 140, and 147 mm. And the domain boundary condition and the mesh details are same that of the base geometry. And when analyzing this result, when the fin length increased, the pressure drag shows a slight, uh, slight, uh, slightly decreased, and the shear, shear drag uh, slightly increased. And, uh, but there is no any significant uh, effect on this drag. And figure shows this pressure coefficient plot and skin friction coefficient plot for uh, different uh, fi various fin length. And uh, the maximum wall shear stress is at the starting of the uh, fin. And it can be concluded that uh, the nose shape and uh, plus or minus 5 percentage change in the fin length will not have any significant effect on this drag. But however, 1 percentage reduction in drag is desirable when designing high endurance self-propelled AUV. So the lessons learned here can be uh, used for the analysis of other bodies. And these are my references. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? You were mentioning about uh, 
uh, in the boundary layer you were using uh, this star system plus is using uh, this uh, geometry progression yeah great so why geometry progression is used sir the prism layers are uh, uh, sir for boundary layer uh, means uh, boundary layers are uh, provided with fine mesh using prism layers this prism layers are used in star system to find that boundary layer and which are in geometric progression it's that we will give number of prism layers and we will give a growth rate for uh, aligning that um, prism layers on that region asking uh, what is the philosophy of it is in geometric progression any just a thought just you have have you thought in that direction why it is in geometric progression sir actually we are concentrate why, why we are giving a growth rate that means growth rate means it is the uh, in geometric progression only that growth rate will be there yes so why it will be like why it is uh, not ap or net or non other than any random variation why it is uh, sir actually uh, in meshing the most of the cells are concentrated on this uh, boundary layer if you provide uh, we, we are concentrating on the near wall region we are providing the prism layer which is more than the boundary layer thickness uh, if, when I, in actual practice uh, that much boundary layer we may not need so the near wall region we are uh, giving fine mesh and apart from uh, far away from that region we can use coarse mesh okay okay we will discuss later Have you determined the boundary layer? Yes, sir. Boundary layer thickness? Yes, sir. How did you determine? How? Actually, in white text, there is an equation for finding out the boundary layer region. In in where? White white textbook. White Go textbook. Okay. <laughs> so, what is that equation called? Sir. What is that equation Bound called? Sir, boundary layer equation. We have used for turbulent condition. Boundary layer equation, of course, in boundary layer theory, you have many equations to determine thickness. You have displacement thickness, momentum thickness, energy thickness. How do you determine the thickness of the boundary layer over a body, flat body? Flat body, we are, we are considering that length and we will find out. There is a name for that equation. Uh, have you come across that? Even I may, I use that in my presentation. Blasius equation. Yeah, Blasius equation. So. Why did you model beyond the boundary layer? Maybe my question is close to his. Why did you resolve the wall beyond the boundary layer? Was it not an additional computational effort? Sorry, uh, the uh, high density meshes we are providing on this boundary layer. And yes, but you know, there is an optimized way of providing a uh, fine mesh because even if you have the highest uh, computational resources, you have to use them judicially. That is the ethics of computation. So there is no point in resolving the boundary layer beyond a certain value. It can even lead to numerical instabilities. But I like the way you have done your work. It's very systematic. But now what I was uh, wondering is, I was looking to a, towards a climax, which I have not come across. You have uh, come, come with uh, optimum shape for the uh, nose. You see that prolates spheroids. Then you have an optimum length for the uh, fin. Uh, the fin. body, the middle length of the body. Of course, fin is your villain, it is adding to your drag. So have you tried these combinations and did you check whether that's giving you the minimum drag or not? Separately, this gives you minimum drag. Separately, that gives you a minimum drag. Did you put the combination and check whether the same drag re reduction was possible there? Yes, sir. Ma'am, we can check that maybe the future scope for your study. No, that was just one step away in your uh, uh, simulations, right? If you have done so much, that, that was one one result we were eagerly looking forward to. It's okay. Yes. But it was a very systematic study. Thanks. Anyone? Yeah. Thank you.
That concludes our session on computational methods in engineering. I would like to extend a big thanks to all the speakers for sharing their knowledge and insights with us. Uh, now, uh, I request the session chair, Dr. Shija J, to give away the participation, sorry, and the presentation certificates, the presentation certificates to the presenters. I invite Mr. Thomas Stephen to collect the participation uh, presentation certificate. Okay. Next, next, I invite Mr. Uh, uh, Sachin Suryakan Tavasare. Oh, you can collect it now. Yeah, you can. Ah, Parata. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll call him. Next, I invite Mr. Joseph Prabhu to collect the certificate. Uh, I don't know. Next, uh, Mr. Arvind Dinesh P. Uh, next, it's Mr. Mebin A. Abraham. Next, Srimati Shija C. Congratulations to each and every one of you. Okay. Now I invite Dr. D.D. Ebenezer to present a memento to Dr. Shija J as a token of our gratitude. Now I express our deep gratitude to our session chair and co-chair who made this session very delightful. Uh, I now hand over the uh, mic to Sh Shruti for the valedictory session. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to invite in our esteemed guest to the dais, um, our chief guest of the day, Dr. Ananta Subramanian, sir, retired professor from Ocean Engineering Department, IIT Madras, and presently he's the principal of Christ Knowledge City, Ernakulam. Next, I invite in our head of the department, Dr. Sadish Babu Piki, onto the dais. Next, I would like to invite in a professor and former HOD, Dr. Madhya Aragon, sir, onto the stage. Sir, please. Next, I would like to invite in the conveners of the Iconoi 23, Dr. Rajesh P. Nair, as well as Dr. Pavas TK onto the dais.
last but not the least i welcome the delegates it's a great pleasure that with a great pleasure we welcome onto the validatory ceremony of the technical conference i cannot i cannot 23 today marks the culmination of two days of our conference will filled with enlightenment learning and collaboration it's now time to recognize the outstanding contributions and accomplishments of our participants in our technical conference their dedication and hard work have truly set them apart so we are presenting them with an award for their exceptional research work that has pushed the boundaries of the innovation i invite madhya ragan sir to give away the certificates first in our a first session was of a materials and corrosion we have the best paper titled thermal analysis of underwater electronic enclosure presented by mr balaji rs from npoil drdo please come on to the stage so if you would remain the one the second session was on ship design and production and we have the best paper uh, title vulnerability assessment of a container vessel to second generation intact stability presented by mr anand ajit kumar from indian register of shipping thank you madhyan sir i request uh, dr ananta subramanian sir to give away the certificates sir please certificates sir our third session was water transportation system we have the best paper titled a numerical methodology for early stage estimation of a full scale resistance of day cruise boats in shallow water it was presented by lieutenant commander r kiran from iit karakpo uh, she was presenting online i would like uh, sony tl the co author to receive the award on his behalf Uh, now on to the fourth session of computational methods in engineering we have the best paper title investigating turbulence models to predict ship ship airwakes airwake using numerical simulation by joseph prabhu if he is present in the audience i would like him to no on his behalf ananta ji kumar will be receiving few words with us that we please yeah thank you uh, good evening everybody i just walked in like that here inspired by my old student at iit madras thomas stephen and therefore we came and i'm glad i came here because it's seeing a lot of old faces i am myself an old wine in the old bottle here okay for those of you who do not know me i was the first student of the first batch dr satish babu reminded me that's what i said last time okay anyway so it's nice it's good nostalgia to be back here and i am so happy that the department is slowly growing in strength a few days ago we saw the message that the hydrodynamic lab 
has begun to be created. Of course, there is a long way to go, but then any voyage has to begin with this first step. So I'm happy that there has been a concerted effort with the support of the industry, as I know, in creating this facility. And it's also important that so many of our uh, alumni, the industrial practitioners, the research on the Navy and uh, the Indian Register of Shipping, all of you have come forward to be a part of this uh, uh, conference, two-day conference. So it augurs well for the department to realize its strength and with an alumni spread all over the world and all doing quite successfully. So I do not want to take more time because it's nearing six o'clock and you must be tired after two days of attending the conference. Um, let me wish you all the best. Of course, for those who do not know me, I was at IIT Madras after graduating from here and started teaching here. I spent 40 years at IIT Madras teaching there. And now after retirement, I've come back here, settled in a place called Parampalli Turutu, that is Chendamangalam. So we have a home there. We have a small yacht, which we built there. And any of you are most welcome to come and spend time to cruise around in the Periyar or in the backwaters. Okay. I believe that we enjoy life. So by God's grace, children are doing well. We are here, me and my wife and doing well. That is just for a short introduction about myself. And so feel free, welcome. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I request the HOD to give away certificates to the co-chairs. Uh, this goes to Manoj, sir. Manoj TSX, sir. Now I request Hasina, ma'am, to receive the So I request our chief guest, Anantha Narayan, sir, to receive a memento on our behalf. Yes. Thank you, sir. I request HOD to share a few words with us to address the audience. Chief guest and uh, the most respected uh, Ananda Subramaniam, sir, the, who the first student and from the first batch, uh, I took a, uh, there was some discussion going on about our Golden Jubilee next year. So, your uh, classmate uh, Chako sir called me. I took a snapshot of your attendance. Uh, the first name, I, I we verified that what you said is correct. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, uh, the conference conveners, professors, alumni sponsors, and uh, uh, all team members. Last two days was uh, uh, very, very, I was personally very happy the last two days because the department was very vibrant with a lot of technical talks happening here, a lot of discussions happening outside. The mess committee was looking after us very well. So we had good, and overall the ambience of the, in the department was so nice. And everyone from the top to the bottom, everyone contributed for successfully conducting this conference. The energy level within the team was excellent. And overall, uh, I'm very happy as uh, HOD that the whole team has worked, uh, like the coordination was too good between the chairs, coach chairs, the online participants, and uh, 
the everything went on like a very a smooth machine so we are very happy and i thank uh, everyone our sponsors alumni members came in large numbers i already know some have made contacts for placement some have made contacts for future research collaborations so all the objectives of the conference such as uh, technical sessions uh, disc other discussion friendship socializing there were a lot of uh, objectives and all of them are met so as we are drawing the curtains for the second edition and we are very confident that the brand icon i will go from strength to strength so i will conclude by once again congratulating the uh, conference conveners for their hard work <laughs> and uh, and each and every one it so thank you very much thank you. thank you sir uh in order to organize in the coming years of icono uh, your valuable comments are very important to us so i request the delegates to share your comments through the google form that will be shared in the group as well as through this you can use this qr code to directly go in so please do comment in that we can uh, rectify in some we have made any mistakes and continue in a better conference in the next year now i invite in uh, dr rajesh p naya for the vote of thanks um most of the participants are here maybe outside also so let's have a feedback uh, via offline i mean online mode also but uh, if you want to come here and talk you are most welcome uh, otherwise after my what of thanks you can come here and talk uh, please feel uh, free to come here and talk uh, i request uh, uh being teacher to please post this in uh, our whatsapp group uh, delegates of uh, icono 23 so that um, they can do it from the your own desk itself um i don't know what to say because uh, once hod appreciate me a day, a day before yesterday that you know it's well arranged i said uh, my hands are here you know students especially btech mtech and phd students even project associates also involved in this without you all you know it would not have happened so smoothly and without of course planning is there but we don't plan much you know it's a, maybe a 3 months plan and uh i believe that it was conducted well uh, even though the papers we received were only 22 papers and uh, sponsors uh, what we expect from sponsors is not the money much but the network alumni should come here and talk to us uh, rather than i say you know thank you to all of you i i am first is uh, hod i should thank hod for uh, allowing us to organize this as uh, it was rightly pointed out in the inaugural session this is a brain child of uh, icono is a brain child of hod he was the uh, convener for the first uh, uh, icono thank you sir for uh, allowing us and uh, rather than saying uh, to or each faculty i appreciate all faculty of our department uh, for uh, organizing this uh, this conference even though this conference uh, first it was assigned to me and uh, but i find that you know i can't do it alone so i ask uh, fawaz sir and he immediately agreed so i should appreciate uh, fawaz sir to take half of the load <laughs> and uh, doing all the financial work uh, especially uh, he was uh, always help uh, helpful in giving the money Uh, without asking that two times why we should spend money he said okay let's spend it because money is there why we should keep it we have to make sure that everybody comes here should be comfortable rather than making things happen in a very strict way because i am in nss national service scheme i am against the policy of these plastic bottles but 
according to the comfort of people we have to allow the plastic bottles so thank you for sir for uh, all the financial support and uh, innovative ideas so thank you very much and um, and uh, to the other teachers if i say one teacher one teacher then it may not be sufficient so i appreciate all the teachers uh, starting from senior faculty to junior faculties i appreciate all of them for their effort and once a chodi told to organize this conference i divided it into five sections starting from food reception podium like that so each teacher said okay we will take care and under each teacher there is two research scholars then uh, along with that uh, three or four mtech students then 10 btech students so like that it is that network is there so it went well and uh, everybody was uh, very helpful even though there were some miscommunications uh, uh, which happened uh, like uh, i can't say you know negative things should not uh, be happen you know we cannot say negative things in a public way but i feel that uh, i could able to Uh, make the uh, make uh, people understand that uh, you know it happened because of miscommunication and it went well and um, and i am happy that uh, no no i believe that none of the teachers or none of the students in this department uh, have any uh, any feeling that or even the official staffs non teaching staffs have any feeling that uh, they were neglected uh, or they were not uh, being a participant or they were not being a part of the organizers of this iconoid so i believe that uh, all of their we could able to make uh, most of them comfortable and at the same time without the participants you know we we all are here say we 50 or 100 are here but if uh, one or two comes then uh, you know it's uh, useless i mean it's not uh, that what we want even though our seating capacity was uh, 80 um, we got uh, almost full of the seating capacity and people were very happy to sit in the corridor now also you can see some people sitting there enjoying the breeze and second category like enjoy cheyidu they are actually uh, listening to this and so that they can also talk in between so that they are not disturbing people here and they are sitting there and i said okay and librarian also she allowed she is still there and uh, office staff uh, everybody was uh, good um, and thank you all uh, for the wonderful organization thank you ah uh, yeah delegates yeah oh, sure uh, so uh, thank you to the ship technology family members uh, now uh, thank you to the participants uh, thank you to the sponsors and everybody but as uh, madhyan sir said um, in a in, in a student induction program uh, i was organizing that and i just given the feedback to the students and i thought okay they were feeling it um, let's stop the with the national anthem then after reaching back home i thought oh they sh- one of one or two should uh, have given their physical feedback you know that's what is expected from them you know if you write what happens is that half of the things in our mind only will come but we want you to be little open little more have some criticism on us we will take it as constructive criticism and let's come here and talk it not only that you can talk about the positive aspects also negative aspects also or you can make a sandwich in which first positive then negative then positive whatever way please come here and talk please consider this as an informal meeting please come here and talk we have people from hyderabad uh, i don't know my friend shija is also here and uh, entrepreneurs like thomas is here please come here and just talk uh, IRS uh, officials are here please come here otherwise uh, from your desk also you can talk i'll sit uh, we will sit there and uh, we will just listen thank you very much yeah please yeah hello this was a good uh, two days this session was very good actually so we could meet so many 
uh, students actually we got reminded of the days when we were sitting like this and attending all the presentations everything so it was nice being here and uh, uh, seeing all these presentations and the effort the people have put to present especially the students whoever actually it is very encouraging to see that that uh, see uh, we we could learn many things actually so it was nice so in future also we expect such more sessions thank you sir thank you everyone for arranging this good evening all uh, uh, it's my third time a uh, second time for this uh, event uh, and this time i'm representing a company uh, last time i was a student here i'm uh, very happy that i my company sent me as a representative to spend some time here uh, i was supposed to present one paper this time but it haven't it's haven't happened uh, but next time for sure it's a wonderful event to present a paper it'll be a honor so very thank you for the department of ship technology especially uh, i used to note him like uh, the captain of the ship our hod thank you for being uh, uh, making some of the events very successful and the team which organized uh, this event uh, to make this a successful event for the alumni which came here for the students who participated here and the full students who sit for a long time to spend the time like this so thank you for the organizers thank you for the alumni everyone thank you thank you very much Uh, yeah, uh, my name is uh, Navin Chans. Uh, it's uh, really happy to uh, participate this uh, today wonderful events. Especially, I have an uh, invitation from Dr. Rajesh. Just few few days ago, I just uh, not about this one, and otherwise I will bring couple of. Uh, a uh, specialist in technology ship technology people but unfortunately i just realized that few days ago only from uh, dr rajesh and uh, it was really a wonderful event since two days i wish all the very best and thank you very much yeah last one please <laughs> please sir Please say some few words. I mean, you are here on the second day, but you are ready to pay the full registration fee. Please say a few words. No, no, that is not. You are the alumni of this department, right? Yeah, yeah. Good, good evening. Uh, Which batch, sir? Good evening. I'm 14th batch. My name 14th is Jojo. Batch. And uh, uh, thank you to see you, sir. Uh, is, yeah. Uh, actually, I didn't know that, that this was happening at this time. And that is something which uh, I have a protest in the sense... Uh, in my heart, we always support the uh, you know, department, but uh, it happened. So happened that I was uh, flying down here yesterday. I landed here yesterday, 8 o'clock. Then I realized, oh, there is something is happening here. So uh, it's my obligation to support you guys. So that's why I came. And um, it was very kind of you, yeah. And uh, I could meet a lot of uh, energetic uh, young youngsters uh, eager to contribute to the course. Uh, of the you know theory and you know, practical things and uh, especially the wonderful papers on the especially on the CFD which was very very interesting which we are also currently working on a lot of uh, such you know uh, problems so thank you very much the next time please do inform us in advance so that yeah sure sure uh, we can be we'll, actually we'll, part of it yeah we'll collect <laughs> thank your you ready, so. And uh, responses from Best Paper Award members. Um, they are not here, Best Paper Award. Huh? Ajit is here, Ajit. 
प्रभु नो बेस्ट पेपर अवार्ड ओके ओके या इट्स ऑलरेडी सिक्स ओ क्लॉक पीपल मे हैव टू गो होम एंड सेकंड डे मींस वी हैव टू वाइंड अप सो आई बिलीव एवरीथिंग वेंट वेल एंड इवन दो इफ देयर इज सम सम प्रॉब्लम प्लीज फील free to fill the google form we are not asking your email id or phone number you can say whatever you want we will we will take it and uh, we will uh, we will try to incorporate it in the next iconoi 25 okay um, usually we should have an emblem for iconoi emblem will be same but uh, iconoi 25 will also happen maybe in uh, november or december according to the hod's convenience and other teachers convenience we are actually balancing academics as, as well as management activities we have to do nac then mooc all these things are there um, then nba uh, nir of ranking uh, i was iqc coordinator now been a teacher is iqc coordinator then in between also we have to take care of mta projects phd scholars btech projects btech subjects all these things but only in this conference uh, you know we feel like uh, there is worth that uh conducting this conference when we see these many people even in the validatory function you know um i have seen in premier institutes in which validatory function will have one, one or two people so thank you very much uh, next time according to the fund uh, we may be able be able to extend our venue from here to the main seminar complex uh, that we will see uh, but uh, it will happen in uh, qsat campus i believe so if uh, god allows and thank you very much and i uh, expect one of the uh, one or two singers come here and uh, do the national anthem we all will sing together national anthem and we will disperse anything else uh, if anybody wants to say please feel free otherwise we will finish it up huh? video is there okay yeah please all of you please stand up thank you Jai 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 Jai